Good evening. Due to COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted as a Zoom webinar pursuant to the provisions of the Governor's Executive Order N-2920, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act. This meeting is being webcast on Comcast TV Channel 15 and live streamed on the city's YouTube channel at https colon forward slash forward slash www.youtube.com forward slash user forward slash city of Hayward and on the city website at https colon forward slash forward slash hayward.legistar.com forward slash calendar dot ASPX. The mayor will call upon members of the city council, city staff, and other speakers by name and ask that they state their names before giving comments or remarks. Individuals participating via Zoom with their cameras enabled are reminded that their activities are visible to viewers. City Council members and members of the public participating by Zoom wishing to speak should use the raise hand feature and the mayor will call upon them at the appropriate time. Members participating via teleconference wishing to speak should dial star nine and they will be called upon by the last four digits of their phone number. It is requested that public speakers state their names and organizations, but providing such information is voluntary. Written public comments received by email at list-mayor-council at hayward-ca.gov, city clerk at hayward-ca.gov, or via e-comment by 3 p.m. will be distributed to the city council and staff published on the city's meeting and agenda center under documents received after published agenda and entered into the record. Documents received after 3 p.m. through the adjournment of the meeting will be included as part of the meeting record and published the following day. A roll call vote will be taken for all action items. In order to get the full Zoom experience, please make sure your application is up to date. Public members wishing to speak with the City Council can send an email to list-mayor-council at hayward-ca.gov or cityclerk at hayward-ca.gov. And with that, I would like to welcome everyone who is attending this uh, special Saturday um, City Council uh, work session mainly on um, the on our annual budget, something we do every year, and having council meet with um, the um, leaders of our city staff, the department heads, and our city management, and um, and talk about the proposed budget, which has been released and will be um, voted on. Um, right now, I think we're expecting to do that on June first. Correct, Madam City Manager, but. Uh, um, you know, needs to be approved by the end of June. So we're on track here. And with that, uh, I will ask a council member Andrews to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, will you call the roll? Yes, Madam Mayor. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Councilmember Andrews. Present. Councilmember Lamnin. Good morning. Councilmember Marquez. Present. Councilmember Salinas. Present. Councilmember Wahab. Here. Councilmember Sermeno. Present. And Mayor Halliday. Here. Thank you. We are all here. Um, and so we are going to now just proceed right into our work session on the council um, on the city's uh, 2022 operating budget and five year plan. And we're going to be re uh, receiving and discussing departmental budget presentations. And I will now turn this over to our city manager, Kelly McAdoo. Thank you, Mayor Halliday. Good to see everyone this morning. Um, just a few housekeeping items uh, for the day. There is a revised schedule that um, of presentations due to some just some changes in people's schedules. So originally, the police department budget was going to be presented at 11:25 a.m. Um, we're going to switch that with the city manager's office. So now. 
police department will be at 2.30 p.m. and city manager's office will be at 11.25 a.m. just due to some scheduling conflicts. So um, we'll, we'll announce that again as we get closer if people are logging on right at 11.25 to hear the police department budget presentation. Um, we'll have a couple of breaks uh, in the day, most notably the lunch break from 12.05 to 1 p.m. So everyone will there will be a pause that there and then um, hopefully we will plan to do public comments at the end of the day um, right around the the you know sometime we have we have about 45 45 minutes of slack at the end of the day i'm not going to make 45 minutes of closing remarks uh, at 3 15 um, but in case some of the presentations or questions run long we have that in there um, so as soon as we get done with that then we'll move right into public comments um, and I just also wanted to let folks know that um, the video recording of this will be rebroadcast on channel 15 on Monday, May 17th, uh, starting at 5 p.m. And then also again, Tuesday, May 18th, uh, starting at 11 a.m. So if folks aren't able to watch it online, they can also watch it on channel 15 um, at those time windows. So I think with that, um, I'm gonna ask Dustin to start sharing the presentation and um, we will get started with the day. I'm going to kick off with um, Dustin and we're going to just do kind of a high level overview of the general fund budget picture. Uh, and then we'll jump right into the operating departments, starting with maintenance services. So uh, welcome to our, our, we did not do a Saturday budget work session last year uh, during COVID, but we are back this year. And uh, so uh, glad, glad to be back and presenting uh, sort of a more normalized budget than last year. Um, and so uh, we'll go ahead and next slide, Dustin. So again, here's the agenda for today. Um, as we talked about just the switch between the city manager's office and the police department. So the police department budget presentation will be a little later this afternoon. Next slide. Um, so I just wanted to refresh uh, the council and the public's memory on um, what we did last year to really um, save, uh, you know, try and cut the, reduce the city's operating budget, general fund budget significantly um, in response to the revenue loss that we saw um, from the shelter in place orders and, and the COVID emergency. So you'll see here um, significant supplies and services reduction. We did defer the planned uh, OPEB ARC payment of $3.6 million. I believe uh, the council, we did add back a million dollars of that payment at the mid-year budget. So um, that, was, uh, that was great. We were able to do that as revenues came in better than we had originally anticipated. Um, we reduced general fund transfers um, to the CIP and to other, uh, um, other areas of the budget by about 1.2 million. Um, reduction in uh, fleet purchases, this is the internal service fund transfer, so re reduction to fleet and facilities um, expenses by about 1.75 million. Um, we did about 1.8 million of program reductions uh, through you know, temporary staff eliminations and um, other uh, other just sort of program reductions last last year, and then um, that was 1.8 for the general fund, and then 620,000 for all of the other city funds, and then. Lastly, and very importantly, thanks to uh, a number of our employee groups who either um, gave furlough hours last year and or deferred cost of living adjustments and raises. And that, that saved $1.6 million in the general fund and about 700,000 in the other funds. So all told uh, about $10.6 million in cost saving measures. Um, thankfully this year, <laughs> although you will see on, on the next slide, uh, the, the sort of gap that we have this year, um, we do feel like we've been able to restore a lot of these program reductions uh, and other elements for the, the fleet, fleet replacement and things like that from last year, um, in part due to um, uh, the, the uh, stimulus funds that are going to be coming in and also um, just revenue recovery that we've seen. And so if we go to the next slide. So this, this shows sort of where we are bottom line picture. Um, we ended fiscal year 2020 um, with a use of about $5.2 million of reserves. 
um, which was much better than we had originally but anticipated. We thought we would end up using about $11 million of reserves. So um, really just kudos to the organization for really tightening um, our belts and to our employees again for their, their contributions as well. And so for fiscal year 2021, um, you'll see we're projecting to end the year with about a $2.2 million use of reserves. And then the fiscal year 2022 proposed, and, and Dustin will go into this a little bit more, um, that we're project, projecting to use $6 million um, of, of reserves, but a couple of key points. This is the first time, I think, in my 10-year history with the city that we are actually um, showing fully funding the ARC payment in the city's general fund budget, which is um, a pretty huge accomplishment, um, especially in light of the economic challenges that we've, we've faced over the past couple of years. The other thing to note is this budget right now as proposed does not include any of the stimulus dollars in it. So we'll be coming back to council in July um, to ask for those appropriations. And so that's where we'll see um, hopefully that $6 million number will become a much smaller number. You know, we're obviously going to have to be very mindful of monitoring um, how our revenues are coming in and just, you know, trying to really obviously still keep a, keep an eye on expenses um, for the next couple of years as, as we continue to recover from, from the pandemic. Um, but hopefully uh, we're, we're on our way and uh, we'll go through some of those more details, the more detailed um, budget information and be able to answer questions. So that's sort of the general overview picture. I'm going to turn it over to Dustin now, uh, Clausen, our finance director, who's going to go into more detail about some of the uh, general, general assumptions about revenues and expenditures uh, that we're facing in the general fund budget. So I'll turn it over to Dustin. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. I appreciate uh, you guys attending today. Uh, obviously missed uh, the opportunity to, to get in front of you guys last year uh, on, on a Saturday um, to, to have the fun that we're gonna get to have today and, and uh, the, the productive discussions that we'll be able to, to have. Um, certainly in incredibly thrilled to, um, to have a much more normal uh, budget cycle this year. Um, as you guys know, uh, it was incredibly challenging last year um, to, to essentially have a budget created uh, when we walked out uh, for the beginning of the shelter in place uh, to, to tear that down, throw it away, and try to figure out what the heck um, the next 12 months were going to look like. Um, thankfully, we had a strong partnership with, with all but one of our, um, our, our uh, employee groups able to come to um, concession agreements to, to help the city uh, to weather the storm. Um, so I'll jump right in here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this slide in the next, uh, and then we're actually going to go back to the slide that Kelly was just on. Um, so what we've got in front of us here um, are general fund revenues. Um, what we are seeing is fantastic um, in comparison to what, what we might have expected, certainly 12 months ago, and even as as, as um, six months ago, uh, when the when the economy uh, nationally was still uh, struggling quite a bit to recover, um, we've seen a pretty quick recovery. Um, my hope is that we continue that trend, um, and and you know at least stay um, where we're projecting, if not um, some some minor growth. Um, we we did not see a dip in our property tax, which as you know is the um, general funds uh, number one. Uh, revenue source. So that is fantastic news. We saw some uh, minor growth, um, which is essentially due to the growth in um, the sales uh, in, in the area. Um, the this, this will be fiscal year 2022 will be the first year that um, the assessor's office um, does not uh, do the uh, max uh, increase of 2% uh, to the assessed valuation for properties uh, in, in years past. Um, and since the uh, beginning of the recovery from the, the Great Recession, we've seen um, each, you know, uh, properties that don't change hands um, have a, a increase of 2% each year um, as, as um, allowable under Prop 13. Um, but this is the first year that we won't see that. My guess is that is a bit of an overreaction, um, but it is what it is. Uh, and so we will, we will deal with that um, as, as we move forward. Um, seeing some great growth, uh, a bit unexpected growth in um, sales tax. 
Um, some of that is still due to uh, the, the Wayfair decision, um, which has helped uh, cities to weather the storm uh, through uh, the, the pandemic related recession. Um, and, you know, really, really seeing some, some great numbers there, which is fantastic news. This, this, uh, the, the percentage there is a bit inflated, uh, the 20% growth, only because um, last year's was down uh, in comparison to uh, where, we, where we would have been should we not have hit the um, pandemic-related recession. Um, UUT, we're hoping to bounce back. Um, that's about where we uh, were um, in previous years, um, so we're, we're looking forward to that. That that negative uh, in the in the right um, columns there is a, is a typo, uh, so we'll fix that. We're seeing a little bit of growth. It's it's really just kind of a recovery um, in in uh, what we what we uh, experienced last year, where we saw some dips in in uh, really an in industry clearly with people home. Um, and using more electricity, um, you know, we were we saw a rise in that area, but we uh, saw some some dips in um, industrial areas um, as well as you know office office parks, et cetera, were were not uh, utilizing uh, electricity and gas uh, at nearly the same rates that, that they had been uh, in previous years. Um, real property transfer tax uh, is, is looking good. Um, it, we're expecting that it will be uh, similar uh, to, to previous years. Um, I realize that uh, the columns to the right are uh, pulling from another place. Uh, you, the comparison is, is from uh, the uh, fiscal year 2021 proposed information, which is hidden here. So uh, please pay no attention to the, the man behind the curtain on the right here, um, but certainly we can still uh, have the conversation. Um, looking at a, a, a slight recovery, not to pre-pandemic levels uh, when it comes to transient occupancy tax. Um, as we all know, this is an industry that's been just absolutely devastated um, by the pandemic. Um, people are now beginning to travel a bit more. Um, you know, my hope is that we will see a recovery here in Hayward. I know a lot of the the the, um, the travel that the the visitors that we had. Um, were, were related a lot to industry uh, more than than tourism per se, um, and so hopefully with uh, you know us uh, exiting hopefully the pandemic, um, we'll start to see that recover. Um, it's important to note here uh, as it relates to TOT um, that we didn't have um, we did not have uh, the city has the ability to uh, increase the the TOT rate based on uh, the voters having approved um, an increase of up to uh, 12 and a half percent. We the council uh, clearly um, seeing that uh, <laughs> right now would be about the, the most devastating time to, to an already uh, hurting industry um, to, to make that increase. Um, so this uh, amount, it, it, you know, does not, uh, does not include a, a potential increase. Um, to the TOT, but simply a, a recovery. Um, I, if you recall, um, we had numbers closer to 1.8 to, to 2 million um, in, in pre-pandemic uh, years um, as it relates to TOT. Um, cannabis revenue, obviously, that's one that uh, I think we're all playing, paying close attention to. Um, we've all got high hopes for it. Uh, we have not seen uh, in years past, much revenue from it that has changed. Um, we've got some some uh, retailers up and operating, um, and so we are uh, expecting to to start receiving some some real revenue from that, uh, and, and very grateful for that. Um, the the rest of the information, um, you know, these these are, are are certainly not not small numbers, but it's made up of a, a smaller uh, sort of um, it's it's a compilation of of, of many different things. Uh, the biggest that I'll, I'll, I'll speak to here are the other revenues. Um, what that, there, there looks like a big dip there. Um, it's it's uh, a little bit uh, inflated, uh, that decrease. Really what that uh, is going to represent is, uh, you know, the city's not, not expecting to receive um, funds from the federal government in the same way that it did uh, last in, in fiscal year 2021. We received uh, almost 2 million in um, CARES Act funding. 
and we received some um, some funding uh, in, for PPE grants as well as um, some uh, reimbursements from other local agencies. Uh, so so it's really um, to make it comparable. If we removed all of those, uh, that other revenue line would not change all that much uh, for prior years. So next slide, please. All right, so looking towards expenses, and we'll, we'll, we'll work through this a bit, uh, and then we will go um, back to uh, uh, back a couple slides so we can look at some trend data um, and look at sort of what, what's driving this. Um, we are seeing, uh, you know, over fiscal 2021, uh, we're seeing a rather large increase. Uh, a lot of that is going to be due to the one-time measures that we took last year um, to help to balance the budget, to help to... Um, to uh, get the city through uh, an incredibly uncertain time um, and, and, and try not to um, drain re resources uh, during a time where we really had uh, no great sense for um, how deep and how long uh, the, the impacts of the recession were going to be. Um, biggest uh, drivers here are certainly our, our personnel costs, as, as we all know, um, our, our we're a service organization, so certainly the cost of those services is going to be our um, our, our biggest uh, driver uh, when it comes to expenses in our budget. Um, we've got a, um, a supplies and services again. Ignore the uh, ignore the numbers on the right here. Um, we've got uh, a, a rather large decrease uh, from the the what we're actually uh, um, projecting for fiscal year 2021. We asked each of the um, each of the departments within the general fund um, to reduce their supplies and services budget by five percent, um, uh, which they which they um, begrudgingly did, um, and and we're we're certainly grateful for that in uh, the help to uh, balance the city's budget. Internal service fees, uh, slight growth, uh, as Kelly mentioned, we um, that that's an area that we did take from uh, for our. Um, our one-time balancing uh, measures last year. And so this is really just a restoration of that. Um, debt service, pretty pretty darn close to the same. We had one, I believe it was a solar uh, loan that, that rolled off the books. We, we finally paid all the way off um, and we were able to uh, you know keep that level uh, pretty, safe, pretty uh, static. Um, big, a uh, big, an increase that looks rather big in the capital outlay, but really it's a restoration um, of, of uh, deferred uh, expenses from previous years. Um, you'll see uh, when when Director Ameri presents on um, on Tuesday the the CIP uh, plan for the next year. Sorry, the proposed CIP plan for for next year. Um, there's nothing wild in there. There's nothing, you know. We're we're not going out and buying things that are uh, nice to haves. It's simply um, restoring uh, the the things that we need to to stay on schedule for. Um, that's really kind of the 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 biggest, uh, you know, the the big changes there. Can you go back a couple slides? What I want to do uh, now is sort of look um, back towards history um, to before we look forward um, to uh, really kind of tell a story here, um, and so we can see the big drivers for that uh, for the for the changes. There, there we go. Yep. So what what we've got here um, is some trend data um, showing uh, back to fiscal year 2018, um, all the way to uh, what we're proposing this year. Uh, in, in a moment, we'll look from this year forward, um, but trying to get those two things on the same slide, um, I think even an ant might need a, a magnifying glass. So. Uh, we had to break it up into two. Certainly, if we were um, in a in a live setting, we could we could put things up on a big wall, and hopefully next year we'll be back to that uh, very soon. Um, so what we've got, and really all we're showing here, we've got we've got revenues up top um, in a summarized way. But what what we're showing um, really is uh, are the drivers for our expenses, um, and and I'll really draw your your uh, attention to uh, two two or three lines here. Um, the first I want to draw your attention to is retirement. It's right there in the middle of the uh, about smack dab in the middle of the the personnel um, expenditures. 
um, we are seeing uh, growth from um, from 2018, uh, an amount of about 23.4 million um, to projecting uh, 37.6 million. Um, that growth is uh, obviously tremendous. Um, we're talking about uh, about $14 million over a five-year period. Um, and these are, these are not based on city's numbers. These are not based on projections that Kelly or I have created. This is literally what CalPERS has told us that we will be, um, we will be required to contribute here in fiscal year 2022. Um, and the others are actuals. Um, and, and so that, that growth um, is, is really, uh, you know, one of the drivers, one of the biggest drivers for, for the city's um, city's uh, story as it comes to the budget um similarly in the in the salaries line we've, we've got some some growth there which which would be expected it's not nearly the um you know at the at the same sort of trajectory um that that retirement has gone but um you know it, it, we've, we've seen growth over the, over the previous few years um which you know again as a service uh, organization we would expect that our, our number one expense is our people um, that being said, we, we've seen tremendous growth, growth over the, the previous few years, um, which makes it tough. Um, you know, the other is, is our, our health care benefits, which are, um, you know, ha have grown uh, pretty significantly over the previous years as well. So, um, you know, th those are, are the biggest drivers and, and, you know, certainly something that we'll continue to talk about. I know um, Council Member Lamnan is very aware um, that CalPERS is considering a, an additional um, uh, increase to the discount rate um, for from a uh, city fiscal standpoint, uh, that would be uh, painful uh, and, and for many organizations potentially crippling uh, because it'll make that, that retirement line grow uh, rather significantly um, in future years if it's dropped a half a percentage point um, as they did a few years ago. Um, and, you know, from a, a reality standpoint, that's probably due. Um, the, the, the fund has not performed at uh, what they've projected it at. They've continued to ignore um, f facts, if you will, um, and uh, the findings that, that they had um, when, they, when they did a study of the fund. Um, and, and, you know, they, they've sort of perpetually um, thrown curveballs to us. Um, and, and made changes, which makes it very difficult, not only to afford, but also to project uh, what that what the future is going to be with that. So hopefully um, we will get some um, clarity around that uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. My guess is they will, um, in, in true CalPERS fashion, move incredibly slowly and be um, very opaque about uh, what direction that they are heading. So um, that being said, go ahead and go forward a few slides. So now we'll take a look at the, now we'll look forward. Um, and this is the uh, clearly a very summarized version of the five-year forecast. Um, again, noting what, what Kelly mentioned, uh, fiscal year 2022, we do not show the um, American Rescue Plan Act funding here in fiscal year 2022. Um, and we also, we show a small amount in the, in the out years. As we know, um, that's sort of TBD um, in in the in the planning of it. Uh, we know roughly um, that we will receive somewhere between uh, 30, 35 and, and 38 and a half million. That's that's sort of the, the best educated guesses. We've received nothing uh, specific uh, from from directly from the, the federal government um, stating exactly what we'll get or exactly when we'll get it. Um, we've certainly jumped through every hoop that they've uh, thrown out in front of us. They continue to throw hoops out in front of us, and we will continue to jump uh, and, and find our way through them. Um, but looking at fiscal 22, uh, the proposal uh, includes a use of uh, approximately $6 million in, in reserves to balance the budget. Um, certainly, if we were to add back uh, the, the funding from uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, that would would paint a little bit different picture. Um, I'll I'll say you know I think we've talked about it a bunch of times, but um, you know those are one-time funds. 
Um, the, the funds that we are able to recover are uh, specific to uh, lost revenues over the last two fiscal years and projecting uh, potential lost revenues uh, moving forward. Um, and otherwise, um, there are now very specific ways that we're, we'll be uh, using those funds. Um, before it was a bit uh, more abstract and, and seemingly um, uh, discretionary. Um, they put some a lot more terms out there uh, for us to comply with, but we will for $38 million, we will do whatever we have to do. Uh, don't worry, keep putting those hoops out. We will keep jumping through them. Uh, but, but looking forward, um, fiscals, fiscal years 23, 24, 25, 26, um, we see a similar use of reserves um, starts to get certainly, you know, if it hasn't been alarming um, before, it, it starts to get alarming um, in years 23, 24, and 25, where we've got significant uses of, of reserves. Um, clearly, we have a lever that we, we will be able to pull in the future uh, once the um, once the economy recovers and, and folks are traveling a bit more uh, to increase revenues in the, the TOT area. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get some additional revenues in uh, cannabis. Um, but that's definitely not going to uh, close that big of a gap. Um, we've, you know, what I'll say to that is we've been here before. Everyone on this council, except potentially Council Member Andrews, who will get used to this, um, we, we ha have these uh, rather large numbers each year. Um, that we are looking at if we project uh, project out and do absolutely nothing, um, then that's what would happen. We all know that we will not stand idly by and let that happen. Um, and we will take whatever measures are necessary to keep the city uh, fiscally sustainable. Um, but the, you know, this is a look at if we did nothing um, and uh, expenditures continue to grow, um, in the way that we expect them to, as well as um, revenue continuing to uh, go along with projections. That, that's what it would look like. Um, go ahead and next slide. I think that might be it. So I think at, that, at this point, I'll stop. We can uh, ask and answer some questions. Uh, and then we will, after that, we will jump right into uh, uh, department presentations. Thank you. I don't see any hands up yet, so I'm going to start here because I have a couple. Um, as far as the um, OPAB liability, um, uh, in answer to a question that um, you know what would happen if we put if we based on the contributions in 2020 fiscal year 2021, which are not added into your present calculations I, or the 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 chart that is in our budget. The, the calculations for fiscal year 2021 are not yet in there, correct? Correct, yeah, because that information is from a, a, an actuarial that was completed based on essentially history. So actuarials are um, useful tools, um, but certainly aren't the most up-to-date information. Okay, so, um, it, you know, First of all, back to our contributions in 2021, and I'll ask my fellow budget committee members, uh, council members uh, Lamnan and Wahab. Um, my understanding was that we had originally decided to cut it back to a one million contribution, which we then recommended increasing it to two. Today, the information was we're planning a one million dollar, which is which that that it was zero, and we increased it to one. So that's is I'm seeing council. Um, yeah, Council Member um, Wahab, you look like you're about to. <laughs> I, I do. I do believe that it was supposed to be the one million, uh, and that was what was decided. Um, that was decided when last year, or in the budget committee, to put it if, at one. If or, I may, yeah. What are we like? So, <laughs> when we adopted the budget last year, we adopted with a one million dollar contribution towards the OPEB, uh, the unfunded actuarial liability, the ARC if you yes. will. Um, at mid-year, we approved, council approved an additional $1 million for a total of $2 million in contribution um, towards the, the OPEB arc for fiscal yeah, year. That wasn't what was reflected in what you just showed us, but in, in, and in what's in the, 
uh, at least to what you just said. You said it was zero and then we increased it to one. I, I think I misspoke, Mayor. I think that oh. was that was probably me that misspoke and said. Okay, okay. All right. I just wanted to straighten that out. So then I had asked with the two million and if we do the four point is it 4.3 or 4.6 million next year? What, what, if you could estimate what that would do? And I think in the answer, you, that's what you did, even though I understand it's actuarial and you can't be precise, but you estimated that it would um, equate to a contribution um, approx of approximately 9% of the unfunded liability, which actually would bring our um, funded portion up to about 20, per uh, close to 20%, I, I believe, because it's, yeah. So, um, and I just wanted to point out that that is um, a, that is a remarkable increase from just I don't know a, a few years ago. Like I want to say three or four years ago, when it was more like at one percent. So, in in that air in that regard, and um, I think that later we could even well I don't know after what you just presented, maybe we won't want to do this, but <laughs> was going to recommend considering putting another million um, this year, but. Um, if possible. And of course, your reflected budget doesn't, as you just said, does not include any expected contributions from the um, federal relief that we do believe is coming. And I think we'll be having later discussions about that. But I just wanted to throw that out there. And then um, let's see. Um, yeah, that, that that's pretty much it for me right now. So um, I see Council Member Marquez's hand up. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Justin, for your presentation. Um, can you remind me um, the projections on salaries? Is this projecting a built-in COLA of 2% or 3%? Um, so for groups that we have agreements with, it, it includes exactly what we were contractually obligated for. Um, for other groups uh, looking out, I believe it's 2%. Okay. And then um, cannabis is projected at 650000 um, can you remind me what the number is before we determine um, appropriating those funds through the foundation, the um, community benefits funds, the one percent? I, I don't understand what the question well, is. We 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 voted on the um, taxable mm -hmm. rate, and then we also voted to set aside one percent specifically towards community benefits. And right. my understanding is that it's going to come back to us through our partnership with the Hayward Foundation that we created to appropriate those funds. But I know we were waiting until we get to a certain dollar amount. So I'm asking what that amount is and maybe the city manager might know. I'd have to go back and look at the staff report again. I don't remember. There was, we, I think we set a certain threshold. Um, I'll go back and research. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay, but this figure here obviously isn't that 1%. It's total revenue, right? So we Correct. still- parse that out. Okay, so if you could get back to us with that information at a later date. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Lamnon. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that. Yeah, I think we had talked at various times about like a $100,000 threshold or a million dollar threshold, but your point about pulling the 1% off um, and not counting that as revenue is really important. So I just wanted to underscore that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Council Member Wahab. Thank you. Um, so I had a couple questions or comments. Uh, number one, I don't think all the questions I, I had during uh, mine and your one-on-one are completely accurately reflected in the, in the question handbook, but. I'll ask some of them because uh, I, I don't seem to feel like I, I got the answer. The franchise fees, um, why are they too low? Do, do we end up getting an answer to that? I, I guess I'm not too low as in comparison to... Why are they low then? Not in comparison, just in general. So franchise fees are based on agreements that we have with local franchises to operate here mm -hmm. uh, within the city. Um, they're not, they're based on uh, previous year's revenues. Um, you know, we're clearly limited in what we can come to an agreement with uh, or who we can come to an agreement with um, without it being considered a tax. Um, that's essentially, you know, those are the facts. I'm not sure um, what else I can offer there. Okay. And then, um, 
you know, I, I asked about the, the arc and eventually trying to cover that full arc for the year. Um, we, we have where we're still, our revenue is lower than our expenses. Um, and considering that we, and I know that we don't have the $38 million kind of in this particular budget right now today as we speak, um, what are we doing in regards to uh, considerations around potential cuts um, if we are projected in just literally another fiscal year after fiscal year 2022 where, you know, doom and gloom as, as you have projected? So, I mean, you know, obviously uh, we'd have to look at the significant expenditures that we could, could reduce. We're, we're in negotiations with some groups hoping to um, try to get our employees to share some of the brunt of those costs, um, you know, without reducing staff, which I'm certainly not proposing and is not included in this proposal. Um, it's difficult to, to balance the budget uh, looking forward as we see continued costs relating to uh, you know, certainly healthcare, um, fully funding the ARC, retirement, uh, those, those growing at a pace that, that clearly outpaces our, uh, our revenue growth. Okay. And then uh, my, my concern is that obviously the city generates revenue through our taxes. And for example, our user utility tax is one of the highest in the state not just in the region, but in the state. Um, it has been stated that in newspapers and so forth. Um, you know, besides raising taxes, which you guys know I'm not, you know, the biggest fan of, um, and besides, you know, having employees cut costs and, and so forth, just because, you know, cost of living is high, what else is on the table potentially that, that you would be projecting for us to do? Or I mean, certainly, certainly anything's on the table. Um, you know, if we, if we go back and look at those slides, there are not that many, you know, we could slow our uh, contributions towards capital funding. Um, I'm not recommending that. Um, we could, you know, try to control costs for supplies and services. We've, we've done that already. There are not that many other significant areas in which the city can, can, can continue to cut. Um, you know, so again, if we look at our significant expenses, we're a service organization. That's our number one expense. It is our most significant expense. Um, and it's the area that we see the biggest growth um, in, in sort of a, 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 I'll use the term natural growth because it's not necessarily up to the city um, how it, uh, what CalPERS does um, and how those rates are, are impacted. Uh, in, in a similar way, it's, it's not up to the city necessarily how uh, our, our healthcare costs, our healthcare rates um, are, are um, calculated. What we can try to do um, is work with our groups to uh, help to share, the, share in those costs, as well as, um, you know, trying to, to control those as much as possible. Okay, and, and I, this brings me to my point of, number one, I do think that we need to do a citywide assessment of the services that we do provide and what is priority for residents, as well as just, you know, city functions and so forth. Um, as well as staffing level analysis, as well as, um, and this is across the board, um, you know, being able to plan and project and really actually plan for two, three, four, five years out rather than, you know, hey, in a year we're going to have to, you know, potentially ask our employees to cut. Um, with COVID funds coming in, the CARES funds, um, I do want to say and reiterate what I've said many, many, many times um, is that I do want our, uh, us to immediately award the um, the different bargaining groups that made the concessions. Um, so that is a top priority for me specifically, uh, including those who have uh, given back their 2% raises or deferred it or um, didn't even accept it. So uh, that is a priority. But then one of the other considerations I do have um, is that I do personally believe, because I've seen this many, many times um, thus far, that we actually have a plan in place for two to three years out when we are projecting um, negatively. Um, I don't feel that we have really done that. We take it kind of like day by day, and that's fine. But if we have another COVID resurgence or something else similar to it, um, it will be obviously a, a painful thing for the city to deal with. Um, 
And I would just, one of the things that I would suggest that maybe we do, just because I want to make sure we stay, we have a lot of presentations to get through and we're right at the time where we're supposed to be starting maintenance. One of the things that we did previously was sort of bring the council together to look at the five-year forecast and really play with the model and put some, like look at some strategies. And so I think that might be a useful work session to do again, to address some of the concerns that you're raising, just so that council members can have an opportunity to like, hey, what if we do this? What if we change, you know, how, how does how does this, it, it was a great sort of hands-on session. I think we did that maybe right before you got elected to council. And I think that might, it might be good to revisit that. Um, I think, I think that's important. I also just want to state that in, and I know we talked about this in our uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one, or one-on-two, I should say, um, the su supplies and services per each department. I know even just for the city council section, which I will reference again, um, it doesn't make sense considering that we don't, you know, I, I think in the report you wrote that, you know, we're buying paper and all this other stuff and, that's not necessarily accurate. So I, I do want to see the money that we are truly not using. It's a use it or lose it. And, you know, maybe we reduce it. It's about 60,000 just for council. Um, and I know I don't use it. So, uh, and everything's green. So I, I do just want to highlight even, you know, dollar per dollar, it, it matters. So, um, and creative ways without always kind of penalizing uh, city, city workers. So those are my concerns uh, at a high level. Thank you. I would think that we have um, actually reduced that. I mean, first of all, we do use that money. We Do you have business cards? Uh, not 60,000, not every year. My business cards are from when I was first elected. No, the, the, I mean, that's now. one element of it. We issue proclamations. We, um, you know, we have- um, uh, 30,000 of it is memberships, like in the League yeah, of Yeah, Council. right, and we, that's and, true. We could look at those, but you know- Yeah, I, I don't have a membership. Right so um, it's things like that. Equal well, fees. you know, it, it is real though. It's not made up. Um, and um, and then let's see, I, I wanna go to uh, Council Member Andrews. I was just gonna ask what Kelly, uh, what city manager mentioned uh, was, can we do a work session to figure out what we're doing in future years? Because um, I heard uh, this happens all the time and Council Member Andrews, you might, be alarmed by it, but we usually figure this out. And then at the same time, I heard a little doom and gloom. So it sounds like uh, in five years, uh, uh, we do a, a, a workshop for five years future planning. I was just wondering if we look at disposal of assets or something to kind of address these uh, types of issues. Uh, so those, okay, great. All right, thanks, that's all. And yeah, and we did that a few years ago. And although I think it was 10 year, I think we were using a 10 year forecast and we had that nice model, which I assume we still have, right? That, um, or that nice program that allowed us to plug in, like, what if we do this? And then it would show what, how that, how that bottom line changes over time. If we do, if we add different things, that would definitely be a good thing for us to do again. So thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. And with that, and being only three minutes, um, beyond schedule, we are now going to move into our department presentations and um, misplaced my agenda, but I do believe it's uh, maintenance first. Yes, because I see Mr. Ruhlman there ready to go, right? So. Dang. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I will try to set the record like I do every year for the quickest presentation start to finish. So I'm already ready, next slide, off we go. Um, you'll see our budget comparison from FY20 over to 22. Um, the one difference you'll see in 22 is really that the lighting and landscape district and maintenance district budgets have not yet been included in the budget. Um, those will be coming to the council in a couple of weeks. So we anticipate running relatively flat there. Um, next slide. So our significant changes for FY22, like other departments, we have a 5% reduction in supplies and services. I think the biggest thing is that we plan to return to pre-pandemic staffing levels and really just getting back to our core services. Um, one of the statistics I pulled, I wanted to use kind of as a point of reference that in a typical year, Maine Services dedicates about 112,000 working hours out in the community. That's doing illegal dumping, graffiti, trimming trees, maintaining our fleet vehicles and our 34 facilities. Due to the pandemic, the, the shelter in place orders and an effort to keep employees safe, 
we only dedicated 56,000 hours physically out in the community. It's, it's a 50% reduction. So we're keenly aware of the condition, honestly, that the community's in. It's something that we take seriously and personally. Um, with staff all back on normal work schedules as of late April, we're really trying to refine our focus and really rededicating ourselves to what has made us successful in the past. And that's being out embedded in the community, dealing with quality of life issues in the neighborhoods. The other significant change we have is we have two frozen uh, field staff positions, one in streets, one in landscape that were frozen for all of FY21. Next slide. Here's our organizational chart, uh, 69 FTE, no changes at all from the previous fiscal year. Next slide. So here are some of our highlights and accomplishments. Um, we really spent the initial months of the fiscal year really focused on COVID response. Over a seven week period during the city's initial pandemic response, maintenance services assisted in delivering over 245,000 pounds of food to our food distribution sites. We assisted in the setup of the initial COVID testing site at Fire Station 7. Our facilities team spent much of the year preparing our work sites to support new CDC and public health guidance around COVID. Some of those projects included uh, fabrication and installation of steel shields at all workstations, all public counters, and installing touchless fixtures in our facilities. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we really struggled from a staffing perspective just in terms of actual bodies on the street. All that said, we still responded to a little over 3,300 requests for service for illegal dumping and graffiti. Of those 3,300 requests, we still found a way to respond uh, within 72 hours, 92% of the time. Um, the last highlight I wanted to mention was about our hybrid patrol car program. So after a successful pilot that we did in late FY20, I'm really pleased to share that beginning in FY21, all patrol cars purchased are now hybrid. Um, we will no longer purchase traditional gas powered patrol cars going forward. It's really, really exciting for us. I think based on the data that we've gathered both during our pilot project and um, from some studies provided by NAFA, which is the North American Fleet Association, we anticipate a 30% reduction in total fuel consumption per unit. Um, a good majority of that is miles per gallon, but really the bulk is idle time. Patrol cars tend to idle when they're on site at scene. When they're idling, 90% of the time they're running strictly on batteries. So we're really, really excited about that um, transition. And next slide, which is the end. There you go. Questions and discussion. Excellent. That was, uh, we'll keep a track of it, but I think that was about um, between four and five minutes. So you might get that prize again. Um, okay. And oh, we have lots of questions for you, though, it looks like. Uh, Council Member Zermeno. Uh, Todd, thank you very much for the, jo for the job that you, uh, you have done in the presentation. Please, uh, my thanks to all your city staff for the great work uh, uh, with the litter and with the graffiti. Um, Congrats on the hybrid vehicles. How are we doing on electric, all electric vehicles? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're trying to work aggressively, but we're also trying to be smart. Obviously, most municipalities have the same issue, which is infrastructure. Um, we're currently starting a study with East Bay Community Energy to do a fleet electric, electricization study that's gonna do both looking at our fleet vehicles themselves but they're also going to look at all of our facilities for charging infrastructure. We have both in our um, the five-year strategic plan, a plan to expand EV use and also expand infrastructure. So we have our kickoff meeting with them. I think it's the first week of June, and we anticipate trying to roll some of this stuff out in FY22. Okay, then one last question. This is on trees. We, we're, we've been cutting down a couple of trees here and there. Uh, do we have a plan to replant them? Always. I, we won't cut anything down without putting something else up. You, you may be referencing Jackson. You know, we've yeah. had some, yeah. some eucalyptus on Jackson that 
are really, really heavy in the crown. We've had a few come down typically every winter, regardless of how tight we'll try to trim them up, they'll come down. So over time, um, we've really been trying to thin those out and take the most hazardous ones out. Our standard, especially on Jackson, where we're removing really large trees, those are gonna be replaced typically with 36 inch box, not a standard five or 10 gallon box tree. So we'll get as sizable a tree into that median as we can to try to keep the natural aesthetics. Thank you, Todd. Yep. All right, Council Member Wahab. Thank you, uh, Director Roman. I, I just wanna say, I actually really appreciated your section. Um, I, I stated to our city manager and uh, finance director that the fact that you have the fiscal year 2021 additional accomplishments um, is incredibly important. And I, I, I definitely do want every specific um, department to have their own accomplishments because I do think that the city went above and beyond in so many ways to, to get things done even in the face of COVID. Uh, so I do appreciate that. Um, if you can go to your second slide, The section that says uh, significant resource changes. Okay, and and the only reason why I asked for that is because um, it, it's slightly different than what was in the uh, in the budget document, you know, or friendly four hundred page <laughs> document. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you in particular is to be able to clean up the streets and to do a lot of the things that residents have been asking for, is there anything that you need in regards to tools or an investment somewhere or anything like that? Your staffing levels are staying the same. We're gonna get back to our core functions, but what else? You know, I think, I think we've tried to be a lot smarter about how we schedule work, where we schedule work. Um, one of the questions I got from the council the other day was uh, about focusing on freeway off ramps. You know, as long as I, as long as I've been doing this, I think a lot of stuff just comes natural. There's some stuff that's really basic that just flies by that you don't think of. I mean, I think we try to take advice from everybody. We're not closed to trying to do things better. I, I think when you talk about tools, equipment we need, I think one area that is always vulnerable for us is our fleet replacement. Um, we have, we have a really good fleet replacement program in terms of a 15 year life cycle, but you know, when stuff is out on the street, you guys probably see our, our grabber trucks out there doing illegal dumping our street sweepers when they're out there on the street, they're out there getting worked. And I mean, they're not sitting in the yard collecting dust. So every year that we go through this exercise and unfortunately budgets need to be cut we'll defer fleet purchases when we have to, but I, I wanna get back to a more regular consistent contribution to fleet. I think that's the area across our department that affects us the most, that we have issues with some vehicles that are past their useful life. We have street sweepers at times, while we've got a much more aggressive replacement schedule on those now, it doesn't do any good if a sweeper doesn't operate well and it's down and we've got guys doubling up routes or doing stuff like that. Okay. And, and I do want to highlight that um, I do appreciate the EV kind of transition, um, specifically for the cars. I know when I go on my ride-alongs with PD, I was always impressed that the Explorers are kind of just, I was like, why don't you guys turn it off? And they said, because of the electrical equipment and the time to kind of boot up. Um, I hopefully will not be seeing a Tesla uh, within the PD department. I do not think that those cars are safe for our PD personnel uh, in a high-speed um engagement primarily because we've seen some of the the wreck photos just even on the freeway they're they're not designed for some of the work that rpd does um number one and then number two is the fact that i i just genuinely want to appreciate you and your staff's work around um cleaning up the city uh i do want to highlight because i have told our city manager you know why aren't we cleaning up the um on and off ramps of the freeway areas um, it is not our responsibility, but if we can highlight that and tell and then make a social media post saying, please give a call to Caltrans um, as it is their responsibility um, and there's jurisdiction issues. I think that's not relayed enough to our residents. Um, and I hope that we can kind of at least be transparent in that. So thank you. Most definitely. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Council Member Salinas. Um, thank you. Um, 
I wanted to chime in and, um, you know, further all of the congratulations and, um, and thank you for all of your uh, work, uh, Mr. Rollman. Um, you know, your team uh, every day out there, pandemic, rain or shine, um, you guys, you know, uh, your team was out there, uh, you know, doing some incredible stuff. And um, although there has been an increase, a noticeable increase in illegal dumping and other, uh, other you know, uh, trash around and litter around the city, um, I know your uh, team has hustled and tried to, you know, uh, be on top of it as much as possible. And, and so my central question, and I only have one question is, um, you know, uh, what, when do you think uh, we could get back to a normal schedule around neighborhood cleanups and, um, you know, uh, and so that we can start engaging neighborhoods again? So the Key Paper Clean and Green has an event the third week of July. Uh, that event's going to move forward. It's going to be the first one that's going to be back up and running. It'll be hosted in the downtown um, at, at Giuliani Plaza. So I think going forward, um, the event will obviously follow all CDC and public health guidelines. But um, I think everybody's really excited to just get back out there. We have members on the task force that have been on the task force for a year that haven't done a cleanup event. They, they live in a virtual world of task force events. It's really awkward and kind of odd. So we're, we're really looking forward to getting back out there. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Council member Marquez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Todd, thank you for your great work. Please give my sincere appreciation, gratitude to your entire team. We can always count on them. They're great partners and um, a good reflection of our community. Um, I also wanted to just give my condolences. I know that um, we lost a valued um, employee this last year. So please just, um, I know we did the tree planning and there's been other memorial services, but just wanted to acknowledge that huge loss to our community. Um, can you please tell me how we are prioritizing getting back to um, the cleanups, uh, addressing the access Hayward? Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, it's not the city's fault. We're putting everyone's health and safety first, but our city does look a lot more dirtier. So how are we um, prioritizing which areas that we're going to address first? How is that decision being determined? So, so what we're doing right now is we're, we're trying to get back to just the normal stuff that we did through Access Hayward, which is typically first in, first out. Um, that said, when we get all the stuff into Access Hayward queue, it's, it's mapped in what parts of the city it's in. So while we try to go first in first out we're not going to dance from one end of the city to the other we'll try to get stuff in a geographical area we have a weekend work program the weekends are really when we were focusing on specific neighborhoods and districts and also if the council remembers uh, we had some one-time measure c money last year right around the the start of the pandemic um, that was allowing us to go into neighborhoods and we were doing just neighborhood smashes. It was all hands on deck. We'd run 10, 12 guys in there and it was anything and everything. Trees hanging over the street, illegal dumping, graffiti. It was anything and everything. Um, so I think that's one of the things we, I think we creatively put some budget in the stimulus to try to get back to doing some of that work. Um, but you know, I think it's, it's hard. I think similar, everybody kind of knows, you know, everybody's been home for a year. People are like, I'm sure like I am, like many of you are, didn't have a lot to do. Everybody cleaned their house. When I cleaned my house, I took the stuff to the dump. I think some people have chosen not to do that. Um, I, I am confident that once things settle out a little bit and we've got some time in the street, people get back to work, we'll get it cleaned up. I, I'm, I'm absolutely confident in that. Okay. And then my last comment is if we can please continue to coordinate with waste management on the dumping of bulky items, specifically the hot spots. I, I think the number is six per week, but we really got to make sure that we're taking advantage of that and leveraging that partnership. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Council member Lambden. Thank you. I absolutely wanted to add my appreciation to the, um, to that of my colleagues, really awesome work from this department every year, all the time. And just deeply appreciate that. And I also add my uh, condolences as was meant, as Elisa just mentioned about Robert Corona and um, 
the loss to the department, to the city, to his family. Um, I wanted to add a special appreciation about the collaboration around Light Up the Season. I know that wasn't always an easy uh, thing, but I think um, it was really beneficial to have such a beautiful celebration of hope, literally, in our city um, at such a dark time. And so really appreciate your personal efforts in that, as well as that of your staff to bring a lot of light to the city. Um, and similarly, the memorial for the lives lost to COVID was lovely. Thank you for that. Um, and my last appreciation, I have a lot of appreciations, but I'll only say one more, which is the, um, the work on greeting the fleet and really having that be data driven as well as, um, you know, environmentally driven. So that's exciting. I'm wondering, were there any thoughts or data, um, information about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's something, it's something we've definitely looked at. We have, um, we ran a couple of demo units with Honda about a year ago. I think at that time when we initially looked at it, it was uh, fuel availability. There was a location on A Street that was doing hydrogen at that time. I, I think, you know, we're, we're slowly trying to dip our foot in the water. And I'll, I'll use a, a real quick example about trying to go EV. You know, we spend somewhere in the range of three, $350,000 on, on a street sweeper. Um, our, our, one of the manufacturers we use is coming with an all electric sweeper. First one on the market, which we usually don't buy the first one on the market of anything, but I'm, I'm going down the sales pass with him and I get to the bottom line, $725,000. So it's, I, I think with, with the electric vehicles, hydrogen cell, I, I think trying to find that balance between where does it make financial sense? And, and I think that's something that we're kind of still working through. I think with the study with EBCE on our fleet, um, they've done some other cities in the East Bay. I think it'll give us some, some really, really good data. Every municipality has a different type of fleet. Their mix, their makeup is different. We just simply don't have a lot of passenger cars. We have some, not a lot, but you know, with, with our own utility and, and you know, the fire department, the police department, we don't have tons of little small passenger cars. So we really want to try to address that that low hanging fruit, the ones that we do have, we're aggressively trying to do, and we'll definitely look at every option available, even you know outside of electric almost. I appreciate that. And I know the, the fuel cell partnership and the air resources board are looking to try and get money into um, the light industrial kinds of um, engines and you know, encourage them to work with cities on for exactly the reasons that you just said, because uh, we don't, the, the prices do need to come down. Um, AC Transit just did um, a side-by-side -side comparison of the diesel buses, the hydrogen buses, and the electric buses. And so that those results were just recently released. Happy to share that report if that's helpful. Um, yes, please. Okay, will do. Again, many thanks. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add that AC, uh, AC um, oh, did you say AC Transit? Or AC. Okay, Alameda County Transportation Commission is has a working group going right now, looking into fuel cell technology. I'm I'm sorry, hydrogen. Yeah, that's it. Hydrogen fuel cells. If I know really what I'm talking about, I mean I know the words hydrogen. Um, but anyway, it is it is looking at that for larger scale vehicles. And I'm wondering if um, there might not be some um, grant programs coming forward to help people to help jurisdictions like ours say do some of this so anyway thank you for the comments um council member andrews thank you i just wanted to also give kudos to the maintenance department um, a lot of uh, attention goes to first responders when it came to the COVID response but there was a lot of work that was done by the maintenance department to set up those testing centers and uh, food giveaways so i really appreciate that um, i also wanted to highlight uh, yes, Caltrans is responsible for the uh, on and off ramps for cleanup, but we also need to look at our other agencies in terms of graffiti in their utility boxes and um, bus shelters and just wanted to know if the maintenance department has um, considered having a liaison that uh, can kind of field some of the things that, are, that don't hit our jurisdiction, but their jurisdiction. Um, to respond more quickly to, to those concerns that the community raises when they see issues? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a really good idea to have, try to have a dedicated liaison. You know, the issue is like any other organization that you've got a million things going on and things pass from person to person. And like, I've got a great contact at Caltrans, so I'm going to use this guy and somebody uses somebody else. Um, you know, it's it's difficult. And I think a, li a, li a liaison would be great. And I think cost-wise to try to add a position. One of the questions that council brought the other day was about expanding internship opportunities. And that's something that we've worked on a job description for both um, a trades like maintenance intern and also an admin staff intern. And that might be an opportunity for us to bring, you know, some interns in to help us do some of that advocacy and contacts for us. Cause we try to follow up. It's just, you know, some things fall between the cracks and maybe we don't beat the door hard enough as, as we should. I wish I could apply for that position, but I, my plate is full. So I, I would have, um, <laughs> Uh, and then I just also wanted to thank you for your support on adopt a block I've been seeing a lot more organizations businesses um, even politicians uh, through social media um, adopting a block and I'm hoping that um, more entities like that will continue to adopt a block and I just want to see have you seen an actual increase in percentages for adopt a blocks or is it just because I see it on social media more that it's happening. No, we've definitely seen a lot more. We've been working with, with Chuck's team and, and advertising, trying to get the word out about it. You know, there, there's a lot of folks during the, during the pandemic that contacted us and said, hey, I'm going to do a cleanup. Um, can you give me some supplies? And they didn't really even know about the Adopt-A-Block program. So I think we got, we had a lot of participation that way. I think the Raising Leaders program has been doing some expansion with some of the other ones in the community. And um, they're out, they're busy, but we've definitely seen um, an exponential increase over the last year. It's been nice. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Devo. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll just, um, along the lines of the cleanup, it's not, and, and as been said, it's not all our own responsibility and we should work with Caltrans and we should work with the um, owners of the utility boxes and um the um, bus, we do have, we do have a, a small working committee with uh, AC Transit, which I believe council members Lamden and, and Zerminia sit on, so they might speak up at that. Um, but also the private property owners, you know, I've received a lot of complaints about some of our shopping centers and the debris that has accumulated there. And, um, and we have, and I know this is not, it is more code enforcement, possibly, but I'm sure you work with them a lot um, in terms of coordinating those efforts and getting these uh, private property owners to also stand up for, you know, and be um, doing a better job of cleaning up their own properties. And, you know, I mean, it's been hard because I know retail has been down, profits have been down and all of that, but nevertheless, it is their responsibility. So we should um, try to work with them to get that done. And just on I, I, I concur with um, well a lot of the comments and my uh, colleagues have made, including um, condolences again, um, uh, you know, for the loss of, of one of the employees. And I know that was really a low point probably for the whole city as far as COVID. Um, but um, uh, um, what was I going to say? We need... Um, we need to do more to encourage personal responsibility. I mean, I talked about the businesses, but also, and you know, and you talked to, I think we did all clean up and, you know, and the alternative that, I mean, I'm glad you didn't, you know, throw your stuff out on the sidewalk. I'm, I can't imagine that you would have done such a thing, but also just re, you know, finding ways to reuse things um, and making sure that we are doing a good job of recycling what we can, where it should be recycled. And and I, it can be a very confusing thing to do. And I know we've been having discussions, some discussions about this at, at um, the Council Sustainability Committee in terms of our, uh, you know, our upcoming discussions with waste management about the future contract. But, um, you know, and that's where I would also um, look to uh, the keep the Hay uh, Hayward Beautiful, I think is, it's called now, <laughs> keep what used to be Keep Hayward Cleaning and Green Task Force um, to really help with that messaging all of us, whenever we're speaking to anyone, especially young people, the importance of this. I mean, there is just no reason for your department to have to clean up all the trash that it has to clean up because it shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and I, I just, I won't, I'll get off the soapbox now, but that is an area where I would just really um, 
uh, like to see us try to do more with our entire population of, hey, everybody, you know, don't treat city streets, um, you know, like they're, a, a, you know, a, a trash pit or, you know, treat them like you treat your own house, although that might not work with some people who treat their own houses that way. But, um, but anyway, I, I just think we need to do more to get that message out. And with that, and no further questions, um, I'm going to, um, unless you wanted to make any comments about that. I don't <laughs> okay. have anything. Thank you. Okay, but but I do really think um, I I have seen an improvement in our part of you know in the last few weeks um, of you know the efforts that your your uh, team has made and I really appreciate that too. So with that, we will now move on, and we are we are a little bit behind schedule um, even with your short presentation. But uh, so I'm glad you built that extra time in, Madam City Manager. But um, we're going to move on now to. Um, development services, and I do believe we'll be hearing from our um, Assistant City Manager, Ms. Ott. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members, Jennifer Ott, Assistant City Manager, although right now I'm wearing a different hat, which is the Development Services Director hat, and I'll be co-presenting with the Deputy Director, uh, Sarah Bowser, and so I'm going to get us started, and then she's going to talk a little bit about our, the accomplishments. So first, just talk a little bit about some of the trends that we've seen. You see the FY 2020 actuals that was really that much lower. Um, that same year, the adopted budget for that was about $12.5 million. And you see really the reduction due to the closure of the permit center because of COVID. Then you see in 2021, kind of moving our way back, we had a hiring freeze for six months of the 2021. Um, permit revenue is kind of coming back. Um, and then 12.5 is what our proposed budget really is, is really getting us back to pre-pandemic and back to that, what that adopted budget in 2020 was. Um, we don't, you know, we're hiring very quickly or we're trying to hire very quickly and find people to, to kind of, we have a number of staff vacancies, retirements. Um, and so really trying to get back to where we were um, prior to the pandemic. Um, and go ahead and move on to the next slide. We have reduced our budget similar to the other general fund departments by 5%. And then there's really number two is a change in the way, really just an accounting change in terms of how we're keeping track of revenues. We're trying to really keep track of our permit and our inspection revenues, creating special funds for them so we can be more transparent, um, clearer about where the money's coming in and where the money's coming out. So this is really more of accounting. It's not really a change in the budget as much as it is a way for us to be um, better accounting of our revenues and, and understanding, you know, how to, you know, help us budget moving forward. Next slide. So really, I think the biggest thing there's not, I mean, other than just trying to staff up vacancies, we're not, we're not asking for new positions, we're just actively working to staff um, some of the vacancies and hiring um, from the hiring freeze and then some additional vacancies due to retirements. But the biggest thing here is really just that we, as everyone knows, that the director did, was one of those retirements. Um, and so I'll be taking over in that role with um, Sarah Bowser as the acting deputy director, um, who's, as you know, um, already jumped in and helping and, and managing a lot of what's going on. It has a long history in that department and really helping with a, a, a smooth transition. And so that's really the biggest thing to report organizationally um, and really then just trying to staff up. So we are seeing our permit rev our permit activity back to those pre-pandemic levels. So making sure we have the staff to, to support all that work. And I'm going to turn over the next slide to Sarah, since Sarah and her team was really involved in all of these accomplishments. She's going to present these. Uh, thank you, Jen. So uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, so just highlighting a few things that we worked on. So really related to COVID response, we really tried to streamline our permit processes, um, adapting to electronic plan submittals and plan reviews um, in anticipation of when we do make that transition with our new EnerGov permitting system, but really starting that up front um, through that process. And it's really proved uh, really successful with a lot of our, our applicants and, and they're really excited about thus maintaining that aspect as we move forward and then creating new streamlined processes to support activities for our business community um, when they were really struggling. So creating new permit processes for outdoor business activities, outdoor dining and this and the like and all of which we, we created and weren't charging for in order to help support and allow those businesses to maintain those activities. 
Um, as far as employee engagement, we really felt like it was important to still focus on employee engagement issues. And obviously working remotely proved very challenging for being able to regularly connect with staff across departments when we're doing development review. But we did establish some weekly meetings um, between Public Works, Fire, and development staff, uh, really to discuss projects on a regular, more consistent basis to make sure we were maintaining processes. And then we reestablished a biweekly development review meeting with all reviewing departments um, in the city to make sure we were maintaining our, our timelines for processing applications, bringing up issues, sharing ideas so that we understood what was happening in other departments, um, and really just at a staff level, making sure that we were coordinating our efforts for projects. And then last, lastly, we had a number of new ordinance adoptions that we brought forth for council, um, including the vacant property ordinance, the revisions to the tobacco ordinance, and the updates to the form-based code zoning regulations. So quite busy despite, you know, pandemic uh, during uh, the, the end of last fiscal year and the beginning of this one and still here. So um, that's sort of where the focus of where a lot of our stuff or our time was in addition to just the regular project uh, development review. Next slide. Right. Yep. Right. Questions and answers. So we're hope we're here to answer any questions you may have. Well, you may have done better than Dustin. <laughs> I mean, than or Todd. Todd. It wasn't Dustin. It was Todd. You, All right. Um, a long time. Yeah. Um, I wasn't keeping track, but that was good. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, I was just getting to me. So we do have some questions, and let's see. We'll start with Council Member Salinas. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I just got one question. You know, um, a few years ago, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that I was part of the, uh, then I was on this, the uh, Council Information and Technology, CTAC committee when we started to talk about um, moving the plan process uh, fully online. And um, uh, now that we have are making that transition, I don't know if we're 100% there. Uh, I hope we are. Sounds like we are. Um, I, you know, I haven't received any calls <laughs> as to um, you know gross problems or you know businesses haven't you know reached out to me. Um, but I, I do know that the central, I mean, the the the, the central concern for a lot of businesses uh, was um, you know if they were uh, expanding, for example, it was just very cumbersome. Um, you know, when they would enter a process, um, it was unpredictable. There was no timeline. They didn't know when it would end, and it was expensive, and you know, et cetera. And I'm, you know, um, and and similarly with you know businesses that were um, uh, opening. I mean, I would just get calls of frustration. So I guess. My question is, is now that we're, you know, migrating to online um, and I know we're in COVID and so forth, but has there been, you know, uh, major pushback complaints, <laughs> you know, how, what, how has been the process uh, to date? Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's worked out really well. I think we we tend to have a lot of applicants. You know, some of the bigger developers I think really appreciate being able to submit electronically um, and have everything done that way, so they don't have to make an appointment or you know make special time to come into the permit center. I think the closure probably has disproportionately impacted sort of the the small resident or the you know the resident that you know has maybe a little more challenge. Um, you know, being able to do that maybe doesn't have those resources. And so, you know, in, in an effort to sort of maintain some equitability in, in that is we, we did create, um, and thanks to Todd and his staff, they created us some really lovely wooden drop boxes for out in our permit center to allow folks to still be able to come into the center and drop things off. And while we do have staff in the office, they can collect that for those that maybe don't have the ability. Um, but I think the online has really helped a, a lot of folks. We haven't heard a lot, but you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of looking forward to being able to get back and open the, the, the permit center, even if it's limited hours um, coming up, just because you, know, you wanna be able to provide that one-on-one -on -one help to folks and not everybody has access to, you know, to be online to a Zoom meeting and that sort of thing. So being able to talk to somebody one on one across the counter is sort of um, that that sort of special attention, you know, is definitely missed and is lost um, during the closure. But I think overall, it's been very positive, and folks yeah. have really liked uh, what we've been able to provide. 
I just, but, I just want to add that yeah. we are planning on trying to keep a hybrid. So we kind of, we're not going to, we're seen it as additive. We're going to open up, but we're not going to necessarily let go of those other services that we provided so that we can really provide a broader kind of opportunity for all the different ways people might want to submit. Good, because um, I know on um, economic development, um, uh, both of you have been in those meetings where, you know, we're really pushing to get local retail open again. Uh, we're really pushing uh, even um, those who are starting new businesses in this time. Um, you know, uh, we're trying to get them open doors, you know, doors open and, and, and doing business. And so whatever we can do, uh, as I'm, as I'm sure, you know, uh, whatever we can do to exp expedite that process and get them to open the doors and turn the lights or is it turn the lights on and open the doors whatever comes first <laughs> okay. thank you okay thank you council member marquez i'm gonna say first you gotta open the door before he gets the lights but, that was a good one. <laughs> um, but i just want to thank um your entire team i i echo a lot of the comments council member salinas has made uh years past we would get our slew of complaints and I honestly really haven't heard any. I've heard a lot of compliments. Um, Hayward's been great to work with and echo those comments. We really need to retain all the businesses that we have in Hayward and support those that wanna grow and expand and welcome new ones. That's gonna help us with our sales tax and all the other revenue we bring in. So we don't have to um, go to our employees for more asks. So it's really, really important that we do the best we can to beef up this department as well as economic development. And I'm glad to hear um, the synergy and working in a collaborative manner and um, the, the plan check review and just making sure that there's we can minimize delays. So thank you for those efforts. Um, I did have a question and now it's escaping me. It'll probably come back to me. Oh, um, I really appreciate at one point, I think we were getting quarterly updates and all major developments, kind of like the status of them. I can't remember the last time we got one of those, um, may have been three, four months ago, I honestly don't remember, but I was watching the planning commission meeting on Thursday night, and I know there was a request for planning commissioners to receive that information as well. Um, so if we could just get back on track, that was very, very helpful. I don't um, need an answer now, but glad to see the progress with Lake and Landing, with Sohei, but just very concerned about Maple and Maine. So I'll just leave it at that and we could mm -hmm. address that later, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Wahab. Yeah, thank you. Um, one, I just wanna thank you and your staff. Um, I know that, you know, permits people like to go in and talk to somebody and really engage with them and ask questions before they make such a commitment or an investment. Um, so I do appreciate that. Um, the one thing I do wanna say, and I know that you guys work well with our different, um, you know, departments, for example, fire and so forth, uh, the code enforcement, piece of it. Um, I know I have received a lot of emails, you know, over the course of some time that kind of talks about enforcing the codes a little bit more stricter. Um, and, you know, from, you know, clearing up streetways and, and being able to kind of do some of that to some of the permitting of new buildings and some construction and so forth. I know you guys have been incredibly responsive. Um, but when it escalates to, you know, somebody emailing me, it's usually because of fees or something like that, um, or because they haven't heard a response. And I know that I've talked to our city manager about this, um, and hopefully we can have, you know, all, all the departments kind of respond within, you know, I'm going to say 24 to 48 hours. Um, but specifically understanding that, you know, people's situation with COVID and some, some folks who have lost their jobs and so forth. I appreciate the flexibility you guys have kind of shown with the um, the fees um, and, and the scalability. And I, I hope that we continue that. Um, and as much as possible, even uh, to Director Ott, um, our Assistant City Manager Ott, um, kind of making everything that we do kind of template style. So it's just a smoother process for everybody. And the more we have that, the, the smoother we can transition into uniformity and 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 things like that. So I just want that to be on the radar for the upcoming um, year. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised at the moment. I don't think I, no, I don't know any. I just, uh, I'll echo that you are doing a good job. We aren't hearing as many complaints. Um, keep that up. And I, uh, you know, certainly encourage the um, 
uh, you know, at the attempts that you've made um, to, you know, to uh, meet and um, assist the smaller, you know, the smaller mm -hmm. builders and developers and, and, and people in homes that want to do changes. Um, and, um, and that we do what we can to get open as soon as we can and mm -hmm. have people coming back to City Hall. Um, and so with that, um, we've come to actually what on our schedule um, is supposed to be a break. I'm going to ask everybody if we could, um, I don't know if we talked about this beforehand, I, I believe our city clerk is here and ready to go. Um, I'm going to be taking a short break in the 11 o'clock to the 11 at 15. Yes, council member, um, Mayor Pro Tem Wahab, I see you smiling and I should have, I should have mentioned to you this to you beforehand, but um, if so, uh, I'm going to be um, welcoming the youth to our youth conference that's being held um, today virtually. Uh, so I was wondering if everybody is okay with going ahead with the um, city clerk's um, presentation and then taking our break after um, after she's done. I'm seeing our, and I'm seeing I'm uh, council and nods from uh, Miriam. So uh, Madam City Clerk, Ms. Lenz, uh, do you want to go ahead? Yes, Madam Mayor. Hi. Again, good morning, Mayor, Council members, uh, city staff, and community members. I see that we have some attendees, so uh, I'd like to greet them as well. And thank you for advancing the slides, uh, Nicole. So I'd like to direct your attention to the budget comparison slide. Uh, the, the columns I want to highlight are FY21 adopted to FY22 proposed. Uh, when we remove the election expense from FY21 adopted and compare it to FY22 proposed, there is about $54,000 uh, increase due to salary benefit and CalPERS costs, which, as you know, we have no control over. Uh, next slide, please. Proposed significant changes for FY22 include a 5% reduction in supplies and services similar to other departments. We have a, we are planning to fill a senior secretary vacancy and changes to the passport program based on the blueprint for a safer economy. And as you know, uh, due to COVID, 19, all passport services were suspended and they continue to be suspended uh, because protecting the health and uh, safety of not only our staff, but our community members is important to us. As the state fully reopens the economy, we will evaluate how to return to normal operations in compliance with OSHA and other state guidelines within uh, limited public health restrictions. Next slide, please. The org chart that you have in front of you reflects no changes pretty much to FTEs from FY21 to FY22. I already mentioned uh, the department has one vacancy which is anticipated to be filled most likely in the first quarter of FY22. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And with uh, this slide, uh, the accomplishments for the city clerk's office can be found on pages 122 to 123 of the budget book. Um, staff has done an outstanding work um, during the global pandemic. Uh, we were the essential workers uh, who continued to work behind the scenes, uh, as, you, as, as you know. Uh, to process official documents that were adopted by, by the city council and to also keep the community informed. I do want to highlight uh, three significant accomplishments as you can see them on, on the screen. Uh, the first one, um, which was not a goal, um, but um, it was accomplished and it involved leading the transition of virtual meetings from Microsoft Teams to the Zoom platform. We learned the platform, created guidelines, and trained all users during that time. The second involved a November election. The election was historic. 
During a global pandemic, we issued nomination papers to 14 city council candidates and processed two ballot measures. Uh, they all, the office partnered with the Alameda County Register of Voters to identify drop box locations in accessible voting locations throughout Hayward. Uh, voter voters pretty much turned out at a rate not seen before. Uh, and as you saw from the report, we had over 80,000 registered voters um, in, in 2020. Last but not least uh, was the implementation of electronic signatures via DocuSign. Uh, our staff processed over 350 documents, which increased efficiency and mitigated the in-person contact. Uh, next, please. And I think with that, um, I'm now ready and available to take any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and I see um, Council Member Salinas. You're muted. Yeah, <laughs> so I, you know, I just want to be the first one out to shoot to say, um, uh, Ms. Lenz, uh, your office uh, just did an extraordinary job. Um, you know, I, um, you know, uh, um, as, as one of those 14 candidates uh, last year, um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, the process was smooth. Um, you, you know, you continue to, uh, um, you know, educate all of us on, you know, rules and procedures and, uh, you know, we got all of our paperwork in. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, to your team of four, <laughs> you know, you know, to your team of four, um, you know, uh, fantastic job. I, I appreciate that. And um, I just wanted to highlight that you are one of the three uh, appointed officers um, that uh, the city council is responsible for. And, um, and so uh, I, you know, um, just, just a great job all the way around. And I, I, I appreciate it. So um, th those are really my comments. I'll just keep them short for, for this one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Marquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, but um, Miriam, your your group is small but mighty. You do a lot, a lot of heavy lifting in our community. And I just want to thank you and your entire team for all the great work you do. I know I've said this before, but to date, I've yet to hear a single complaint concern about your department. Everyone is just so pleased with your work and your team's work. and you have a really high level of integrity, respect, and um, just really understanding our community. So thank you so much for that. And you have um, the biggest heart and patience. I don't know how you do what you do and keep it together, but you help keep me grounded when I want to lose it. So thank you so much for all your efforts this past 13 months. Thank you, thank you Council Member. Okay, thank you, Council Member Wahab. Thank you. Um, I think everyone here would have to say that uh, to your city clerk and her entire department, um, you have done an excellent job, always have. Uh, I, I will say I, I genuinely appreciate, again, in your section of the budget uh, document that you do uh, explain clearly the fiscal year 2021 additional accomplishments on top of everything you do on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, I know that when I come into City Hall and when I'm here, pretty much uh, you you or somebody from your staff was in your office every single day. Um, and uh, you guys had somebody on site. You guys also were completely available, um, uh, you know, via web and, and phone and so forth. So I genuinely appreciate all the work you do. I will also relay some things that I've heard from the public. Um, you have been incredibly kind to the public. Um, there's not a single complaint about you or your office in any capacity. If anything, I receive text messages, emails, calls saying your city clerk is one of the kindest people out there. So um, I know I value you and your department and the work that you do. I know that the public also does. And I, I really just want to highlight that, um, that I have heard from commissioners who have been resigning um, and moving on to different things uh, that constantly state that. So I appreciate your efforts there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right, thank you. Council Member Andrews. 
Yeah, thank you. I wanted to also give kudos to your department and also highlight the benefits of the passport program. Um, my mother had a really pleasant experience renewing her passport prior to the pandemic, and um, she's completely obsessed with Miss Lynn. So if she becomes a problem, please let me know. But um, she um, she had a really easy experience, and I know that is not the case when you go to other locations. And um, just want to make sure that we can keep that on our radar. And then also wanted to um, acknowledge that this election was really an interesting experience for me. And when I was turning in paperwork, you were um, so kind and patient, even though it was the day before everything was shutting down, everyone was very patient and kind with me in the midst of all that. So I just wanted to, again, thank you for always um, being so informative and also navigating this digital space and running meetings is not easy. So I also wanna give you kudos to your whole department on managing all that. So thanks. Thank you, council member. <clears throat> right, thank you. Um, and council member Zermenio. Uh, Miriam, thank you very much for the good work. Uh, when do you expect the hiring of your senior staff member? There are Yes, um, we anticipate doing that during the first quarter of FY22. So we are looking, uh, we were trying to save funds because we are not um, providing the passport service. So as soon as we start <clears throat> opening uh, more services, then we are going to expedite that process of filling the vacancy. Okay, and that will help the passport services too, of course, right? Correct, correct. Okay. And again, thank you, you and your staff for an excellent job, as always. Thank you, council members, mayor. Appreciate it. Yes, and I'll just echo everybody's comments. We really appreciate the work that you did, especially last year when you had the election, you were you know, in the midst of COVID and trying to you know, support everybody and, and reinvent how we do things so that you could in the, you know, under the circumstances of sheltering in place and, and uh, still it all went very smoothly and i know that you are very conscientious about any requests we get whether it's public records requests or just you know how how can i participate in this or that and and just do a great job of serving the public and i as you can see we all really appreciate that so thank you so much and um i'm going to say with that um i don't i don't think um we want to go right into um public works. Uh, so I, I think now we will have our break, but that means I think they I'm scheduled to um, speak around 10 after 11 is what I was told, but I'll be tuning in for the beginning of that meeting. So um, so we will take a break now until 1055 um, and then reconvene um, and, and Mayor Pro Tem Wahab can start us, uh, can can be um, officiating. Are you ready to do that? I'm, I'm yes. sure you're Now that you tell me, yes, of course. Uh, Mayor, yeah, I'll I'll just and I will read, okay. And I will rejoin you. Oh, count, um, Madam City Manager, were you gonna I say? just wanted to remind, because we did have some new public uh, attendees join that the switch from the police department budget presentation, just to alert them that that will be happening at around 2.30 this afternoon instead of the original 11.25 timeframe. So um, just wanted to make that announcement in case folks are on the call waiting for that presentation. So it'll be around, police department budget will be around 2.30 PM. All right, so with that, we will now um, uh, take a, a pause, take a break until around right around 1055, everybody should be back and ready to go with um, the public works presentation. And I will rejoin you as soon as I can after that. Thanks everybody.
Are we all back? We're waiting for Mayor Pro Tem. And here's another cat, everybody. <laughs> My daughter's <laughs> cat. She's visiting, so he comes and goes with her. You want to go outside? Oh. What a cutie. Aisha, are you here? Warriors won yesterday. Good. You're looking good, Alex. You all ready? I'm already, yes, as good. ready as I'll ever be. Good. good seeing you today. Thank you. I'm so glad that we had the break because it's so hard to follow uh, Miriam. She's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> so <laughs> true. Has anybody um, texted Aisha? Any chance? Thanks, Mary. To any departments where I don't make a comment, um, I'm totally appreciative of the work. I'm just trying to keep us moving along <laughs> for help. I know we're all trying to do that today. Councilmember Salinas, you should have um, Todd look at that wall. You might want to check it out. <laughs> you the Hulk who goes through. <laughs> that, that's how I that's how I uh, uh, express my frustrations in budget <laughs> times. <laughs> wanted to let you know, council members, uh, I'm trying to get a hold of uh, council member Wahab. I hope she's not having technical difficulties. City manager, I think we should just go ahead and start. It's just a presentation, right? I, I don't know. Who, who's our, who's our past uh, pro mayor pro tem? I think it was you. Was it you? No, I think it was Mark. No, I am. Yeah, okay. So go ahead, Mark. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna reconvene the meeting at 10.59 a.m. And um, we will proceed with uh, department presentations. Um, uh, next is Public Works and Utilities Department led by Alex Amiri, also referred to as the professor. Go ahead, Professor Amiri. Thank you, Council Member Salinas, and good morning, Council Members. Um, in your uh, budget book, the department budget has been divided into two segments. One is uh, engineering, transportation, and airport, and the other segment is environmental services and utilities. And that's how I'm going to also cover the uh, presentation. Under the uh, engineering, transportation, and airport, you see that we have an increase in the proposed amount for FY22. Most of this is related to uh, or some of it, half of it is related to airport, which is an enterprise. The other half is related to engineering and transportation. And although you see an increase here, I should say that the footprint that these three divisions have on the general fund is very, very small. Airport is an enterprise and the projects and programs that engineering and transportation are involved with they are funded by special funds, as you know, like Measure B, Measure BB, 
SB1, you know, one, one Bay Area, and so on. So the footprint on general fund expenses is very, very small. Uh, the changes that you see is related to the fact that we don't have uh, savings this year related to the federal co uh, COLA or uh, furloughs and so on. So there is nothing that has been added above and beyond. It's just those expenses that are shown here. Next. The budget for uh, utilities and environmental services is more than 10 times the uh, budget for the other three divisions, mainly because of the uh, revenues and expenses related to water and wastewater. Um, again, the general fund impact of this amount is extremely low. Out of the $83 million proposed, I think that about $50,000 is related to impact on general fund because of the uh, management of uh, waste management, which does not have a special fund like recycling fund to, to support it. Uh, the expenses are primarily related to increase or anticipated increase in water sales and a recommendation that I'm going to have next month to you to change the sewer rate uh, that we are working on right now. Other than that, the only other thing that we have done here is transferring some, some more money from water to capital in order for us to be able to do more pipeline replacement because the cost of pipeline replacement is going up, uh, has gone up in the past two years. Uh, next. So the changes are similar to other departments. We have the 5% reduction in general fund supplies and services. We are also recommending to change one of the uh, positions in transportation, that's transportation manager, from that title to deputy director of public works for transportation. As you know, as you may know, the uh, transportation manager position has been vacant now for several months after uh, Fred Kelly, who was our transportation manager uh, resigned and went to city of Oakland to become deputy director in transportation department. This position of transportation manager or deputy director for transportation has a critical role to play in uh, providing for advocacy and representation for the city. We are competing for all kinds of funds from ACTC, from the state and from other sources and we are competing with the likes of Fremont and the city of Oakland that have more resources. They have devoted more resources to this area. This change is going to have a relatively small change in terms of cost. The difference in salaries is only about $3,000, but I think that the ability for us to be able to attract a higher level of applicants when we are replacing the position is going to be uh, much more, and then the position is going to be more effective, hopefully, in competing for funding at the uh, uh, county and state level. We are also, as I mentioned, uh, increasing our transfer from water to water capital to be able to do more pipeline replacement. So the amount is going to go up from $4.5 million to $5 million a year. In, in that transfer. We are also embarking on a plan for the re reuse of the uh, Sky West Golf Course. That's a 126 acre piece of property that the airport owns. And uh, the golf operation has come to an end as of last September. And we are going to plan and bring to council for direction what to do with, uh, with that property. Uh, we are also expecting that our new recycled water project is going to be uh, put into commission uh, later uh, this summer and generate about $600,000 in uh, recycled water deliveries. Next. This is our uh, org chart. We have 161 employees in six divisions in engineering, transportation, in the super large utilities uh, division yeah, at the airport, administration, and also environmental services. No changes the number, to the number of positions are, uh, uh, are contemplated, except as I mentioned, 
the change in title for the uh, transportation services manager to deputy director of public works in transportation, similar to deputy director of public works in engineering that we have right now. Next. Um, we were limited here to highlight only three accomplishments. So uh, we have come up with these three. One is uh, the work that engineering, transportation, and utilities, also environmental services do in uh, processing developments. As you know, all kinds of development, whether it is land development, preparing a subdivision map, improvement plans, many of the building permits are reviewed or touched by transportation, engineering, utilities, environmental services. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, you know, although the office has been closed, uh, there has been, as you know, a surge in the amount of development, but we've been able to uh, work through that and accomplish that. Even when a staff person, key staff person downstairs in uh, the development process in the uh, development services department, departed and went to another agency. Someone from uh, public works department went down, helped out and uh, kept the process going. So we are very proud of that. I know that council is concerned about you know, this area and they want us, you want us to do better and we are redoubling our effort to make sure that uh, we accomplish that. We also prepared a uh, water rate change and a wastewater rate change that we are going to uh, bring before you in early June for direction from council in a work session. And also under leadership of this council, we've been able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So the department prepared a greenhouse gas emission inventory for 2019, showing that the emissions have been reduced by approximately 26%, which is much more than the goal of 20% by 2020. So it was a year early and much more than the goal. And this uh, puts us on a very good path to meeting our 30% reduction by 2025. Next. Thank you. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Thank Director, Director Amiri. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor sorry. Pro Tem, go ahead. No worries. Um, had a little technical difficulty. Um, we have Council Member Zermenio with uh, some questions slash comments. Um, Alex, uh, Mr. Mary, thank you very much um, uh, for the report. I'm very pleased with all the green things that you do, you and your staff. So that's uh, very, very commendable. Uh, what is the progress of our second solar farm? When, when, when we designed the uh, solar uh, farm, as you referred to it, it was a two uh, acre uh, farm. But we to a megawatt farm, but we were not able to proceed with all of it because we do not have a use for more than 600 kilowatt right now. The other 1.4 was going to be developed in cooperation with EBC. Uh, EBC uh, has told us they have found much cheaper uh, solar energy far away, uh, you know, in the valley, not in the Bay Area and it is not economical for them to proceed with the 1.4 uh, megawatt. So what I'm going to do is to wait until we develop internal need for it. And that is going to happen. As you know, we are working on our second phase of the uh, treatment plant expansion, also nutrients management, which is going to require a lot of energy as those needs develop and come about, we are going to embark on doing the uh, uh, additional 1.6 megawatt of energy that um, we have prepared the land for and we are ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Marquez. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Alex, for your great work. Um, you also do a tremendous amount of work um, with your division. Um, one of the larger ones in our community. So I really respect your professionalism, your integrity, and you manage a lot. So just thank you for all of your great work and please give my appreciation to your team as well. 
Um, just some observations being on the community, the council sustainability committee, as well as the chair of the infrastructure committee. Um, we've had some things come up last year. I think, you know, we're all under a lot of stress. We're being asked to do a lot under the pandemic. So just an idea of maybe doing a 30 minute meeting um, a month or two prior to each committee meeting to do kind of agenda setting with the chair. I haven't ran this by the mayor, but I'm open to doing that as the chair of the CSC, just to kind of pre brainstorm and kind of anticipate get ahead of some of the, the challenges we've had in the last year. I think that will allow all of us to work more efficiently through those committee meetings. And also, um, I know we ask staff to do more and more like almost on every encounter every meeting. But I think part of that pre planning meeting can also be you know, what's council's role? How can we kind of divide up this responsibility, the outreach, the communication with the public? So I just, you know, want to see us kind of tie up those miscommunications and just some challenges we've encountered. So that's just an idea I want to throw out there, but thank you for all your great work. Thank you, council member Marquez. Um, we have council member Lamnan now. Thank you, uh, Alex, for a really great year. Um, every year you're your professionalism, the enthusiasm that your staff has for the environment, for their jobs, um, for really stewarding the resources well, all of the resources in this city, you and your team are exceptional and we really appreciate that. I had a question about the outreach plan regarding the SkyWest property. I know there's some internal plans being developed. I'm curious about what the thoughts are when the community starts to be involved in that planning process. Mm -hmm. So right now we are in the process of hiring a consultant to uh, bring on board and start the process. We are definitely going to uh, reach out to stakeholders, including the residents that are going to be affected, community members here, of course, council and uh, planning commission to uh, get feedback from them in every step of the process as we develop this asset that is, as you know, owned by airport, but it is a community asset and it's going to affect all aspects of uh, that part of the city. And did you have a timeline about when you thought that would? I would say, I would say that we, we start the process in the next couple of months or so. Uh, we bring the consultant on board and then the process itself is going to take several months to complete. Got it. So through the fall and winter of this year. Correct. Okay, great. That's what I was trying to get a sense of what that timeline looked like. That's great. Thank you. Um, and lastly, I know 1880, SB 1883 is already on your radar well and looking forward to the city involving um, I know the county and stop waste obviously are working on. And I know Francisco has been monitoring that as well um, about how we partner with um, local organizations and um, especially the edible food recovery and sort of the, the food cycle. Um, so I appreciate continued work on those things. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add my gratitude to you and your department. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I often tell our city manager that you are definitely an A player um, when we talk about uh, the performance um, to the public, I, I just want to highlight the incredible sensitivity that this, um, you know, department as well as uh, Director Miri in all his work has had for uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, even in the fee increases that we all know has to happen, um, he has analyzed even before council has asked if um, if there's any way to kind of delay some of the. Um, fee increases, uh, seeing how the economy is doing, uh, a lot of the math before, again, like I said, before the council even asks, um, he suggests it. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. And just the, the, like I said, the sensitivity to people in their circumstances. And um, anytime I have a question, even if you don't have the answer, um, I often say that you have it by um, noon the next day. So I, I genuinely appreciate all the work you do. Um, and it's been a pleasure uh, working with you in your department. So thank you. Thank you. Definitely. To our city manager, um, we have our next presentation from you, right? Um, I'm actually, uh, our assistant city manager is going to do most of the presentation uh, today. 
um, but I will jump in and make a few comments uh, on some of the staffing changes that are proposed. So I'll let her go ahead and get started. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. We'll do a little tag team effort on this. <clears throat> so first, just starting with some of the budget slides here and, and wanting to kind of talk a little bit about the, the F uh, fiscal year 2020 actuals and why there's kind of that jump and just explaining that is really what you'll see in 2021 fiscal year was the first full year of the navigation center so that's what that accounts for a big portion of that also we had um and just as a reminder the city manager's office has all kinds of uh, special revenue funds cdbg paratransit um, as well as some uh general fund you know uh, funds as well, but most, and then all the housing funds. So a lot of this is spending down our paratransit fund balance, which is a good thing for us to be doing. And then the NAV center. And then we had some fund balance from CDBG that we ended up spending down that rolled over into FY 2021 that we ended up spending down in that year. So just explaining a little bit what you see there. But other than that, we're really trying to, especially on the general fund, keep our expenditures essentially constant. Next slide. So I'm, on number one, Kelly's going to, the city manager is going to talk about that on the org chart. So I'm going to skip over that a little bit. But I, um, we did, of course, reduce our general fund supplies and services, including for the NAV Center. We think we can do that um, without impacting services um, provided there, given COVID and some of the decommission, you know, or decompressing that had to occur there. Um, and then we also have something that in, in coordination with public works, but really trying to um, account for some miscellaneous items that kind of really related to asset management um, that we were able to do by taking the administrative clerk position um, and then and which was already vacant and just removing that and then adding in um, a real property manager and this is really to handle um, things like the master license agreement for all the applications coming in for the small cell sites. The city council approved that agreement and, and we have to be ready to manage those efforts. It's also partially funded through the successor agency. So I know a number of council members have asked about some of the parcels that the successor agency has on mission and the desire to move those forward. And we just don't have a lot of staff for some of those smaller parcels. So this position will help us with that. And then through public works, there's just a lot of right away management or um, you know cell tower leases. Just and so we were able to figure out a way through some of public works um, special revenue funds, as well as through the elimination of the administrative clerk position that was vacant and the successor agency funding, add that staff person there. And so you'll see that reflected here. But it is a shared position between, uh, it'll actually be housed in public works, but shared in terms of expenditure um, revenue through the city manager's office and public works. Next slide. I'm going to, this is where I'm going to turn over to Kelly and talk a little bit more about the vision and the assistant city manager position. Great. Thank you, um, Jen. Yeah, so um, with, we had the uh, deputy city manager position that was added to the budget a few years ago. And really that position was added um, as a sort of high level project manager um, to, to help with the 238 property disposition. And then as part of that, we also added um, housing and community services and economic development kind of underneath uh, that deputy city manager position. Um, with the retirement of Maria Hurtado last uh, December, our assistant city manager who served us outstandingly, um, it gave us an opportunity to really look at what sort of organizational structure works the best and, and what we think will meet our needs for the next uh, number of years, um, especially as the sales of the 238 properties are cut, we're sort of nearing nearing the end and conclusion of that. There'll be some, some you know, a few, few things that still need to happen, but you know, sort of the major work effort of getting those those projects underway has kind of, um, I, I would say, sort of tapered off a little bit. Um, still, a lot of work to be done there, but I think we've 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 managed that. So it was an opportunity really to look at the organizational structure, and um, with uh, the retirement of our development services director, uh, really kind of put trying to put under one assistant city manager in Jennifer sort of the public facing development side of the house to allow for more coordination of those. So um, she's now supervising in addition to what's on the screen, housing, community services and economic development, supervising public, public works and utilities and development services. So really kind of 
all of the develop, you know, sort of the key development related departments being under one umbrella. And then um, what we what we really still needed though was some executive capacity really to focus on kind of the internal uh, house. So the goal is this new assistant city manager would oversee more of the internal service departments, finance, HR, potentially IT, um, and really looking towards that. And then also really leading and serving as kind of the executive sponsor for the city's um, equity and inclusion efforts. And so really creating a, a home for those, like sort of an organizational home um, and leadership for those, those DEI efforts. And so that's the, the goal. I would still continue to directly supervise police, fire, or probably library. Um, and then, you know, obviously taking a look at that organizational structure over time, but we just really felt like um, by by elevating the deputy city manager to an assistant city manager, it just gives us a little more executive capacity um, for overseeing some of these functions and shares shares sort of the the burden of that supervision of the departments a little a little more amongst the three of us, the three of us potentially. So, um, and then again, that real property manager position will start to fill in some of those more sort of day-to-day -day property negotiations management things that the, the deputy city manager position had been doing previously. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jen to talk about our accomplishments this year. Great, thank you, Kelly. So, um, you know, uh, as Alex said, we were limited to three. So we, we wanted to really, of course, highlight all the community outreach and um, policy innovation workshops on community safety being one of the key things that just a lot of focus and, and dedication of staff resources, really, honestly, not just in the city manager's office, but across many departments. So um, appreciative of all of the staffs um, and the council's work on that. Um, we also really with a lot of focus on communication over this last year. I um, mean, we actually saw an increase of almost, you know, 30% in our digital audience and digital engagement by 23%. So really a focus on trying to get our community involved through other forms of communication. And then in the housing and economic development and community services divisions, really, you know, some of our proudest moments of being able to get over 80 small business resiliency grants out, allocating close to $2 million in rent relief from CDBG and home grants, um, and then allocating very quickly um, a significant amount of additional CDBG fund, funds from the federal government, those COVID CDBG funds, the CARES Act funds, um, getting those out um, as well, in addition to meeting timeliness on our, our existing CDBG program. So those are just some of the, the many things that we've worked on over the last year. Next slide. And obviously the city manager and I are happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Um, to my colleagues, do we have any hands up? Yeah, I got one. Yeah, um, let, me, let me go back to, uh, so I'm looking at the, uh, at the organizational chart and you know, I was uh, um, just a couple of comments, really. Um, what's the difference between an assistant city manager and the title associate city manager? Is it just language, or is it, there is, is there an actual you know distinction between those two? Yeah, there, there is not, a, we don't have a title of associate city manager. There's, there's, we have deputy city manager and assistant city manager. And, you know, every city has that classification a little differently. Um, for, for us, the assistant city manager position is differentiated from deputy city manager. It's a higher level position in the organization and in the pay structure. And the key difference is the supervision of department heads versus divisions or functions of of, a, of the city so that's really the key differentiation okay um the other the other thing is um regarding um um well before i ask that question um the the police innovation workshops um just curious how that how that is going um and um and you know a progress check-in report on that uh, it's actually on the council's agenda for next Tuesday. So uh, you will be asked to adopt a resolution with um, 
the record, the key, the sort of top priority recommendations um, at, the, at that point, and also um, the funding plan for that. Okay. And, um, and lastly, um, um, let's see how I can frame this question. Um, community services uh, manager, uh, you know, before I know it was um, Mr. Korth, Mr. Korth was great. Um, and he, you know, um, uh, you know, he was involved in a lot of different things. Um, and he was kind of, um, he's kind of like the, the, the go to guy for, for a lot of different things, actually, <laughs> you know, because he had been here for such a long time. And I think he, you know, he just, you know, just, he just had a lot of institutional knowledge. Um, and, and I know that he was engaged in a lot of different community activities. Um, and, and I understand, and, and I'm, I'm mindful of, you know, events that have been going on the last year or so, but the community services um, folks, um, are, you know, do you see their role, you know, once we start to return, you know, we start to, you know, uh, do a lot more activities face to face and just public, do you see them a lot more involved out in the community doing community engagement work, just kind of what's, what's your sort of vision plan for them. Yeah, so um, the you know our current community services manager. I mean, the the core function of that division is really the management of the community development block grant funding and staffing the community services commission, um, and uh, the social service this, the community agency funding process. So that's sort of their primary responsibility. Um, obviously, I think as we look at the recommendations from the the policing. Uh, innovation workshops. Uh, I think there's definitely a, a, a role for those staff to play in that. We took, we, when David Korth retired, we took a number of the parts of his job and sort of spread it to different um, different parts of, of the city organization. Um, obviously, some of the sort of social work case management has now moved into community services. So he would often be like, if there were individuals needing assistance who would come into the city manager's office, he would kind of do some case management work with them. Um, you know, a lot of our, with our unhoused population and that work has also moved into community services. So the homelessness strategic plan work, um, you know, sort of that case management, helping sort of with social service coordination, that, that is also now under community services. The neighborhood partnership and kind of neighborhood engagement, we've actually is now Zach Abadi and, um, and Mary Thomas, the management analyst in our office. And so the as obviously we come out of COVID and can start to have neighborhood and community meetings again, um, the goal is for those two folks to really take the lead on, on that work. So I don't know, Jen, if you want to add anything else on that. Yeah, I, and that's exactly right. I've, we've had conversations, Mary and I, and about starting those up again. And Zach, I know, has already have some plans. And one of the ideas, so we are definitely going to be um, ratcheting that up over the, the next year as we, um, you know, as safely as we can. One of the ideas, too, we have is really trying to target topics that are we're already working on. Like, so for instance, the housing element is going to kick off soon. So maybe there's ways to coordinate some of the housing conversations with the neighborhood so that we're we're trying to consolidate and integrate some of the citywide efforts that we're having into that neighborhood. So we're not just going out asking the neighbor neighborhood, what are your concerns? We can still do some of that, but have it be maybe more topical or thematic with other efforts and initiatives that we're doing. So we're, we're starting to brainstorm. Yeah. And my last comment is, um, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the strengths I think Mr. Korth um, had was um, and, you know, and I know that this is the role that he went to go fill at, at his, you know, at, at his um, next employer, but one of his strengths was he was a, a very good ombudsman, right? You know, it was mm -hmm. sort of, you know, he played that role really well. And, um, and you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, who is our, uh, you know, who fills that role, like ombudsman or ombudswoman? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, who fills that role? You know, uh, today, just, you know, considering some of the big issues that, you know, and I would suspect as we return, you know, whatever it means, whatever this means, when we return to sort of, you know, a post COVID, um, you know, norm, whatever that means, you know, I can just imagine some of the things that are going to be coming up and, you know, and, and do we have sort of an all around generalist to solve problems and, and, and where does that come in? 
And I think that's um, is taken on, I think, shared amongst the city manager's office staff. So we have our two analysts, Mary Thomas and Laurel James, um, also the executive assistant staff, Rosalinda Romero and Colleen Kamai basically do a lot of, um, and Chris Bondock do a lot of work fielding those inquiries and sort of helping manage uh, and try and you know get people to the right places in the city. So I think it's a, sh it's a shared effort. Um, it, it was a lot for one person to sort of take on all of that and be be that person to everyone. And so I think um, having multiple people who can who can play that role and direct folks to the the resources they need within the city is good. But I think for the higher level sort of coordination of problems, I would say Laurel and Mary are probably those key people who would then take the the lead to sort of pull pull multiple departments together if needed. Okay. And a lot Thank of you. the concerns that we hear are housing, homelessness related, and those get we funneled very quickly to the division managers and they're really great at responding and getting back to, to people. So we do, we're able to kind of, the ones that are very specific, we're able to get to the division managers and they can respond quickly as well. Thank you. Council member Andrews. Thank you. I, um, I wanna give kudos to your uh, department and uh, I'm probably, I'm, I'm assuming council member Lemon may ask about this, so I'll be very brief on this question, but um, you mentioned community and engagement and uh, talking about housing and just wanted to know um, if that includes infill development and is that in combination with the planning department in terms of the, in terms of objective standards for that neighborhood and um, density. Yes, so we, in fact, we just met this week on the request for proposals for the housing element consultant, um, and that was interdisciplinary. So that was Christina Morales in the housing division, as well as planning staff that have typically led those efforts myself. Um, and so we are, it's, a, it's going to be a very um, robust effort in terms of community outreach, looking at issues like infill development, potentially consistent with the incentives to housing work plan that the council approved, which was to take a look at the single family zoning take a look at density um, and really trying to find innovative ways to increase housing um, equitably in the city. Uh, and also looking backwards at the history of housing in Hayward and really talking about and educating people about that history. Um, and then one aspect of that is that we're really focusing on is how do we engage communities that haven't typically gotten involved in those efforts. People hear the words housing element and you know it's like we all kind of fall asleep when we hear that, but how do we in, you know, impart to people and get people involved, groups that haven't been involved before. So there's gonna be a lot more focus on the community outreach piece of this. In fact, that's development services department. Uh, that's gonna be their DEI strategic roadmap project is to really have a very robust community outreach for the housing element. Um, so we are absolutely having a lot of conversations about that. And, and of course, we'll be checking in with the council and the planning commission. Okay, and then my last question is, uh, again, relates to community engagement, and uh, would they also be serving as kind of an ambassador for neighborhoods, understanding what's going on with that neighborhood, where they don't have to go to the police department with, with issues, and they can kind of, you know, communicate what's happening, and then kind of trickle down to other divisions to see, the, to solve those problems? Are you talking about the housing element or are you talking about the, just reaching out just to the community, the like neighborhood? Just, just the neighborhood, um, just kind of being a, an ambassador. I know when, uh, I know council member mentioned um, David Korth, he, he, he was kind of an ambassador for me to communicate what was going on in my neighborhood. Um, and then he would, uh, he actually gave the idea for me to work on a neighborhood improvement grant and it was in relation to graffiti. So like, kind of shepherding those. Yes. I think that's really where Mary Thomas is. I mean, that was, that's something that's really her passion and she loves that community organizing work. So I think, um, as, you know, as we come out of COVID, that'll be one of, and as we wind, wind down at least the engagement piece of the policy innovation workshop and move into implementation, that should free up some of her and Laurel's capacity, but particularly Mary to do that community outreach and neighborhood work. So okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Thank you. I uh, just wanted to sort of add my voice to the community engagement conversation, and I appreciate the, the I'm really excited about the housing element being sort of the next thing that we do 
um, along the lines of the census. I'm thinking it's the same populations, um, really engaging folks. And so, you know, hopefully the libraries can be helpful there as they were with the um, census. And, you know, to the point of, of David Korth, yeah, he was also sort of my one of my mentors <laughs> in getting into the city. And the one thing that he was able to do that I don't think we've been able to replicate, and I'm happy to sort of brainstorm about how to do this, is because he was in all of these meetings, you know, he was integral to the development of the South Hayward Neighborhood Collaborative. He was part of um, the North Hayward Collaborative, um, getting these networks together. He also had the Rolodex in his head of, oh, so-and-so works on this thing. And as we look at implementation of the homelessness strategic plan, as we think about how do we um, have the reach the communication goals around the lean innovation work, et cetera, what does it look like to have somebody, you know, I'm not going to assume Mary Thomas can sit in a two-hour meeting once a month um, or once a quarter, and that's the best use of her time. And yet having these knowledge uh, developments that happen because people are in meetings together. Um, I'm not sure how to grow that organically in the in the city, but um, I'd love to sort of think more about that because I think the the value of being able to tap those resources is also valuable to our employees um, as well as to sort of the continuum of care of our city. Thanks, Mayor. Yes, so I'm back. Thank and thank you so much for. Um, I'm sure I you have been doing a good job. I've been back for a little bit since I think Council Member Salinas was talking, um, and so if this had been covered, um, uh, you know, pardon me, but um, I, what the one real question I had about the information in the budget book was about the inclusionary housing fund, which is shown to be around 12 million. Now, we sort of were under the impression that we just spent all we had with about 4.9 million to, you know, to apply to some um, affordable housing projects as it should be used. So just wondered what the difference there was and, and what that 12 million actually represents. Yeah, sure. I mean, when we, the, the 12 million, so when there were actions taken, I think in October of 2018, where the council awarded dollars to certain projects, um, the, those projects then take that award and go leverage that for other financing sources. And so it becomes, it's essentially the money's encumbered. Yeah. So we've committed it. We just haven't spent it yet because we also don't want to spend the money until we know they're going to perform. So we're in this period of time where we've awarded it. It's encumbered. We're not going to spend it on anything else. But we don't want to let go of it until we know that they have all their financing together and then are ready to move into construction. So that's why you see that. So we, we don't count that money as kind of available. I kind of thought that was the case, mm -hmm. but uh, when I thought about it, but I was just surprised to see that number when it looked like we just, uh, you know, right. committed everything we had. So now we probably have committed just about everything we have, yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And then on the dis very interesting discussion that was happening, um, you know, that just was occurring about how we deal with our various neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to see that as an area we really pay some attention to um, and maybe reinvent. And I think that you do have to reinvent it every few years because um, we just had a, um, you know, a long two actually meetings about uh, one house, the development of one house <laughs> in the um, old Highlands. Um, and a lot of reference was made to their neighborhood plan, which was from back in the 90s. I mean, I know that all of the neighborhoods in the 80s, I think it goes back as far as the it maybe late 80s and into the 90s worked on, you know, we have a whole bunch of these plans. They've been superseded and we're, and we're probably, you know, um, encompassed into the general plan update. But, um, you know, that was a good way of, of um, getting people involved in various neighborhoods and connecting with neighborhood leaders. Um, I have long thought, we used to have really um, some really, volunteer or voluntary, but, you know, neighborhood organizations. Fairway Park still seems to be operating pretty well. Obviously, Old Highlands is active because we saw some of those. And I think there may be a few more. I think maybe Southgate to some extent still. But, you know, a lot of those have not have not survived. And um, yet what we do have 
every new housing um, development that we have, that I have seen built in my tenure, I think going back to starting in the planning commission in the mid nineties, um, almost every anyway, uh, development we've approved has as now being approved with a mandatory homeowners association. And I have long wondered how, um, how we're connecting with them. I know we just had a recent meeting with one of those in the cannery area. That's an area where I really think we ought to look at and pay attention because what they, you know, they are responsible for a lot of things and, you know, they may need some help from us in getting this, you know, and getting those things accomplished or, um, you know, just connecting with us. And I think that's where we really need to know who the leaders are in those many, many uh, mandatory homeowners associations that we have seen develop over the last couple of decades and um and and start getting more connected and yeah to the answer of how do we do this without sending people to long meetings um, i don't know but i would say that we have found out in the past year that we have a lot of quicker you know we have a lot of ways of connecting with people that you know are are maybe not involving in-person big meetings. And so um, then that's another thing that maybe, uh, that I think we need to look at, but we have tools now that maybe we do start reinventing some of that stuff, but with the same goal of connecting with the people who live in our city and, um, and their needs and what we can do to um, provide for those needs if that's something that you know, we're charged with doing. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'll go back to Mayor Pro Tab Wahab because I see her hand is up. <laughs> um, so, so to our city manager and assistant city manager, I thank you for your presentation. I know um, I've had an opportunity to talk to our city manager, and I kind of just want to highlight some things. Um, you know, under under a lot of focus, I know I talked about the downtown business improvement fund, and I definitely want to ensure that we figure something out to spend and focus a little bit more on South Hayward as well. Uh, that is definitely a priority of mine. Um, I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times now, and I, and I kind of do want to see um, either something similar or us actually invest um, in an equitable way uh, towards the, down, uh, the South Hayward, um, part of Hayward. Um, that's number one. Um, I do want to highlight that on page 130 of the uh, budget book, it went from fiscal year 2020 actual to fiscal year 2022 proposed uh, roughly about a $5 million increase. And uh, that is concerning. And I understand, um, you know, a slight changes in the positions that are, are supposedly to take place. Um, but it doesn't necessarily equate to that. And supplies and services went up by over 1.2 million. Um, you know, grants went up by about 2 million. Um, maintenance and utilities doubled and, and things like that. So I would hope that we pay closer attention to um, some of that. I think uh, Assistant City Manager Ott explained that, that that is the, the navigation center costs. Yeah. So those are all captured in there. So those are not, I mean, those are not city manager supplies. Those are the service contract with BACS for the navigation center. It's also a significant increase in the paratransit program but to about a million dollars. So those are not just random city manager office expenses. Those are actually community services that are being provided. Yeah, and, and this brings me to my point of with these increases, and I, I know I've said it in the past, um, when we take on a program uh, over and over again, I, I have said this, it has to be self-sustaining in the sense of, you know, grants that are coming in, um, you know, obviously the nonprofits being able to, you know, we can partner, but I definitely want them to have the, the, the focus of, you know, becoming financially stable and, and sustaining. Um, that is my number one concern about uh, specifically all of this. And, and I think that we, we just need to kind of reiterate it. I know we've been working with BACS the most and pretty well, in fact, right, around the housing aspects of it. Um, I know we expanded a couple of not only just the housing navigation, but then the annex project and, and much more to house homeless individuals in um, hotels and so forth. I, I just want to caution us not to constantly um, you know, figure out how we can help, uh, but more partner with them too. We've actually leveraged $7.7 .7 million of outside funding for the navigation center. So the part that the general fund is paying for is only um, about a million and a half to 2 million. So I yeah. think 
and, and I know that, that that has been something that we've done, especially during the um, shelter in place, and there are more funding uh, around uh, housing and so forth compared to years past. But just as we move forward and CARES funding and so forth, I just want to make that a highlight of any partnership that we have that we do not necessarily, um, we can do a one-time funding, but make sure that those programs are self-sustaining. Part two, uh, um, I do want to highlight that and it wasn't listed in um, the budget section. Um, and I think I already talked to you about this as well. Um, I do believe that you guys have gone above and beyond in regards to providing um, support to the community, um, not only from kind of just feeding the community, housing the community, uh, some of the economic relief, the rent uh, relief. Um, there's so much involved uh, and assistant city manager, um, Ott, I know I've shared this with you many, many times in the past. Um, I was hoping to see uh, kind of like a, a listed out, um, you know, bullet points of what you guys have done because you guys have, like I said, gone above and beyond. Um, and the one power PowerPoint slide you guys had uh, doesn't do you guys justice. Um, so I definitely just want to highlight that as much as possible to um, to the public too, just the COVID efforts and and even prior to that, you guys have done a lot around housing, and I, I really appreciate that. So thank you to you and your department. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Clausen, did you have um, you have your hand up? I, I did. I just wanted to to mention uh, to to Council Member Wahab's point. Um, we are bringing an item to uh, Council Budget and Finance Committee this week, uh, an update on uh, both COVID spending and COVID funding um, to, to really highlight those efforts and, and, and highlight what the city's done. We're also planning to put together uh, a, a document, uh, a budget and brief, if you will, um, that will both highlight the services that have been offered, um, plans moving forward, that sort of thing. Um, to, to really highlight the, the efforts that the city's made, the partnerships that we've forged, and um, you know the way things will look as we move forward. So just wanted to wanted to to preview that for everybody um, and make sure that uh, people keep their eye out for it. Thank you. Okay, and I know I'm going to add to into uh, your comments, Councilmember or Mayor Pro Tem Wahab, that um, I know the city manager and I are both working really hard with our with the fellow our fellow city managers and mayors throughout the county uh, to um, persuade the county board of supervisors to um, you know really look seriously and the state actually to really look seriously at how funding um, there is funding coming from the state and I truly believe that our navigation centers will be sustainable with. Um, grant funding that we should be able to obtain considering all the talk about money coming from both the federal and the state governments, um, some of it perhaps through the county, um, but we're really working hard to see that, um, especially things like this navigation center, which we're not the only city, in fact, we modeled ours after Berkeley and then Fremont came along after us and other cities are doing different things to help their homeless population um, that, uh, you know, that we get the funding we need from um, the, you know, from somewhere to keep those keep um, the the programs going. The programs that have often involved some capital investment that would you know would be wasted if we weren't able to keep them going. So we're working hard on that. And anything any of you can do. And any relations you have with um, county supervisors or um, you know discussions you have with them to reinforce that, it would be appreciated. So with that and. We are just we are really just a few minutes over schedule right now, and um, but we're going to move. I see Mr. Um, uh, Kostrzak. Hopefully, I got that name pronounced right after you've been yeah. here for how many years now um, <laughs> uh, is with us from Information Technology. So take it away. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's uh, I appreciate the opportunity to get to present to you. Uh, we'll kick off with the IT budget comparison. As you can see, pretty flat. Uh, the team has done a great job of continually uh, shifting resources to meet the, uh, the, the demand of the organization. Uh, the slight increase this year, much of it can be attributed to just the uh, continued uh, cost of subscription services. Like your cable bill, a lot of our subscriptions go up by increments over time. Unfortunately, we can't cancel and renew and get a discount. Uh, like you can with some of the cable ones, but uh, we work hard at our negotiations and 
to keep the prices in line with what is competitive in the environment. Um, next slide. Uh, for uh, changes for uh, FY22, not, uh, not a, a significant amount of changes. We're going to be upgrading Munis, which is our uh, SaaS application to the uh, latest version that adds cost in the operation side of things. Again, a lot of our switch from uh, on-prem to cloud changes our spending from being a capital improvement design to an operational design because of the subscription nature of the, of the procurement and payment. Uh, we're going to be adding a deputy director of IT position and deleting the network system specialist position. Uh, this is also reflective of the change of the IT environment in which we're becoming much more of a service management organization than a group of just pure technologists. A lot of the work we're doing is in partnership with uh, the, the vendor community that provides the, the a lot of solutions that we use. Um, and then the third is provide tools and technology to aid in remote workforce transition. This should not come as a surprise. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the past year. We're going to continue to do so uh, as we start to look at what does the future of the workplace look like for Hayward, uh, as we don't anticipate going back to the way things were. Uh, but there's going to need to be some sort of balance between the two environments of back in the office, but also remote uh, assistance for our residents and remote work for our employees and staff. Next slide. Uh, the organization chart just reflects the change of positions. Uh, no other, no other add or delete here otherwise. Uh, so I think we can just skip past this next slide and go to our accomplishments. Uh, yeah. Pretty excited about the work that the IT department has done in support of the COVID uh, pandemic and the challenges it brought with us. Uh, Miriam touched uh, on the uh, public meetings shifting to Zoom and the, the great work that her team did. You know, it, it, it's something in which I think we're all proud of how smoothly that transition has happened and look forward to uh, what that transition will look like in the upcoming year. Uh, the other is just the amount of uh, deployment of laptops and desktop or change from desktops to laptops uh, continued throughout much of the year as we've done uh, significant numbers in the hundreds of replacements on, the, on that level. The IT infrastructure improvements, uh, we did a massive fiber backbone replacement. We had fiber running uh, down uh, Winton and some areas where it split off where it was uh, fiber from the 90s, and it was actually of a design that no longer exists. Uh, it was an oval design and fiber is now round. And we've replaced all of that. And this is the city operations fiber. So this is specific to what we're doing. This is not fiber that's allocated for anything other than making sure we can communicate amongst all the, the multitude of locations. And then security enhancements uh, for the remote uh, devices during this time frame. Uh, we had to do a lot of changes on the back end that were uh, not easy to see if you're an end user, but uh, very important on our side to protect our environment against the multitude of uh, bad actors that are out there, as you see in the news almost every day now, uh, certainly reflected in the gas, uh, the gas craziness that's going on on the East Coast. And then the third area that, that I'd like to highlight real quickly is just the, the team is continuing to challenge themselves to stay current and, uh, and provide excellent service. All of the team uh, received training and is getting certification in ITIL, which is information technology infrastructure library. Not that I expect anyone to remember that, uh, but it's, it, it, it is a formalized um, uh, guide to providing IT services that is well known in the industry and is something that we were able to bring to Hayward. Uh, we have over 600 C staff that have been trained on just trying to protect against email phishing and other security concerns. And then the MESAC Excellence Award, uh, you saw the uh, email earlier in the year, but just wanna highlight that was a, an, an exciting accomplishment for us. And so with that, I'd like to, the, oh, I apologize, there's one other piece I wanted to talk to, it's not in the highlights, but I also wanna bring up the, uh, there's been 
request for the public safety uh, transparency report. And I just wanted to give a quick update on that. The plan is to bring that forward as an informational report when the drone item for the police department is brought forth so that we can have those in conjunction so that we can, we can focus on drones as their own entity and then uh, have a presentation regarding the transparency report and what's been done on the public safety in coordination with public safety uh, teams the uh, say the uh, the legal team and IT, uh, and so that that'll, that'll be coming. Uh, I don't believe that's calendared yet, but I just want to give a sense of that. And then once that report is presented, the IT team will come back uh, to the closed session to give a security update of what we do from a security perspective, and go over much of the uh, sensitive topics. And thereafter, we'll. Uh, have a discussion in the uh, infrastructure committee team uh, committee meeting so that we can define the um, agenda going forward. Now I am ready for any uh, questions or discussion. Great, thank you. And um, let's see, we will. Oh, I'm going to put my hand down. We will um, go to Council Member Wahab first. Thank you. Uh, can you go on the last slide that you had? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, not that one, but the one. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Oh, no worries. Um, well, one, I, I do want to highlight um, Again, the uh, the accomplishments that you guys have done on fiscal year 2021. Um, I think that you know, obviously, I want every department to kind of summarize their accomplishments because I, I do think that the city kind of stepped up uh, significantly um, in the face of COVID. Um, that's number one, uh, and I think that I, th I feel that you guys have done more than this. So um, you know, the slide also doesn't do you guys justice. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the efforts of the, the city trying to be more inclusive um, with technology. And I also know that we do have a digital divide in our city and, and hopefully we can kind of address that as we move forward. I also know that uh, working with you behind the scenes, um, I, uh, we've worked a lot on the fiber optics and trying to provide um, more and more people uh, affordable um, internet. So I, I know that that's coming down the pike and I'm, I'm very excited for that. Um, I do want to highlight the ITIL um, uh, training and, and certification um, as a person who is also trained in ITIL and certified um, in ITIL. I think it's incredibly important. It just gets everybody on the same page. Um, there's different levels to it. So definitely, obviously, that, that foundational course and then hopefully moving up. Um, I, and I don't think it's just... Um, your department, I think uh, a handful of other folks in other departments that you guys interact with that uh, utilize technology um, should be also part of this training effort. Uh, Public Works, for example, would be a, a great one. Anything that kind of submits a ticket or uh, uh, uses technology or wants to move in that direction um, should consider this, this training. Um, it's incredibly vital as we are moving to become, um, you know, more engaged online and having uh, processes and permits and, and procedures kind of all uh, via online. So I do just want to highlight that. I, I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. Um, and I just want to commend you on a job well done uh, this past year. I know it's uh, been hard and everyone has technical difficulties and um, you know even the security aspects and the efforts to get outside uh, support and things like that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, next is Council Member Andrews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also want to give kudos to uh, the IT department for um, bringing everything online and um, being able to be adaptable when they're when the pandemic hit. And um, especially again with security, uh, I know you mentioned um, what was happening on the East Coast, but there's a lot of attacks on water infrastructure and that is 
a huge focus for a lot of cities is uh, protecting security for water infrastructure. So um, just wanted to say, uh, again, kudos for protecting us because sometimes the bad actors take advantage of chaos in order to do more nefarious activities. Um, and then uh, I also want to give kudos to the IT department and just, um, you know, dealing with a new member on council and, you know, making sure that, you know, it was set up uh, really fast and I really appreciate that. And then also being just very um, customer service oriented, not just did you turn your computer on and off kind of attitude. I know you are familiar with that uh, reaction from, from an IT department. So uh, I just want to say thank you for always being customer um, service friendly. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I, I do want to be transparent. I do have a t-shirt that says, have you tried turning it on and off again? So mm -hmm. I, I do be clear. Right? We, we do embrace that at times. <laughs> I know you watch the crowd. I'm pretty sure you've probably seen it. So. Oh, yeah. And it does work, too. It does work sometimes. Not mm -hmm. always, but sometimes. Um, so uh, Council Member Marquez is next. Hi, Adam. Good morning. I just wanted to thank you and your entire team. I know you've done a lot this year with supporting the city clerk, the entire uh, city council with transitioning to everything online. I've had my fair share of hiccups with technology and your staff is always available and walks me through all the prompts. So I just want to thank everyone for their efforts, their leadership, and um, you're always uh, ahead of the curve in terms of what we should be on looking out for in terms of keeping our systems secure. So thank you for the good work. Just wanted to give my appreciation. Thank you. Right. And I don't see any other hands. I'll just say that, you know, I, I maybe it's because you're here. I have not seen one message today pop up saying my internet is unstable. Um, and, <laughs> but that is happening. But no, I, I want to add my um, great appreciation to you and your staff. Um, particularly those who are assigned to work with me, which must be a challenge for them. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and they are always patient and cheerful. And um, I really do appreciate them. I wish I could have them on full time for personal stuff too, but I, but I wouldn't do that obviously. But you know, it's, uh, it's been a challenge for all of us, but I think especially for you know, people maybe in my age group, the some of whom I know are very on top of technology, but not all of us. We haven't been living it, with it all of our lives. And we certainly have advanced in our skills in the last year. Your, your staff has just done a great job. And I, I just, I'm, I was looking for this and I pulled it up. It's your it's your postcard with the ticket um, that and, and the various ways that you're, you know, I mean, I just really appreciated getting this. Now, I haven't taken advantage of it too much yet, but I intend to, but um, it's, it just, it just shows how you are really out there trying every way, way you can, including old fashioned paper to, um, to help all of us with our, our challenges with this technology, which has been just so invaluable to us this past year. And which is going to continue to play a larger role, as we know, in um, in future endeavors. And I just wanted to call out, I do love your key values. Be changed, be open, build community, and own it. Those are, you know, <laughs> just a few words to say a lot. So anyway, thank you to you and your, your team. And I don't see any other hands raised now. So, and that brings us to, we are, this is, this council is, I have to say, kudos to all of you. We are right on time. In all of my years of doing this, I don't think that we have ever been in this position at the lunch break before where we are exactly on time. And, you know, I just commend all of you for being prepared, being efficient with your questions. And I think um, that this is now the time for our lunch break, correct, Ms. Madam City Manager? And we're going to go ahead with that. So yeah. with that, we are going to recess now until one o'clock. And bon appetit, everyone.
of these. Hello, everyone. Hey, Barbara. I think we're all back. I didn't see a Lisa though. No, okay. Got a minute. Everyone have a good lunch. So, uh, so chief, uh, so uh, uh, no tie today, huh? No, the tie's out, no tie. <laughs> oh, I was going off of Alex <laughs> and Adam and Justin. I thought, you know, I don't want to upstage anybody. Now, if, if it goes okay, I'm going to go play golf this afternoon, though. We're still, we're still waiting for uh, Elisa and Francisco, right? I'll wait to start. Here and Elisa is the one, only one. I just texted Elisa saying, you know, we're about to start, so. Okay. I'll wait to start recording until then. Chief Contreras, everyone else has hair has gotten longer during this pandemic, and it looks like yours has gotten shorter. It, the hair? <laughs> Although we are now getting it cut more. I mean, mine was the longest it had been since I was like, you know, in college, I think. Yeah, I figure it, there's not much there. I might as well cut it short. Right, and who knows when we'll go into a period again where we can't go get our hair cut, so. That's my salary saving, or my cost savings in my house. I do it in my shed. <laughs> and there, I think that she has yes there she is and we're all back and so i and it's one o'clock so well, are you gonna run that thing again uh miriam or um no i don't i don't think so right miriam no just... no I, I don't think so mayor i think we're just gonna we're just gonna reconvene and we're gonna go right into fire okay Okay, so here we are back. Uh, this we have come back from our lunch break, and we are continuing with our um, all day Saturday work session on um, the city budget, uh, talking with each of our department um, heads. And the next one up is our fire department, headed by our fire chief, Garrett Contreras. Chief Contreras, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and, and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this year's Fire Department budget. Uh, next slide, please. I am shooting for a record uh, on pace here, so we're going to power through and keep you guys on schedule. Slight decrease in our proposed budget for 2022, generally driven off of the savings from uh, supplies and services reduction as well as uh, uh, concessions by Local 1909 on their uh, their pay raise from last year. Next slide, please. Uh, as you see here, the 5% reduction in general fund uh, supplies and services was met. Uh, we changed a process in our linen service at the very beginning of COVID. Uh, we could not keep pace with uh, deliveries and we found a need for our personnel to be able to wash their, their uniforms, their t-shirts and what have you. Um, during the shift and we did not have washers and dryers installed at the, at the fire station so that has been taken care of by maintenance services over the course of the last year and we reduced our operating budget by $30,000 eliminating the contracts for services for those uh, services previously. EMS supplies increase of $15,000. Um, we are experiencing an exorbitant increase in the cost of these materials particularly on the nar narcotics front. Uh, and so we uh, begrudgingly had to ask for a $15,000 increase this year, as well as an increase um, with a new program of vehicle safety devices. Uh, this is a five-year contract for $75,000 that will alert people. Uh, most of the vehicles being manufactured today are very quiet, closed cabs that do not hear approaching emergency vehicles. And this system will both notify the vehicles of an oncoming emergency vehicle, but also notify our personnel in the cab that there is a vehicle that is not yielding uh, in their vicinity. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we have overall breakdown, no changes to uh, staffing across the department being proposed, uh, status quo on our organizational chart. Next slide, please. 2020 highlights and accomplishments. Uh, we, we had a, a very busy year, had a lot going on. I tried to focus our improvements off of things I've heard from previous budget sessions with council uh, and things that were directly related to cost savings. Um, particularly the department retained a psychologist in the last year, um, really working closely with our folks. It's been a great success uh, to have her on staff. Um, she has history as a first responder herself and has provided a lot of uh, immediate um, advice and direction and consult privately uh, to our personnel. Um, secured three new apparatus at no cost to the city. In previous uh, budgets, we had apparatus purchases deferred due to cost savings uh, measures and we secured the, the needed apparatus, both through the Fairview Fire Protection contract, as well as a private developer purchasing a new water tender. Uh, and that was supported by uh, Alex and the water department helping us through uh, that purchase. Installed mid vaults, securing all of our controlled substances and all the apparatus uh, with no increase to the budget. Uh, the vending machines, poor choice of words when I put the vending machine thing in there. They're, they look like a vending machine. That's what we now store all of our medical equipment in. Uh, so from an asset management and tracking, we've reduced waste um, significantly and negotiated with the county to allow us to no longer be required to have a like amount of medical equipment in each fire station. Um, we're able to centrally locate them. So we have one machine at station one uh, on the north end, one on the south end at station seven, uh, and we have uh, considerable savings coming from um, having being allowed to keep less inventory on site when it on on site when it comes to expired medications and whatnot. That completes uh, that, and we can move to questions and discussion. And if you see me cringe, it's because Councilman Salinas moves and I think he's gonna hit his head on that brick over his head. Like, yeah. You're muted, Mayor. All right, I'll have to say he already put his head through the wall. See the hole, you know, it's, <laughs> it's around the size of it. No, <laughs> joking, just joking. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Council Member Zermeno. Uh, Chief, thank you very much for the support, uh, for the report. Thank you for the job well done by all of your members. Uh, my only question is, are there enough Measure C funds to complete our regional training center and our fire station? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. Uh, from a project status standpoint, we believe we're on time and on budget. Uh, and with, it, I think some may depend, Dustin can clarify or Kelly uh, on the stimulus funds filling out the, the last balance in the fund balance um, was my last understanding. Yeah, so there, you know, I'll put it this way. If, if the project finishes all within this fiscal year, there will be a small funding gap. We're, we're proposing to use a small portion of the stimulus funds to close that gap. If it spills into um, fiscal year 2023 and the project uh, doesn't quite close out, and we have some expenses that, that go into the next year, we will have no gap. The, the revenues will have caught up um, and we won't lose, we won't use more fund balance than, than exists in the fund. Um, and so there, there's no need for a loan at this point or any financing. Obviously if that changes, we'll bring it back to council, but knock on wood, um, we, don't, we don't foresee that happening. Uh, we've got better than expected uh, revenues in measure C um, and you know the project is coming in uh, on time and on budget thus far, so. So we expect finish in 2022, right? Yeah, August, August 24th of 22. Okay, Chief, thank you very much. And please be safe. Give that message to all your, all your folks. Will do, thank you, sir. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Council Member Marquez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was gonna say good morning, but good afternoon, Chief. I just wanted to um, give you my sincere appreciation to you, your entire department. Um, you've really been innovative and have led, led efforts in responding to COVID and just truly meeting the needs of our community members. So I just want to thank you. I know it's been a very, very tough 13 months. I know that your department is also dealing with fires throughout the state last year and are gearing up to be more proactive and hopefully minimize the impacts of that in this upcoming year. 
but just wanted to acknowledge everyone. I know it's been <clears throat> a year of sacrifice and I'm sure a lot of time away from family. So just thank you for all you do. Um, I, you answered my questions already in regard to the training center. Does it sound like at this point, if there's any hiccups, just wanted to see if there's been any further discussions with BART or any other um, community partners in terms of um, trying to strengthen the, those partnerships and possibly secure some more funding. No real hiccups. Um, looking forward to PG&E having a new um, community relations representative to see if we can get some support on some of the underground work um, and expediting a couple of things, working with public works. Um, but no, I, everything's moving along really well there. We've got a great team. We're going through a really exciting process called a partnering process on the project where the architect uh, the contractor and ourselves are and public works are on calls and work through any issues. Um, we think it was a small price to pay, paying $75,000 on the total of the project to have that partnering process in place. So we work through issues uh, before they become issues. And we've got really great working relationships across the entirety of the project. We're really proud of it. Okay, great. And then can you just give us a sense of within your organization, um, a succession plan. I don't know. I know in the past, like police has been able to tell us like a percentage of how much of their workforce is close to retirement. Do you have a sense of what those numbers look like in your department? Uh, generally, we're very young um, across the board. So yeah, we are, we track those numbers annually. Um, right now, uh, it's kind of the nature of uh, the cyclical nature of pay raises and how they are. Um, sometimes when people have sacrificed pay raises, they end up staying on a little bit until they're that's recovered. So there's a little bit of that going on. Um, and uh, we, we don't anticipate a high amount of turnover. We do have, unfortunately, um, more workers comp cases than I've seen um, throughout my career, uh, all at the same time, uh, a few of them being occupational cancer at the same time. Uh, and we, some of the things I touched on with the washers and dryers, a lot of other things that I won't bore you with the details on, clean cab technology that we're installing on the apparatus, uh, things to protect our folks from carcinogens are by large um, the highest priority when we have that high propensity of cancer cases going on amongst our personnel. Um, we've got the best firefighters in the world and we have to continue to protect them. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for that information. And please, please let us know if there's any um, further way we can support your department. I know it's been highly impacted with those cases. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, Council Member Wahab. Thank you. Uh, Chief, um, listen to what I'm gonna say. So um, I am disappointed that, and I know this is gonna be a red flag for you, that word, that you guys do not actually uh, have everything that you guys have successfully accomplished this past year. Um, I, I really want you guys to take this time to, and hopefully when we adopt this budget, that you guys have an entire section devoted to all the work that you guys have done that went above and beyond um, what any of us can imagine. Um, you guys really need to toot your own horn a little bit because uh, you guys have set up the, um, vaccination center with the county, not just within our city, but then also the first testing site uh, that was free to the public. Um, that is incredibly impactful. Um, I also just want to highlight uh, the fact that you guys, out of every budget that I've seen, um, you guys are one of the few that, and I'm comparing fiscal year 2020 actual to fiscal year 2022 proposed. I'm skipping kind of fiscal year 2021, because we know it was odd. Um, and, um, you know, your total expenditures slightly go down a little bit. And, uh, you know, that is incredibly impressive. Uh, I have not seen this in any other department, um, even from your overtime to you name it, uh, incredibly impressive that you keep such a close eye to the numbers. Um, I know that I've said this in the past. And, a lot of the members that you guys have, and, and like I said, they, they don't just do the typical uh, firefighter you know, uh, work, but because they are paramedics and because they do do a lot of the health related calls and, and so much more. And I know that uh, we have big plans for you guys in fiscal year 2022, and I'm very excited to see how that shapes out. And 
you know, the, from the mobile clinic to um, you name it, uh, I, I'm incredibly grateful for the work that you guys do. Um, without a doubt, I can genuinely say that you guys are definitely heroes in our city. And I think the public feels the same way. We have, at least I have gotten a lot of emails, texts, um, social media messages and so forth that have really uh, praised the work that you guys have done as well as stated uh, that the vaccination site as well as the testing uh, clinic has been run efficiently and they're in and out within 30 minutes, um, which is incredibly um, uh, useful to the community. I do wanna say that I do want to award uh, the members of the 2% raise that they gave back to the city in 2020 and give a one-time payment that would equal to the difference in wages that were lost by the 2% uh, concession. I think that is a priority for me. Uh, you guys were the first to make the concessions within the city and, and that, that is genuinely uh, a priority that I think that we should honor and, and you know the CARES funding coming through. Um, I do also wanna highlight the fact that uh, your leadership has been recognized within the county as well. Um, and there have been people that um, other elected officials throughout the county that have actually referenced you directly. So chief, I wanna thank you for your service and specifically thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, but it does come with a really amazing team and having a great boss and elected leaders that allow us to be creative and innovative um, and, and make the city look good. So we are your tool um, and we're proud to be able to execute on your desires and what we think are, are your expectations for the community. Thank you. Humble too, huh? <laughs> Very yes. humble, man. That is, that is true. And, and you know, I, I do think we all are aware of the many uh, accomplishments, <laughs> but yeah, you should, you might, well, it's just part of your makeup that you're not tooting your own horn more, but we'll try to do it for you. Um, Council Member Salinas. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief. Um, great presentation. And, you know, I, um, you know, every time around these times, you know, I've always, um, you know, I've always mentioned that, um, you know, since I've been on the council, uh, when when times get tough, um, you know your department always steps up. Um, whether it's you know um, budget, whether it's uh, pandemics now, um, whether it's um, you know uh, whatever the issue is, um, the men and women of the Hayward Fire Department have, have just you know uh, have stood up, um, and um, and they've done it with such humility. They've done it with such. Um, incredible professionalism. I, I mean, it's, it, uh, um, you know, when I first got on the council, we were in some incredible economic times and you guys, um, you know, it was, it was quite something really, uh, to, um, uh, to see 1909 and your team just, you know, um, really lead the way and, 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 and just, you know, not just in fiscal matters, um, but just in, in, uh, institutional cultural, um, presence. Um, and anyways, it, it um, just, uh, and, and now today, the work that you guys are doing, um, you know, uh, really leading, you know, the county um, and leading the region, really, and in, in, in a lot of the work that, um, that you guys have done. You know, it, uh, I, I was talking to some high school students the other day, and I go, you know, um, you know, what they, they asked me, what did I like about being a councilman? And I said, well, I go, sometimes, in some cases, you know, when you have a good team, you know, uh, the council, the team does the work, but the council takes the credit, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, uh, and on this one, I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to take all the credit, brother, I'm taking all the credit, <laughs> no, but, uh, but no, you guys have really uh, uh, just, uh, can't say enough, so please tell your team, tell the men and women of the fire department, thank you very much. Um, the, the only question I have, I just got to, I, I just wanted to ask, um, and I know this is something that we started during the pandemic, um, but it's the, um, it's the truck, um, that, uh, I, I forget the exact name of it, um, but it's the truck that goes, um, that drives, um, through neighborhoods, um, and it is able to do, um, smaller responses. Um, I don't know the size of the truck. I, I, I think it's, a uh, three quarter ton or something. <laughs> I think it's a smaller truck, but, um, but yeah, I just wanted to get a sense of that program. How's it working? Um, and, uh, or does it still exist? Just wanted to get your feedback on that. Yeah, it's, uh, 
been a remarkable addition to the operation um, in the area of 3,000 911 calls last year. Um, there, it, we refer to it as a squad. Uh, it's a two-person squad that are incredibly effective, uh, not just on uh, the fire ground or on um, routine calls, but some of the unique things that we were dealing with during COVID, some of the homeless encampment fires along the railroad tracks, they're in a small, uh, what we could refer to as a type six fire engine. Um, it's intended originally for wildland fires and that's what they're operating out of. But it, that rig wasn't intended to run 3000 calls a day in the city. It was intended, it was built for wildland response. Um, so it, it's taken its toll on that vehicle, uh, but at the same point, it's been incredibly effective and something I don't know how we did without prior, to be honest with you. So. Well, um, uh, you know, I know um, as we move forward through this budget process, you know, one of the uh, one of the commitments that I have certainly made is making sure that uh, you guys have what you guys need to, um, you know, I know we're moving into this next phase of the pandemic and um, all of your expertise are going to be, uh, are going to need or will need to be uh, invested in to expand. And so I just wanted to make sure that uh, we're able to do that. Uh, and uh, so you guys can continue doing the work you're doing. So thank you. And uh, please uh, thank all of the men and women of the fire department. Thank you, sir. Will do. Thank you for the kind words and uh, I will pass it on. And I know President Gawley is probably listening as well. So thank you. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, Council member Andrews. Um, I um, wanted to say thank you to uh, the fire department. I, all the council members said everything that I would want to say. Um, but I just also wanted to thank the the people who are behind the scenes for the fire department. My dad was in procurement. He always talked about working for the fire department. And I'm like, you work for procurement, so <laughs> you're not on the scene, but you can still be proud. But he, he was very proud to be in procurement at the fire department. So uh, I just want to give kudos to the, to the staff there because they, um, you know, order a lot of things, do a lot of things in order for you all to do your job as well. So I just wanted to give them a, you know, a shout out um, and uh, just thank you again for your emergency response. And hopefully we can uh, figure out how to um, get back those concessions that you all made at the beginning of the, the pandemic that were desperately needed. So thank you so much. Thank you, council member. Uh, definitely uh, those folks are what make the red lights go, um, you know, from finance to HR to tech services, uh, the maintenance guys constantly, the fleet. Uh, management crew that keeps the rigs on the road. Um, it, it takes a village, as you know, and we've got amazing folks across the city organization that make it all happen. So pretty cool, pretty fortunate time to be working for the city of Hayward. Well, with that, we're we're fortunate to have you working for us at this time. And um, you know, I can't. I just echo all the comments from the other council members that you know um, during this pandemic, we have really seen your department go above and beyond, way beyond, in fact. Um, and it makes me really proud. And yes, mayors get, you know, mayors get credit too sometimes. And I, I'll, I, I take it when I'm with my fellow ma mayors, but I always mention that, like you just did, that it really is the team. It really is the people who work with you that all make it happen. And um, my, my one question is that, um, Going back to, you mentioned it in your introduction about the um, vehicle safety device um, device matter and it, um, you know, and the, there's a cost there and it's reflected, but at the end of, um, in the, where you talk about this in the budget, it says it will result in cost savings over time. And I just, can you ex explain how that happens? Um, yeah, that was just a, a summary. It was, the negotiation we ended up at was five years for $75,000, uh, where the cost of the program started out was $50,000 a year for five years. So we, by doing a five-year agreement, uh, we were able to bring it down to that uh, range. We're getting out in front. This is going to be a mandate in probably 2024, 2025. So we're getting out in front and working with the vendor to pilot some things at the same time. So we got a really ripping deal. Okay, 
And then I just wanted to commend you. I thought it was the most clever um, way of reducing a bu your budget um, by buying washers and dryers for all the fire stations, which, you know, you kind of wonder why that, you know, why we hadn't been doing that um, all along. But um, I mean, I'm not blaming you for that, but I think that is a really, really clever thing to do. And, and uh, you know, and hopefully that's working out well and that the firefighters do know how to operate the washers and dryers or <laughs> no, I'm sure that um, and, um, and then I just want to commend you on the partnerships too, because a lot of what we're praising your department for, um, which, you know, um, you fully deserve credit, but you've also worked with others in the community. I mean, starting with the, um, the new training center and, and the amazing partnership with, uh, Chabot College on that. And then, um, you know, I mentioned the Eden Healthcare District as well, and the partnerships with them on, you know, um, in regarding the testing, first of the testing, and I believe now the vaccination. Uh, program as well, and 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 along with the partnership with Tiburcio on that. So you know, which is an ongoing partnership due to the Firehouse Clinic, which got us a lot of major attention uh, when it was when it was launched. And um, uh, I even heard from long ago college friends of mine back east that they were reading about us in the Washington Post. You know, because of some of the things that your department has done. So I. Um, you know, I just joined my colleagues in really thanking all of you. You you do put put yourselves out there. Um, I know we have a lot. You know, we we are looking at a lot of things having to do with the nine one one call. You know, the nine one one calls and the dispatch center, and um, just appreciate your continuing um, partnership there and attention to you know some of the changes that are being talked about. So, and I don't know if you want to comment on any of that at this point, but. It sure, I think, you know, a lot of, you really should all take credit when the city does great things, because if we're doing our jobs um, and we're listening to our boss and through you, then you are the conduit directly to the community. And if we're listening, we execute on the things we hear. And sometimes they don't happen at the pace that maybe we would like to see, um, especially me, I'm pretty impatient, um, but at the same point, uh, if we take that long-term look, and, and a, an example of that was um, the, the recent data on um, Alex's work on um, greenhouse gas reductions, a, a goal that was set in 2005, and we surpassed it by almost 7% reduction. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the, the benefit of sticking with good plans and good policy that's set by council. And um, we pride ourselves on listening and and feeling like we, we can feel that pulse. Um, and even if it takes us a couple of years, we try and execute on those things that we hear across the board. So it doesn't always have to be a council resolution. Um, we're just listening. And similarly on the DEI conversation, um, we, we've embraced the DEI lens on everything that we do. And our most recent um, defensible space project that was originally planned for a very, very well-off neighborhood um, up the hill. We diverted those grant funds to uh, the Highland neighborhood where there is vegetation and uh, communities of color that don't have the means to take care of in some cases. Um, some of the neighboring jurisdictions or, or that are bumping up on, you know, Plunge Park area and those things. Um, and we pivoted on that and we'll find money somewhere else for that other area. Well, it's still important, but putting that DEI lens on everything. And that's just an example of great leadership from, from the boss and, um, and you all pushing us and telling us what your expectations are. Then you, it, the boss lets us spread our wings and do our job and, uh, people trust us and listen to us. And then, uh, mm -hmm. we, we make it happen. So, uh, it really is the, the you know, how things should work and Hayward's a model for it because of all of your leadership. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I guess um, we uh, will now move on. Yeah, we've moved a few minutes past, but still we're, we're very much on track. But anyway, it's been great talking to you, Chief. And now we are gonna move on to um, our you. human resources department. And, um, and that would be again, uh, our finance director and acting human resources director, but not for too much longer, right? Um, Dustin Clausen. So go ahead, Mr. Clausen. That's correct. Our, our new director of uh, human resources will start on uh, May 24th. So happy to have her on board. She will be a great addition to this, the team. Um, but for now, uh, you're stuck with me. 
and uh, I'll present uh, what we've what we got uh, for as far as our budget presentation. Um, the numbers here are a little bit skewed um, and look as though we're we're spending all of this money um, for for the human resources department. However, uh, the, the big changes here are um, the big change from fiscal year 21 to 22. Um, is that we are fully funding the ARC. And this is the department that this falls into um, because we have a retiree health care fund uh, and that fund is managed by, uh, by the human resources department. Uh, the other main driver here is uh, an increase to the city's workers' compensation rates, uh, you know, on par with, with most agencies at this point, um, you know, related to both the pandemic and experiences during the pandemic. Um, aside from that, we have no major changes uh, in, in staffing or anything. We'll get, we'll get into that a little bit later, um, but really kind of, um, you know, I know it doesn't look status quo um, by any means, um, but certainly um, as we get further into it, uh, it'll, it'll be a little bit more, more apparent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did um, certainly uh, meet the, the city manager's request uh, to reduce general fund services and supplies by 5%. Um, we are asking for a continuation of $50,000 uh, for contact tracing um, that we will continue to do um, for as long as is necessary. Um, I think it's the hope of everyone on this call, in the world, et cetera, um, that we will uh, not have to do that for very much longer, not, not simply just to save the expense, um, because that will certainly signify that the pandemic is over um, and there is no longer a need for it. Um, we're also asking for some uh, additional resources for online testing. Uh, this uh, pandemic has forced, uh, in a good way, um, us to adapt and try to find uh, new ways uh, to uh, allow folks to test for positions uh, inside the city. Uh, there are certainly some, uh, especially those that have um, physical testing uh, that we can't necessarily get past having folks in person for, uh, but for those that we can, um, it'll certainly allow uh, folks from outside of the area to gain interest and, and certainly maybe apply, or folks who are away at college that are maybe from uh, the city of Hayward um, that are looking to get back to the city, but are you know attending college in whatever city, state, et cetera, across the, across the nation. Uh, maybe allow them to apply for a position that they wouldn't uh, otherwise be able to. Um, we're also looking for um, an, an additional $25,000 um, to fund um, some of the employee relations and invest investigation services. This is really kind of catching up. Um, I, I, I don't mean to um, uh, disparage anyone uh, previous to me, but really this is, um, we're, we're budgeting for what our experience has been. Um, and in the past, we really haven't done a great job of budgeting for what our actual uh, costs have been. Um, there's been an uptick in, in those expenses. Um, and so we're, we're really just trying to, uh, instead of having to come back at mid-year and ask for more, uh, trying to build it into the budget on the front end. So next slide. Um, there is no, uh, well, there will, there will be a change to this very shortly. Uh, my name will no longer be at the top and uh, our, new, our new director, uh, Jenna Sangi, will be uh, with the city. Very excited to have her. Um, not, not looking to grow, um, to grow the, the department any more than that at this point. Uh, certainly when she gets here, I'm sure she'll have a say and, uh, and an opportunity to, to review the staffing, the needs of the department, et cetera. But um, at this point, we are status quo. Next slide, please. Um, so we have, uh, you know, the the pandemic has created quite a, a significant change in work uh, for the human resources department, um, along with uh, all of the folks across the organization um, that have had uh, in incredibly changing uh, work condition. Uh, you know, trying to find ways to work at home, etc. Um, as well as all of the contact tracing, getting people tested, quarantining, uh, all of those things. So it, it's it's certainly been, um, it, not to mention all of the, the challenges that it's created for our employees as it, it relates to, um, you know, having to be at, working at home uh, with, with family members, uh, you know, potentially ill or not ill and just at home uh, rather than uh, at school, uh, et cetera. Um, so really have worked very hard 
um, to to uh, make it as, as best as possible as we can for our employees. Um, we've we've obviously uh, worked with our our groups to uh, start getting people back to work. Uh, the library is open. We've got uh, full operations uh, at many of the the city's facilities. Um, also, have have created. Um, uh, things out of nowhere, like our, our, our COVID response protocol, our COVID protection plan, all of these things which, which didn't exist um, for anyone anywhere uh, prior to this. So, you know, we've really been building the plane as we've been flying, um, and the team has done an absolutely tremendous job. Um, next slide. Uh, with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that, that you all may have. Okay, thank you. And we'll start with Council Member Marquez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dustin, I just wanted to thank you. I know you've worn multiple hats this past um, year, but also I'm um, acting in the interim role as Director of HR. So just thank you for all you do. I know it has not been easy. So I just wanted to give you my appreciation. Um, I really like the budget this year. I wanted to go back and compare it to last year, but I haven't had the chance to do it, but it just, it seemed easier to follow and track. It seems a lot more concise. Um, I know I'm certain your team also had a lot to do with the new online CIP budget, which we'll see. Um, um, I just, well, are we, we're not, we are, we're doing human resources. I know, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, then. Finance, but, um, but that's, that's mainly how I see your role. But my question specifically to HR is, what is HR's role in um, ensuring that our employees are getting back to work safely? I know not everyone is back. Um, can you speak a little bit to the timeline and kind of what you envision in next steps? Sure. So, um, you know, like I said, we've, we've worked with uh, a lot of our staff around the city in different facilities. We're continuing to, to do some work to uh, develop, and, and I, I will use the term that we've been using, um, although I think it is not very aptly named, uh, our, return, our return to work plan, um, which you know implies that maybe folks haven't been working uh, for the last 13, 14 months, which is, is not accurate in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so we're really working to come up with a plan um, for, you know, specific to City Hall so that we can get folks back, reopen to the public while still uh, offering protection to both the public and our, our um, uh, employees while they're here. You know, that that ranges from, um, you know, having uh, having uh, a protective surface between uh, at our public counters to allow um, distancing, uh, we've got a couple of um, payment kiosks downstairs so that folks uh, can can pay it with cash, check, or a credit card uh, at a kiosk without having to be face to face. Um, you know, really, you know, the the city still has its mask uh, policy, um, even though CDC has uh, informed us of a bunch of and created a bunch of confusion with uh, re removing their uh, mask policy but really trying to bring folks back in the most humane way with the knowledge that um, undoubtedly we're going to, to have folks who uh, maybe pre-pandemic you wouldn't expect uh, to have anxiety issues. Um, but certainly with coming back to work, whether it be about returning to work, whether it be about, be about um, their, their children returning to uh, school, um, you know, all of these things are certainly going to create uh, some some changes in folks' life, and we understand that that will be you know uh, anxiety riddled in, in a lot of cases. So trying to to uh, sort of um, bring folks back, ease into it as much as possible, while still maintaining services to the community that we serve. Okay, and just to follow up to your comments, um, do employees have to go through HR? to use a referral to um, employee assistance programs like therapy counseling, they could do that independently? Absolutely. Uh, you know, they certainly, if, if there is a need uh, that, that exists, they can certainly reach out to human resources and we will get them into contact, but there is no, absolutely no need for a referral from HR um, to be able to access those services. Okay, great. And then my last question is, um, do you foresee any opportunities for interns? I know HR is just a really popular field in, for college students. So are there, will there be future opportunities? I know we're focused on getting people back to work, but do you see a, a role in interns in your department? 
Yeah, I definitely do. And I think that they're, um, you know, knock on wood, I think, um, you know, come this fall, we will be able to get back to uh, more of what, what HR's central core functions have been um, and less focused on the pandemic, will, which will, you know, one, allow us to be in office um, and, and have uh, young learners here with us um, to, to learn uh, in our presence, be able to sort of coach, uh, you know, as, as we're going through it, um, but also offer the opportunity um, for us to be able to focus more on, on our actual work and be able to, to grow someone alongside of us versus now where, you know, like I said, we're, we're trying to build the plane as we fly and, and learning on the go. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any more hands. Um, you know, I just was going to follow, follow up on it. So I had realized we have our own like in-house contact tracing program because ordinarily isn't that done on a, like a larger scale, like someone in the county pu public health department is, you know, my, my understanding was organizing, but we have our, our own here. That's correct. Yeah, we're a large enough organization, and um, you know, as you know, uh, situations develop incredibly rapidly, um, and and you know, we've we've spent uh, countless, not to mention we've got plenty of twenty four seven operations. So we've spent countless nights uh, tracking people down, letting them know that they they may have had close contact with someone. They should isolate uh, and, and test, and then you know, uh, correspondingly. Um, quarantine as necessary based on the results of the test, based on if the person that they had close contact with does test positive or not. Um, and so, yeah, we, we've been, it's, it's been a lot of work um, over the, the, you know, certainly um, from, we, we hit a, a, a very uh, rapid paced uh, activity from, you know, probably July through uh, February, um, and, and luckily now it's it's subsided a bit. We still are, you know, obviously maintaining the program, um, but we just aren't. They, it's not as active as it as it needed to be uh, during that time. And just to clarify, this is simply for city employees. So Correct. we're doing, yeah. So you know, just making sure if we have people, you know, employees who get exposed and then are in the office. So, um, and given the number of employees that we've still had. Um, interacting with each other in the public, um, that's kept HR very busy. But I would imagine that the county program kicks in as well when somebody, um, you know, develops that because people who work for the city also interact with a lot of other people, right? Or Certainly. And, and you know, we contact anybody that they have had close contact with, uh, you know, and, and at a time where they thought that they may have uh, had COVID-19. Okay. Well, um, well, thank you, and and thank you very much for um, uh, you know filling in in this role for the past. Uh, well, I guess it's been a few months now, right? Um, and uh, you know, we really all appreciate that. That's uh, extra week, especially during budget preparation time. So, real Herculean effort there on your part, and we do appreciate it. And with that, we will um, now move on to your second, your your major, your major hat, as well as opposed to your kind of secondary hat here for a while, um, and that is finance. So take it away. Thank you. And uh, before before I, I, I get uh, deep into my, my, my three minute presentation here, um, I, I do want to thank my team uh, in finance, uh, specifically my deputy director, Nicole Gonzalez. Um, without her Herculean effort, it would not have been possible for me to the work um, and human resources that I've been able to do um, and it kind of straddled the two departments without her um, being a, a tremendous leader um, and, and shepherding this process forward. Um, so without that, that wouldn't be possible. And I'm very grateful for the efforts uh, that she provided. So next slide, please, Nicole, <laughs> as she blushes. Um, so that we are uh, not not providing any major or proposing any any major changes either uh, this this year. Uh, the the big change uh, here is the the change in, or the uh, last year's uh, concessions uh, no longer exist. They were clearly one time, um, and natural salary growth uh, and and the cost of benefits that go along with that. So next slide. 
Um, the, the major change uh, is the 5% reduction in general services and supplies. Otherwise, we're just keeping the train rolling. Next slide, please. Um, no, no major changes uh, in in the uh, the the org chart. Uh, keeping keeping things uh, static as we have, um, you know, perpetually looking at uh, our structure to see if there are ways that we can operate better. Um, certainly, with the um, with the uh, the purchase of the the kiosks uh, that I mentioned uh, previously, that we used uh, CARES Act funding for that were uh, to allow folks to, to have sort of touchless payment services aside from um, what, we, what we offer over the phone and online, um, we, we will probably be looking at, you know, how we can function a little bit differently if there are less people needed um, at the front line um, so that we can get people into roles that, um, you know, have them thinking more and doing less maybe, uh, doing more analytical work and, and seeing how we can be more effective, more efficient. So next slide. Um, <laughs> the first slide uh, is a very routine um, uh, routine thing that every year um, I, I wouldn't, you know, in normal years, I wouldn't highlight this um, nearly as much as, uh, as we are this year. Um, but the city was successful and on time in completing their annual audit process. Uh, the significance here is, um, as you all know, on, uh, on, on March 17th, 2020, we walked out of the office and have not walked back in, uh, which essentially has completely changed our control structure, um, changed the way that we transact. Um, as, as you all are aware, we uh, made sure that we got our folks paid on time every time. Uh, we managed our cash flow. We, we um, you know, created new processes for both purchasing and procurement, et cetera, um, and, and we're able to do so um, without uh, significant findings um, and on time, which was, a, you know, again, a tremendous uh, effort by the team. Um, you know, I deserve absolutely no credit for that, um, but certainly uh, all, all goes to the effort of the team. Um, we expanded our online payment capabilities uh, for, so that folks could uh, do pay for permitting, uh, pay housing, code enforcement, airport fees, um, and other city invoices in ways that we did not prior to the pandemic. Um, certainly, they were able to call and make payments, um, but this is this was allowing for folks um, to to pay online. And much like uh, Assistant City Manager Ott mentioned earlier, um, with the work that's going on in DSD, we will continue to offer this uh, even after we open back up. Uh, to the public and have face-to-face uh, -face transactions available because certainly there are folks that would prefer to uh, transact online rather than having to drive down here or get down here uh, in whatever way they see. Um, the last accomplishment uh, goes right along with that is offering a, a, a fee-free um, online e-check payment method for um, the, the water system. We've always uh, been able, oh, I shouldn't say always, uh, for, for many years now, we, we've allowed folks to, to make payments online, uh, but there's been a fee associated, and that's, that's pretty standard across the industry. Um, but, you know, uh, what, what many would look as uh, the cost of doing business at just a transactional fee um, could certainly impact someone uh, more than, more than it, it would uh, be thought of by, by others. And so we were certainly sensitive to that and tried to come up with different solutions. Uh, this is simply one. We will continue to try to find other solutions um, so that one, the city doesn't have to pick up the fee and two, uh, our, our constituents don't either. So next slide, please. I think that's it. Happy to answer any questions uh, that you all may have. I don't think anybody has any questions. Uh, at least they haven't. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Count, thank you. Council Member Andrews. I was just going to say, I hope um, the city manager is taking you to a nice lunch uh, at the end of August. So to do <laughs> two positions and then a, in the middle of a pandemic, I just want to also give kudos for that. So thank you. That's all. <laughs> and I, and I'm sure we would all join in authorizing that lunch if, you know, <laughs> on the city manager's budget, perhaps. <laughs> Um, I I'm actually, my personal wallet. I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, we should all chip in then. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I, I just want to 
take this opportunity to get back to one question I didn't ask about um, the budget itself and um, the, um, uh, you know, it's a question that I had asked actually, and that was on the, the list and it's, it, it, it is about, um, because when I was considering, um, the, you know, the depletion of our reserves and, you know, that what we're seeing there, um, it occurred to me that we have assets, um, that are worth something and primarily I, the, the ones I can think of are property assets that are worth something. And um, like, and the primary one I think of is the city center building, which we specifically, you know, took money to purchase after because, and you know, well, we won't even go into that again. But it was a, it was a good decision, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, and that we expect to sell and and then pay back the general fund. And, and I was assuming I and that um, that was not at all reflected in the reserve amount that we're seeing on the sheet. But then the answer to the question um, does say when calculating reserve that that the um, when calculating reserves, all assets are considered and do factor into the reserve calculation. So could you just elaborate on that? And I'm sorry for not asking it earlier, but that's okay. Um, so this is um, I will try to I will try to put this in as plain as English as possible here. Um, it goes back to accounting uh, sort of 101 in that uh, essentially equity is assets minus liabilities. So if we've got 10 in assets and five in liabilities, we would have five in equity, right? So it doesn't say that only cash or only certain assets are included in that, in that, um, that calculation when we are uh, calculating reserves. Um, there are some nuances that I won't get too caught up in that, you know, uh, capital assets have to be, it, it's not just liquid reserves that we can use for anything. Um, but it, it certainly does factor in. I will say the difference in, um, in that specific, uh, that related to that specific asset, the city can carry the asset at, um, what it paid for it, essentially what, 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 what the cost of, of when, of it was when we purchased it, when we sell it we will have cash for whatever whatever that amount is that we take in in cash. I have a hunch, although I'm certainly no, um, no uh, commercial real estate agent, nor do I know the market or anything like that. I, I would be willing to bet that we will be able to sell it for more than we purchased it for. Once we do that, we'll be able to realize that gain and it will increase our assets, which then in turn would increase reserves. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad for that, ex you know, to have that example and, and, uh, and know what we're really talking about when we're looking at that reserve. So thank you for that. And um, there are no other questions. I don't see any other hands raised. We can, I think, um, excuse you. You aren't heading any other department on the list later on today, right? <laughs> but thank you, for, thank you for an amazing year and all the work that you have done in both departments. Um, we really do appreciate it very much. And now, um, we will move on to library. Kind of our good, afternoon. good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members. I'm so happy to be here and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, let's go to the first slide. Well, next slide. Okay, so that, that is our budget. We don't have very, you know, any really significant changes except the addition of one position for the bookmobile, which is, of course, a new addition for us. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So like all of the other departments, we did do a 5% reduction in general fund supplies and services. But we did add a lead library assistant position for the new bookmobile. The new bookmobile, as you all know, we received it through um, a donation. We got the funding for the entire bookmobile. And uh, it will need two full-time equivalents in order to, uh, to staff it. But we're going to try to absorb that one of the positions and the other position we've got. We are funding it through HPN for the first year. And, you know, obviously we, the bookmobile is not going away, but we definitely were able to get the funding for it for the full first year. And then the, it's, this is really not a significant thing, but we just changed the way our org chart looks to make it a little easier to understand. So, and here we go, here's the org chart. And the only change you can see is for the lead library assistant position over there in, um, for the coming year. Um, next, please. 
and our highlights and accomplishments. And I will say, you know, I've really been suffering from whiplash this year, watching how fast staff have pivoted this way and that, trying to serve the community. But, you know, we launched our HPL to go curbside services, which was, it has been very successful. We have checked out about 63,000 items to about 6,500 patrons over this period. And this is all through uh, contactless uh, service. And part of curbside is we also did uh, lunch at the library where we were serving lunches and giving away uh, books and crafts. And we served about 950 library participants. And then we did it through the schools also. And we served about 460, a little over 460 participants through the schools. And that was in summer and in fall and winter. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, then, of course, you know, we went into online based all of our services, we expanded our online resources extremely, I mean, we really put a lot of effort into expanding online resources like ebooks, audiobooks, streaming movies. And then we started doing programming online. And so we did both zoom based programming and social media based programming. And social media, so for example, on Facebook, we did 210 programs, uh, which got over 48,000 views. So really, you know, good service, I think. Um, we expanded our tech lending library, which, as you know, uh, we've got a very strong homework center program, but we had to close that. And so students were really suffering. And so we did something which was we gave away a lot of backpacks, which included books, uh, uh, supplies, really what we're trying to find a way to support uh, students in their homework, uh, in their uh, studies. And then, of course, the tech part of it. And uh, we uh, partnered with HUSD and we put about 700 devices into the hands of students. And the wonderful thing we did was we actually expand, uh, extended the checkout period and made it a full school year. So people didn't have to give back their items, which is very unique in the entire state. It was really kind of a model program. And then of course, finally, as I mentioned, we did uh, receive funding for the bookmobile and we started planning for that. And, you know, we always have had a very strong focus on DEI, but right now we've made it a very intentional part of any planning we do. And definitely bookmobile, one of our big goals is to really think about DEI as we plan our stops and programs. So. And that, those are just some of the major accomplishments. And if we can go to the next slide, please. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. And we will go first to Council Member Salinas. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Director Adelman. Um, you know, I uh, when, when we moved to uh, build this library, uh, we called it the 21st century um, community center, learning center, um, uh, for a reason, and um, and I'm um, I'm very pleased um, that you and your team have um, really uh, calibrated this building to be just that. Um, you know, the uh, I know we haven't fully opened it yet, and I know you know it's we're not we're not running on all twelve pistons, so to speak, but. Um, um, but I think uh, you know the 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 direction that you've taken this library. I think is um, you know we will fully realize uh, the building, and so I I wanted to uh, just acknowledge that. Um, but I also um, wanted to acknowledge um, your education services department. And yes, I'm a little biased because I uh, work uh, with the education services department. Um, on a regular basis, but um, uh, in, in, in all of the librarians are, are terrific. I've, I've worked with um, with Sally Thomas and I and, mean, and just they're, they're uh, I've never met. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say it that way. Every single one of your librarians that I have worked with um, out in the community and um, you know, they have always stepped up. They have always been some of the most creative, innovative, and just really, um, you know, uh, nothing has been too weird to do, <laughs> you know? And so I, I, I just wanted to appreciate that. But, um, you know, uh, Lindsay and her team, um, you know, they have, uh, um, 
you know, um, there is no idea too ridiculous. There is no idea too crazy. Um, and they just seem to make it work. Ivan and, and you know, and his crew, um, the summer interns that you hire uh, that come in, um, they're, they're phenomenal, uh, phenomenal. Um, you know, during the uh, pre-pandemic, um, through the Words for Lunch program in partnership with the Hayward Promise Neighborhood, um, uh, the library, you know, with Lindsay and, and Sally Thomas and, and Ivan, um, they have, uh, they have always um, delivered some of the, the, the best curriculum. They've always put together some of the, um, you know, the most, um, you know, uh, intriguing kits of books. Uh, and, and we really have been able to put a lot of books uh, in kids' home. And just so that you know, um, uh, Hayward Promise Neighborhood did do a, a neighborhood survey. And one of, the, uh, one of the questions we asked was around um, uh, the amount of reading uh, that families are doing at home. And uh, over, the length of the la over the last three years, we have seen a steady increase in uh, length of reading and also um, the amount of books. Uh, in um, in households, so uh, the work uh, your team is doing is certainly making an impact uh, in uh, the neighborhood. But also, um, you know, I think what the education services has done very effectively and very um, very well, very good, is they've been able to put a lot of technology, computers, and hotspots in the hands of students throughout the city. Um, they have filled um, if there were any gaps uh, with the school district. Um, the Hayward Public Library has stepped in and they have filled that gap. And so I think that that's, um, that, that's good. Um, uh, words for lunch, you know, uh, we, uh, we went into planning what this summer is going to look like. And uh, we weren't sure what words for lunch was going to, how it was going to look like or what was going to happen. Uh, but your ed services uh, team, you know, said, yeah, absolutely, we're going to make it happen. So, um, which... Uh, we're going to, uh, Words for Lunch will be launched this summer, uh, and it, it'll be virtual. However, we will still continue to serve food. Uh, kids will continue to have lunch, uh, and uh, just the, the literacy component will just be online. And, um, and so I, I think that's, um, you know, uh, uh, no idea was too ridiculous, so to speak. And, and, we, and we're still going to have, you know, great curriculum, great activities, and, and, and high quality. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to just give you another big congratulations with Kirby. Um, that is going to be, you know, <clears throat> um, I think it's going to be great that, um, you know, Kirby isn't only, uh, it's not only a bookmobile, right? Um, but uh, we're also going to be wrapping Kirby with other services for neighborhood families uh, and kids. Um, we're going to be attaching a lot of other stuff around there. Um, and it's going to be a... Um, uh, it's going to be a hub in of itself where we're going to be driving into neighborhoods and connecting kids and families to uh, literacy activities and, and, and other resources. And, and this is, uh, and lastly, I'm just going to make this last point. Uh, lastly, um, you know, the um, post pandemic, I think the future in um, service delivery for neighborhoods uh, is going to be mobile. Um, and one is, is libraries, um, but other is, you know, as the fire department has also demonstrated, but um, in addition, but everything from health clinic to, um, you know, food distributions to, you know, diaper distributions to, um, you know, um, there's going to be, uh, we should start thinking about how to be mobile now. And, and I think that, I think Kirby is sort of that, um, in that direction. So um, I really don't have a question and I know I'm just sitting here talking a lot, but um, I just wanted to, um, um, you know, that building has certainly uh, lived up to his name so far. Um, we're not, we're not open full, full, uh, um, you know, uh, we're not open all the way yet, but uh, so far we're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank right. you. Thank you. Council member Andrews. Thank you, mayor. I just want to also thank you for um, making sure that culture was celebrated, especially during this time. So, sometimes those events kind of go by the wayside. 
um, when there's an emergency situation. And I felt like you knew that it was still important for uh, the community to have those activities um, virtually and have um, different contests that youth can participate in. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, keeping uh, those activities going um, throughout all this because it probably lifted up a lot of spirit. So thank you for that. Yeah, mine, mine as well. So thank you. You're right. <laughs> um, uh, let's see who's next. Uh, Council members, Romano. Hi, pick the mayor and thank you, um, Ms. Adelman over at the library. Uh, very good job. Uh, I wanted to first uh, make sure that you thank all the staff for the excellent job that they're doing. Uh, Hector Villasenor for doing the Spanish uh, reading club. Um, uh, and for having a great green library. Uh, just a question on uh, a progress report on Heritage Plaza and bathrooms, please. So Heritage Plaza, I will really defer to, uh, to Mr. O'Mary on that. But you know, it is, it's very close. There's very, there's, it's going to happen very soon. Again, bathrooms are, you know, not in phase one, but uh, yeah, I, that's something I'd have to, or maybe our city manager can respond to that. Yeah, I, we've been in conversations about um, options for bathrooms, but I think we definitely, and the conversation we've had is we, we want to be done with this contract and this contractor and then not do any more change orders. So once we finish Heritage Park um, and the plaza, then it'll be time to have that conversation about um, what how, how bathrooms might fit in to the park. And we would do that under a separate contract. Thank you. Thank you, Bubba, good job. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Council Member Marquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Director Ottoman, I just want to thank you for your leadership, not only in Hayward, but on a state level. You um, take a lot on, and we've received a lot of great recognition because of your leadership and vision. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Also wanted to acknowledge our library commissioners. They did an amazing job advocating for the same request you're asking of us today in a letter I think sent in early April. They're also very committed and very excited um, to have the library slowly reopen safely. And just want to share with the public that it's everyone's goal and intent to bring back programming. But I think it's really important for people to understand that all of these decisions are under uh, labor discuss discussions and MOUs. And we have to keep everyone's safety in mind, um, our employees as well as the public. So it's not that we want to intentionally delay things, but it does take some time to get to these agreements. So thank you so much to the staff for being innovative during the pandemic and still ensuring that our community can access the amazing services that your department offers. So thank you. Thank you. And council member Wahab. Thank you. Um, you know, I just want to say thank you for everything you've done. I, I think I was very excited that you joined our team in Hayward. And I knew that just in conversation that you kind of get the picture of like, at least what I'd like to uh, accomplish regarding Hayward being an education city and very focused and um, its core, one of its core tenants that it provides to residents and so forth. Um, is a place where people can learn, people can gather and people can uh, work as one community. Uh, I, I definitely want Hayward to be an education city and I, I see that uh, the library has to be one of the core focuses. Um, I will say to our city manager and obviously yourself, um, one of my biggest goals is to uh, ensure that the city of Hayward um, invests in the library, um, that you know a lot of our programming and functioning, it doesn't have to be at these other departments you know, where people are uncomfortable going or don't know where to go or things like that. Everyone knows where the library is, right? Uh, I definitely want that to be the core focus, um, that we very much have our internship programs, um, job seeking programs, community gatherings together, all at the library and through the library, right? Whether it's fellowships, internships, things like that. Um, I also want the city of Hayward to definitely invest in the library. It should be a seven day a week library, right? And I know I sent you a schedule that um, I've seen and, and you know, hopefully we, we can kind of get that going. Um, uh, seven days a week, obviously 
you know, randomly staffed just to make sure that, you know, it's not during school hours where, you know, not a lot of people, not a lot of kids will, uh, will come through. And uh, the partnerships that you and your organization actually have with other community organizations, right? All the nonprofits should be, you know, definitely working with you. All of the school um, after school tutoring and any type of projects and, and collaborations we can do there uh, should be done that way. And so I, I really just want to appreciate the fact that you, you also kind of share a lot of this vision and hopefully and surely, um, you know, we can get there and, you know, make this uh, a library in both of the libraries technically um, a, a core of the city of Hayward. So when we have an event, go to the library because it's going to be there. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I will echo all the compliments my co colleagues have made about, you know, it's, it's a really special um, I think it's something everyone loves, you know, <laughs> everyone loves libraries and, and I, and you have really um, added a lot since you came on board and, and have moved us in a direction that I think makes us all very happy. Um, I think the cultural, um, you know, the, the di diversity has been a real keynote and I think we've all learned a lot from, I, I mean, I, I'll just speak for myself. I've learned a lot from the various programs that your, the library has offered and I haven't even been to all of them, but, you know, just the ones I have been able to you know, attend or participate in. Um, so, but I, I actually do have a couple of, you know, the, I mean, um, council member Wahab uh, is saying we should invest in the library. Well, we do. I mean, it, all of your revenues, it, or it appears from my reading of this um, budget that um, all of the revenues pretty much are coming from the general fund and that, and that the general fund subsidy has increased by 400,000 this year. And I just um, wondered if you or the city manager can speak to that, um, why that is. And um, and then, yeah, because I was really surprised at, at not seeing any grant funding. And yet I'm wondering where is the, because I would think that the, um, or maybe they haven't, the bookmobile person that we're getting on board that, is being funded by Hayward Promise Neighborhood. Thank you, Council Member Salinas, for any part you had in that. But um, uh, uh, is um, I don't I don't see that reflected here. So I just um, wondered about that. Uh, okay, so okay, so maybe I'll have to defer to uh, to Dustin over here. But uh, you know, it is in there. So. Um, it is in there somewhere. Okay. It is in there. I know it's in there. So I think the person yeah. is. I was wondering where the funding was. Is the grant considered to come to the general fund and then passed on, or? I think that must be it. It may be rolling up into the wrong line, and, we, and we're not showing it as grant revenue. We'll we'll get that cleaned up because certainly, um, you know, they're not just the the grant funding uh, as it relates to the bookmobile, but the the library gets grants uh, for for many different things. So. Yeah, yeah, we get a lot of state grants for literacy. We really do get a lot of grants. Yes. Yeah, that was my understanding. So I was just, I really, I looked, <laughs> and so yeah. the general fund subsidy increase is simply just salary and benefit yeah. cost increases. It's just reflecting that. That's probably why that is showing as an increase this this year. Is my assumption. Okay, and then my other question is about the literacy um, services and I know in your um, you're talking about the different you know the different departments within the library department and that you list um, as part of library operations and public services provide lifelong learning and literacy programs to the Hayward community and then under education services provide literacy tutoring to illiterate and low low literate Hayward adults so could you just talk about is, are those like two different things that we're doing that that you're doing and um and how they you know and what they are well they do there is quite a bit of overlap between the two and we put everything actually under education services literacy and our uh, and sort of the homework centers which all is together and so we really expanded what we are doing some of it is direct because state funds some of it and some of it we fund through hpn so it's a little bit kind of based on where the funding comes from also adult literacy typically is what's funded by the state and the rest of it is sort of from the, all the other programs. 
And so we're doing a lot. We also do things with parents in the school, in the school. So like at the homework center, some of the parents from the homework centers, we are working with them. But literacy also, adult literacy, where we have people work directly through us, you know, who come in, who need to improve their literacy skills, who are, we're doing a lot of conversation English English circles. So there may be adults who are not ready to be partnered or for a one-on-one -on -one situation, but just we need to get them to the level of uh, fluency where we can partner them with a tutor to get into the writing aspect of it. So, you know, just as there's a different programs that we're doing in the different areas, but most of what we do through the schools, even if it's for the parents and the adults would be more in the education services part of it and the other part of it will be the in literacy. Does that sort of fancy? I your think question? so. And those, so those tutoring, the one on one tutoring has continued and it has continued, I assume, on an online or a virtual basis, as well as the, oh, I used, I really miss that. I used to volunteer in the after school tutoring, haven't been able to do that for the past few years, but um, and that has continued as well on the, in, in the virtual sense. It has. And in fact, that was one of the very innovative programs we did because, uh, you know, a lot of our learners don't really have computers. So it's sort of you're in a tough situation. So we partnered with the, um, the Stop, uh, Stop Waste, it's the e-waste uh, recycling program. And we got a large number of refurbished computers. And we started what we called is a learn to, from loan to own program. So we issued these uh, laptops and desktops to a lot of our learners and we set very simple goals for them. But as soon as they got the reach those goals, those computers became theirs. So they could continue to learn you know, we absolutely wanted to make sure they could learn. We didn't want them to fall behind during the pandemic, but then we also made it so that they could get these computers and continue to work it, you know, use it for their work, for their learning, for their jobs, but also continue to participate in the literacy program. So that's been extremely successful and it's just a wonderful program. It's like win, win, win all around. That, that's a great service I know, and especially at this time. And then finally, there are, I know up to, um, volunteers, somewhat independent, but somewhat connected organizations, the Friends of the Library, Friends of the Hayward Library, who were so instrumental in raising money for, you know, the, to build our new library. That was somewhat before your time that, you know, that that money was being raised. But, um, and then the other is, um, uh, uh, the, oh, the, the um, Hayward Literacy, Literacy Plus. Literacy Plus, yes. yes. And yeah. how are the relationships there and, and, you know, during this COVID time and, you know, what, what can we look toward, toward in the future from it's that? It's been really, and thank you for bringing it up. I really do want to uh, thank our support organizations. You know, um, Council Member Marquez men mentioned the commissioners who've been amazing. And then of course, both our Literacy Plus Council and our Friends of the Library, and both have done some amazing work during this program. Both continue to be very aggressive about their fundraising. And one of the things about the Friends of the Library is they've done, they've gone into, since the bookstore is closed, they've been using their Amazon on marketing platform and they've done they sell books really actively it's been amazing so but you know we've used this we've really used this time well so books that are not getting that we're not selling we've been giving away a lot of books to the schools I mean so many schools have been receiving books from us so you know we really have been serving the community every way we can and definitely with the support of our of our various organizations that are helping us it's been tough for us because we really did lose uh, uh, you know because of the layoffs and the hiring freeze our, our, we have really got a very, very, uh, what should I say, uh, impacted uh, staff force. And, you know, we're working to get back to that, but our friends of the library and, the, and Literacy Plus have really helped us in reaching out to the communities. Well, I think we all thank you, all you and your whole team and all of the people who love library, the library in the city for um, bringing us through this time. And we, I know we are all looking forward to that time when we can start gathering back at that beautiful new library and even looking out the window across to across the street in the new Heritage Plaza. So anyway, in the meantime, thank you very much. Good to see you and we will move on. Thank you so much. And I really want to say thank you to Kelly for her support and her great leadership and all of you for all that you've done for us. So thank you very much.
All right. Well, yes, we, 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 we all appreciate her too, but we, we very much appreciate you. And we're looking forward to seeing more of you in person at these programs and everything in the coming, um, hopefully in the coming year. So um, with that, uh, we're going to now move on um, to, uh, well, actually, this is the time for a break and we are, um, and we went past the time for the break, so we're not going to have one. No, I, I actually, I do think um, that we should have, but let's make it a five minute break. Is everybody okay with that this time? It's enough to, you know, take care of basic needs there and, and be back in about five minutes. Or let's say seven, let's say um, 2.25.
So I, I think we are all all back. Everybody back. At least your pictures are back. Are you back in person? Yep. I see. Live moving bodies. Yes. Good. So. There's, yeah, there's Council Member Zermeno. Are you with us? Not hearing an answer. I see everybody else. Those seven minutes went by super fast, Mayor. They did, didn't they? Yeah. Like but... an accelerated clock or something. I don't even feel like it was seven minutes. <laughs> But we're on the last leg now, so. Three more departments. Closing remarks, public comments. And um, so with that, Council Members Ermenio, calling Council Members Ermenio. And also, city, um, Madam City Manager, are you back? She is. Okay. Yep. Okay. And council members are Manio. Oh, there he is. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going to re reconvene now after our short break and, um, and uh, we are now moving to the city attorney's office. Mr. Lawson. Greetings, Mayor Halliday, council members. Special welcome to council member Andrews who is uh, going through her first full budget cycle. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> the fiscal 22 budget isn't changing significantly, <clears throat> um, except uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about our insurance coverage costs. It's projected here at 3%, but late breaking news says it's gonna be 28%. I'll get back to that in a minute. <clears throat> Next slide. Consistent with other departments, uh, our general fund supplies and services line item will be reduced by 5%. And um, as to our insurance coverages, I'll get back to that in a second. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The organization chart remains the same. There are no changes in FTEs. Um, I would just observe that in this fiscal year, two of our staff attorneys at various points have been out on maternity or family leave. Uh, so we've had uh, quite a few challenges in staffing all of our responsibilities, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the legal system, the courts and other lawyers have similarly been affected by the pandemic. They are slowly reopening um, and um, some of our attorneys are now making actual court appearances. <clears throat> As City Hall reopens, I expect a hybrid of in-office and uh, remote work operations, generally consistent with other fourth floor departments uh, with whom we uh, partner and collaborate. <clears throat> Just another uh, observation, the city attorney's office physically looks different uh, from how you might remember it. Um, I would invite you to come down the hall, take a look at our office uh, when you are in the building. I'll just leave that as a bit of a mystery. <clears throat> Next slide, please. These three major accomplishments, while significant, don't really reflect everything that we've been doing um, as a support department. <clears throat> uh, what I would observe, however, is <clears throat> that probably 98% of what we do around claims and litigation are resolved administratively. That means that um, we reserve uh, for council time the most significant high value cases and claims 
and policy related uh, matters. <clears throat> so the fact that you don't see us that much, I suggest means that we're doing a very good job at what we do. <clears throat> but there are, I think, um, three significant um, takeaways um, to look forward to in this budget. Um, and, and they are these. The projected 3% increase in energy or in the insurance coverage costs, uh, according to our late breaking uh, JPA risk um, news report, um, is in fact 28%, not 3%. <clears throat> That's an increase from 3 million to 3.8 million. <clears throat> The areas in which insurance costs are rising are in three areas primarily. There is information technology or the cyber risk exposure that's coming from ransomware, viral attacks, breaches, and phishing. Our increase for FY22 is 208%. <clears throat> and property losses, the proposed increase is going to be around 40%. Those losses come from wildfires, as in Northern California, hurricanes, and tornadoes. So even though Hayward has not had losses in um, our cyber risk area, and as the director said earlier, they spend 366 days uh, a year, seven days a week, uh, dealing with those kinds of risks. <clears throat> and I'm not suggesting any reduction or change in coverage costs. Property losses, um, again, Hayward has not had a property loss in a number of years, but still the industry is experiencing significant loss and it does affect us um, directly because of uh, the kinds of coverages that we have. <clears throat> Finally, not surprisingly, law enforcement related liability significantly impacts um, our coverage, even though we've only had a few high value settlements, as you know. But the fact is that across the country, law enforcement related exposure and losses are very, very significant. Uh, because we have a number of layers in our general liability coverages that includes police, increases range from about 4% to 49%. <clears throat> now, because $800,000 going from 3 million to 3.8 million is a lot of money, uh, we've already started looking at ways of, of sustaining lower costs, primarily by increasing our level of risk. If we compare our coverage to, let's say, your automobile coverage costs, we have a number of what we call self-insured retention layers or deductibles. If we can um, uh, increase some of those SIRs or deductibles, uh, particularly around general liability and property related costs, we can probably reduce the increase from 28%, probably back down to about 5 to 10%. I've already started talking with the finance director and the city manager, as well as our risk GPA about ways to do that. And I'll also be conferring with the mayor, who's particularly knowledgeable about this area before the final budget comes back for council consideration. <clears throat> I don't recommend any changes around the cyber risk or IT uh, risk. Just as an example, uh, the, the um, energy company, I think on the East Coast, uh, affected by the uh, gasoline crisis, actually paid a $5 million ransom. <clears throat> Our insurance coverage would not pay a ransom. Uh, they provide other kinds of protections, but uh, that is the nature of what's going on in that industry. So, um, uh, even though there was a two, there is a two hundred and eight percent increase in the coverage for FY twenty two, we need as much coverage as possible. <clears throat> Adam and his team are investing in a variety of other tools um, to deal with exposure. Um, I'm on the back end, so to speak. <clears throat> and I don't propose any changes um, there. Uh, there are a couple matters that I uh, will probably bring back to you in closed session. 
uh, when we get to my performance evaluation, and that is particularly related to uh, where coverage um, is increasing or changing. Uh, that requires we talk about specific cases, um, but I'll bring those back to you. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably uh, three main, uh, the, so the third takeaway um, that I just wanted to share with you, you know, the, the city attorney's office is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we've had a variety of internship and externship programs for a number of years. <clears throat> and in fiscal 22, as with other departments, um, I would propose that we expand uh, particularly on the fourth floor and try and coordinate our internship and, um, and externship programs in order, in order to support Hayward-based students who are, many of whom are learning remotely. Um, and that would include uh, mayor council, city manager, city clerk, and the uh, fire administration on the fourth floor. <clears throat> Uh, finally, uh, the city attorney's office is active in Cal Cities, also known as the League of Cities. Uh, we're very active as leaders uh, among the city attorneys in Alameda County and the International Municipal Lawyers Association. <clears throat> I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be participating in a panel with the Alameda County Bar Association in a couple of weeks on 21st century policing. Uh, I'll be joined uh, with other lawyers um, in this feel as well as uh, police chiefs in the Bay Area. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you, I guess, for delivering the most shocking news of the day, but um, that is uh, something that I think we'll all look forward to discussing further. Um, I see uh, Council Member Lamnon. Thank you. Um... As always, thank you for such a professional department and for um, your proactive um, thoughts about how to keep our how to keep our risks down, our um, our actions safe, and everything protected in the city. So really appreciate the work of you and your team. And I think this insurance um, issue is a good example of that. That you are already thinking about how to leverage funds we already have in house. Um, to decrease our costs. And I really appreciate that. And I look forward to, as the mayor just said, um, you know, details about that as we go through the budget um, to the extent that we um, need that. But I really appreciate that that work's already underway. And also think about the, um, you know, we know that for instance, our residents in Hayward have a lower home insurance right, because our fire department is so exceptional. And so to the extent that um, preventative programs, you know, our exceptional IT program has been mentioned many times earlier, you know, our, what, to what extent our, um, our best practices that we're using help not only our rates, but perhaps regionally, you know, if other folks are adopting them as well. Um, and then, I uh, absolutely love the idea of a, of a coordinated intern program. Um, I know many of our departments have interns in various ways with the idea that those interns can work together and that there's some capacity in your department. You've certainly been a leader in having um, interns and training them. Somebody mentioned earlier about the HOAs and you know perhaps mapping out where they are and who their leadership is um, and starting that two-way communication with those groups might be a great intern program. Oh, yeah. um, and certainly happy to help with, um, in terms of my tiny office. <laughs> Usually we talk about offices as big things in the city, but you know, I won't volunteer all seven of us, but I'll volunteer me to help as needed. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, Council Member Salinas. Yeah, thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions. One regarding um, <clears throat> IT uh, cyber attack uh, exposure. You know, we've um, we've been talking for a while now about um, you know Wi-Fi citywide, citywide Wi-Fi, and um, you know there have been um, there have been mixed opinions about that. Um, uh, opinions that I agree with, opinions that I disagree with, and you know, and 
you know, my, my fundamental question has always been, you know, how come Hayward can't be a citywide, you know, either free Wi-Fi or, you know, a city, uh, a city with citywide Wi-Fi, um, preferably free. And so my question is, um, you know, is how serious or how expensive is, uh, is it to protect, um, you know, internet users with, you know, free citywide uh, Wi-Fi? I mean, what, what are the, what are the legal implications? I can... I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to the city manager and the and the IT director for a, 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 a more comprehensive response. But uh, what I can say is that the city of Oakland does sponsor a free Wi-Fi program in some parts of the city that are considered to be you know lower income and perhaps uh, folks are not able to uh, um, uh, pay for their own Wi-Fi. And the city has also invested in, uh, I think, um, um, higher capacity fiber in the industrial part of the city. So I think there are opportunities to invest, but in terms of risk, I'm gonna defer, I see Kelly there, I'm gonna defer to Kelly and, and Adam uh, if they have a, a, a response now or they can develop a response for you. Yeah, I think what, one of the challenges in this in talking with Adam and sort of the benefit of free Wi-Fi versus, you know, other things that we might provide, you know, Wi-Fi doesn't penetrate walls. So if we, you know, installed Wi-Fi on, you know, say light poles throughout different neighborhoods, that's well and good, but it's not going to go into people's homes. They, they would have to come out and like sit in their car and use the Wi-Fi. So, and that's the challenge we've had with the downtown Wi-Fi is, it doesn't go inside the building, the businesses. It's just when you're like outside or in city hall, and so um, that's that's kind of, you know, that's where I would hesitate, you know, in terms of like the the value for the cost of installing citywide wide Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we looked into a variety of different solutions during the pandemic to try and think about it, and the best thing for us to do was to buy you know, the hotspots that the library talked about and give those out to families so that they could actually use them in their homes. Um, so th that to me is a much bigger bang for the buck. Um, you know, I think we can, we're, Adam and his team are working now on this sort of, um, sort of coverage, you know, sort of trying to get, get a, a, you know, working with GIS to try and actually map out um, how service cover like what does service service coverage look like in Hayward and are where are the gaps so that then we can actually more effectively target the resources so that's a project that they are working on but um, just to respond and you know I think you look at like Mountain View has free city Wi-Fi but it's all sponsored by Google and their Google logo you know is everywhere and so you know <laughs> if we had a if we had a corporate uh, partner that wanted to sponsor free Wi-Fi I would be happy to explore that with them but. Um, we don't we don't have some of those um, those corporate uh, corporate citizens I would call them right, you know like some other cities so anyway just uh, yeah. um, my my next question is um, so you know I know the the largest uh, exposure is uh, law enforcement and um, you know there's you know we um, how can I let me frame the question this way. Um, you know, there's um, there's a lot of training, right? There's a lot of discussion around training. You know, of 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 a variety of of a, of a that cover a variety of of areas of law enforcement and police work. Um, do we get? Did I? I don't know if if I understood your comments to this, but um, I don't know if you touched upon this or not, but. Um, does our insurance go down, um, you know, our fee go down if officers are trained more <laughs> or, you know, um, in, in that, and if they have training in more areas, does, you know, our, you know, premiums go down any, or is, is it, you know, or is the premium or, or are our premiums consistently rising for, you know, just just the nature of the business.
there are probably uh, two or three pieces that are responsive. First of all, the department training is all consistent with what's required by POST, the, Cal uh, the uh, California Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the city is also certified by CALIA. <clears throat> Um, and then the department has uh, a number of uh, additional training programs. <clears throat> These all factor into the premium costs, but the reality is, is that uh, liability exposure and settlements also drive those costs. And even though Hayward's experience is relatively minimal, industry-wide, that is nationally, the costs are being driven by exposure related to use of force. And there's no question that even though our experience is relatively minimal, that is to say, our uses of force cases that are reported and therefore calculated while not significant industry-wide, when you look at a settlement of $28 million, $27 or $28 million in Minneapolis, uh, that is undeniably a factor in our insurance costs. Let me also just make the observation that as much as we do to contain and minimize costs based on training and other tactical decisions, the use of force, well, let me just back up and say that, um, as you know, we have various layers of coverage, including what we call our excess coverage, which are the higher um, elements. The city doesn't always control the outcome of cases when we're in those layers. Those layers are sometimes driven by the excess carriers. And as I've shared with you in closed session from time to time, <clears throat> even though tactical, tactical decisions are within quote unquote policy, even though there are no findings of criminal liability based upon independent investigations, even though there is consistent um, findings within the department's own policies, that doesn't mean that a jury or a judge might not disagree and find that there is liability. So these are very complex issues, but to try and answer your question as best as I can. There is no question that what's going on nationally affects our insurance coverage costs. Our insurance has doubled from about $1.5 million about five years ago to now 3 million, maybe 3.8 million um, of which general liability police practices as a very, very big piece. Okay, uh, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, um, Council Member Marquez. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, City Attorney. I just wanted to acknowledge your team and all their efforts. I know you've done a lot of work in regard to COVID response with um, drafting the moratorium on evictions for residents, commercial tenants. Um, been working a lot on housing. Congratulations on the passage of Measure 00, the Charter Amendment. Um, just been doing a lot of great work and just really appreciate um, the diversity in your department and look forward to, as you mentioned, a more coordinated effort with interns. You've always been a leader in grooming our next generation of city attorneys and young leaders. So thank you for all that great work. Um, we've talked a lot about the coverage and liability factor of the police department and just public safety in general. After the police department, what would you say is the second highest um, department that we receive claims from? Public works. Okay. And that's because of vehicles um, and property related damages uh, caused by normal operations. These are usually traffic accidents or property related claims. <clears throat> and, you know, just so I'm clear about this, police claims involving, uh, police claims include a wide variety of activities. Uh, sometimes they're auto related claims, sometimes they are tow related claims, and sometimes they are claims related to property or, or, or use of force. The council doesn't see 95% of those claims. 
they are resolved um, administratively. So the council really only sees those high value uses of force. Sometimes they're fatal, sometimes they're not, but most claims are resolved administratively uh, within our layer. They're not reported to our excess layers. So the Hind Police uh, Public Works, um, because of property related claims, pro public works and maintenance services uh, have the highest number of claims, but police, while having fewer claims, have, have higher value per claim. Okay, and can you give us an idea of um, comparing previous fiscal year to current fiscal year, how many claims in total your department's processed? This, this um, uh, about a year ago, the council received a report reflecting about 500 claims over a four year period <clears throat> with police related claims sort of averaging about 20,000 and other claims in other departments say about 5,000 or, or less. This past year, because of the pandemic, the number of claims and lawsuits went down dramatically. There were probably uh, less than 50% of the claims in previous years. <clears throat> And up until about, say, December or so, we had probably fewer than five lawsuits between March and December. It's increased now since December and January because uh, for a variety of reasons, but, um, and we'll actually be able to give you some numbers uh, when I do my uh, performance evaluation but the last year has been atypical in terms of claims and litigation. Thank you so much. Council member Wahab, you had your hand up. Thank you, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you to our city attorney and your office. Uh, I know that we've had um, several cases that you know took a lot of time and effort. Um, you know, our dealings with Cal State East Bay, as well as, um, you know, some of the other things that have gone on in our city. Uh, I do also appreciate the, the discussion of the layers of insurance. I think a lot of people assume, um, you know, when the city of Hayward is sued that, uh, you know, we are paying completely everything that's there, but uh, it is for insurance um, and things like that. Um, I also wanted to highlight the, uh, you know, when when we are paying these out, would you be able to at least tell to the public, um, you know, how much we are are technically covered for within our own city, and then the the layers of insurance, and if that's typical with other cities as well, <clears throat> just a high level generalized um, overview, kind of like what you've done in the past. For general life, but just as an observation, uh, for property related claims, city self insured layer is 10,000. And the most recent large claim, which was about 30,000, was a number of maybe five or six years ago. We could increase our self insured layer to 100,000 and probably save $300,000 a year in coverage costs. For our general liability, which includes police practices, uh, which is a little bit more complex, our self-insured layer is 250,000. And as I said earlier, probably 98% of our claims and litigation, including police are resolved within that $250,000 layer. There's a layer between 250 and 500,000. There's another layer between 500 and 1 million. There's a layer between 1 million and 25 million, and then there's a layer between 25 million and 50 million. Uh, and can you talk about the transparency of these, uh, th these claims against the city? Uh, council member, can you be more specific? Uh, in the sense that, you know, as, as, a, as a council member, obviously we are briefed in closed session, but um, the public, you know, doesn't exactly know uh, one, how often we get sued, and then number two, um, how often we actually do decide to pay or not. 
uh, whether that's through um, a decision as you referenced earlier to a judge or, or so. Um, and then where does this funding come from? Um, I understand we have insurance, but I, I kind of just want you to highlight just for the public uh, how this works. Um, I think the city attorney's office is largely, um, I'm gonna say, I'm not even gonna say misunderstood, but not understood as to you know what you guys deal with. <clears throat> Your, your, your question is, um, it, it, it's an excellent question and I'll, I'll start at the back end and say, first of all, as part of our budget, the council includes in the budget an amount of approximately $5 million that includes our insurance premium, which is about 3 million. <clears throat> And then the balance of 2 million or so is used for paying all claims and all cost of litigation and all judgments, <clears throat> including any amounts under the $250,000 uh, deductible amount. <clears throat> the council rarely has to be asked for a supplemental appropriation to cover any of these costs. <clears throat> the claims that the council sees over $250,000, you can probably count on one hand. Um, annually, you know, maybe you see three or four of those cases. Um, <clears throat> in this past year, I think you've seen maybe one or two or so. That's because we're in layers where other decision makers are involved, whether it's our excess carriers, our JPA partners, um, and, and so on. Generally speaking, in an average year, there are probably 100 claims and about 20 or 25 new lawsuits. In this past year, there have probably been 50 claims and maybe five new lawsuits. And you've only really seen or heard about maybe one or two of them because lawsuits take about, lawsuits take about two years or three years to kind of mature to the point where a decision needs to be made about going to trial or about resolving them by settlement. Almost all of our cases are resolved by settlement, although we do occasionally go to trial and there are cases that need to go to trial. <clears throat> so this past year being somewhat atypical, uh, I would say most of those claims have been resolved uh, by settlement or we've rejected them because they are uh, lacking in merit. Uh, the lawsuits uh, that have been reported have either been settled or they will probably be moving towards settlement in the next year or two. And the council will uh, give reports or will be receiving reports about them. I, I, is that helpful? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to kind of demystify what the city attorney's office does, um, number one, and then number two, um, how some of these lawsuits happen and the claims against the city and when we actually do get involved and so forth. Um, the other thing is also the fact that, you know, we are in partnership with other agencies and um, it's a little bit more complicated than I think what um, people assume, you know, sue the city and get paid, right? It, it doesn't work like that. Um, I appreciate that. And then as far as your uh, commentary uh, on the internships, um, obviously I'm, I'm very big on, uh, uh, you know, creating an internship program and, and specifically, you know, to your point of the collaboration amongst the different departments, but also um, your department tends to, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of privacy involved and so much more. Um, and I, I have stated in the past that I do think that our, if we were to have a robust citywide internship program for residents, um, I do want that kind of managed by our uh, library services and, and see where we can fill the gaps and support and, things like that. I know that I'm, I'm a big fan of interns um, and internships. So I, I do appreciate your support in that effort as well. And um, depending on, you know, their age and, and background, you know, being able to fill whether it's your department or whether it's the library or whether it's maintenance or whether it's whatever the case may be. Um, so I do appreciate that concept and that idea as well. Um, other than that, I do want to highlight uh, my appreciation to your department. Um, I'll be honest, I have not seen uh, some of the folks that worked in your department in, uh, in a while. 
Um, so I, I hope that everyone's doing well. And um, again, thank you for the work that you have done over the course of COVID. And I'm sure that um, it has been difficult doing all these meetings via Zoom and so forth. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, from what I've heard, it, it might have been a little difficult for his dog to uh, have all these meetings, <laughs> but we're used to that. Everybody has their, you know. Um, so I just want um, to uh, let council know we are now a half an hour behind schedule. So let's, um, you know, quicken the pace here, but we'll go to council members Romano. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for your uh, for your report. I appreciate the job that you do uh, protecting us legally and your plate is always full. So my question is, do you foresee a need for more staff in the near future? No, sir. Thank you, Michael. Keep up the good work. And thank you, Council Members Romania, for being, um, you know, quick there. Council Member Andrews, can you beat that? No, go, ask what you want, but. <laughs> one question, one comment. So one, one question is, um, I know when there's an increase uh, nationally or just within uh, one client, if there's an increase in risk, there's an assessment that's done by the insurance company, uh, whether it's done for facilities or police. Uh, is there an assessment that needs to happen with the insurance that just reviews our training, reviews our manuals, our documents, um, and record keeping? For, for um, you know, for, for property coverages, we do have um, periodic um, evaluations to confirm values of our assets. Um, but generally speaking, we don't have special assessments on, I think is. Or audits. Or um, special audit. I know that happens with sometimes with. No, actually, as part of our, uh, the finance department's annual audit, um, our liability uh, risk fund is also audited. Our risk fund is independently audited. Uh, you don't see those, but I serve on the board. Um, I am the, the appointee by council action. So there are audits uh, that are independent, both by the finance department for the city's general, for the city's budget, as well as for our JPA risk fund budget. All right, and then my comment is I also wanted to give kudos to your staff. Um, Mike, his last name is escaping me right now, but also Mr. Rick um, for filling in for you, but also their work on the planning commission. Uh, they're very patient with the commissioners, especially when it's their first foray into something like this. So thank you um, for your staff's time on explaining everything that needs to be explained. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think that's okay. That's all of the council. Um, and I just, yes, I'll, I'll just echo the, you know, thanks for the good work. Thanks for, I do think you um, do a good job of keeping us informed about lawsuits um, in council and uh, in closed session. And, you know, there, I think as you tried to explain, and I, I appreciated council member Wahab's question because yes, we, we do have to have transparency, but uh, you know, also, when a case is in litigation, we have to be very careful about what and you know anything that's said in public, um, and um, you know, and that is to protect everybody, including the plaintiffs. I think, and um, and uh, but um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I think it's it's a difficult balance. Um, and uh, let's see, I don't, you know, other than um, going back to um, what council member Andrews was asking about um, is basically risk management. And I do think that you do some of that in-house, um, but uh, that's just an area I've always felt like, um, you know, I, we, we definitely should be on top of, you know, analyzing the claims we've had, especially the things like property claims and things like that, that, you know, is there a way we can, I mean, obviously the police claims are another story, but you know, we certainly are working in that way too. But you know, there's a lot you can do in risk management to minimize risks. I think we had a, you know, we had something having to do with the covers on the water meters um, a while ago that we 
then fixed because we were getting some claims. So stuff like that, it should be an ongoing thing. And I, I trust that it is in your department in working with the other departments um, to look at those things, reasons we're getting those claims. Okay, and I guess we will be having further discussions with you about um, the ways we can reduce this increase in the insurance um, premium cost. To, but um, uh, other than that, if no one has any further anything further, thank you for the all the work you've done and the settlement of the um, you know of the lawsuits that in the lawsuits that have been settled that have, some of which had been going on for a while. And I too appreciate your staff and the help that you know I've I've gotten um, in connection with a few things at times um, that come up with some of the various other bodies that were involved with in the city. So we I very much appreciated that this. And so with that, we're going to now move on to um, the, the police. And I'm going to turn this over to the city manager who wanted to make a few comments first. Yeah, I just wanted to just set some context um, and also maybe help us stay or get a little bit back on schedule. Um, I just, the police department budget that you're going to see today is the status quo budget. It does not incorporate any of the recommendations from the policy innovation group, work, working group or any changes to the police department budget that might stem from that. And so um, I would just also, I would encourage if there's, you know, sort of just general questions today on the police department's budget or accomplishments from last year, that's probably, uh, uh, that's probably great to do that now. But if there's commentary or suggestions for how we might want to change the police department budget, I would encourage the council to do that this coming Tuesday as part of the policy innovation workshop discussion and the recommendations. I feel like that's a much better nexus for that conversation. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll modify this budget that you're seeing today based on any of the recommendations that come out of Tuesday night's council meeting. So just I just wanted to provide that as context for the council. So maybe that'll help us just sort of focus the questions and comments today um, and then leave some of the more policy related or, or um, changes to the budget, the police department budget to be discussed on Tuesday evening. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Chief Chaplin who will go through um, just the high level uh, presentation. Thank you, City Manager McAdoo. Uh, good afternoon, Council, Mayor. Uh, I know it's been a long day and um, uh, with that opening, I think uh, the city manager is taking a lot of my uh, steam out and then I may test Director Roman's uh, record as fast as presentation. So with that, um, can I have the first slide, please? Um, as you see here, it's our uh, it's our budget and uh, it's got 2020 through 2022 is proposed. And you can see the incremental e increases in that budget. Um, those increases are uh, majority negotiated salary and benefit increases. And... Um, you know, to uh, to Council Member Wobb's earlier comments about staffing and workload analysis. Um, looking forward, uh, you know, the city is rapidly growing, and um, every person that's moving into the city has the potential to represent a call for service for the police department. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what we will uh, glean from uh, Tuesday's meetings and what changes we'll see, but I look forward to in the future seeing an analysis on the workload and uh, and. With a with an eye specifically towards the growth of the population in the city of Hayward, um, and if anyone has any questions about any additional increases throughout those years, I did a backwards look to 2017 um, with our finance folks, and um, the increase the increases we've had for testing and, and other things are are extremely minimal. But um, anybody offline, I know we're pinched for time. I can go over those. I have them in front of me now. If, if someone asks, but um, at any other time feel free to reach out to me for those numbers. Next slide, please. The significant changes uh, planned for fiscal year 2022, um, as the city manager alluded to earlier, we will do a deep dive into this with the uh, policy innovation discussion that's coming up on this Tuesday. But uh, we've put a few here to, uh, to talk about. And uh, one of the main one of the main things is the continued development of our communication engagement program so that we can utilize social media and our community policing uh, meetings as the economy and the city opens back up again. Uh, we've had a pretty robust uh, social media platform and presence on those platforms. And just to put that in context, on Instagram, we have 5,275 followers. 
On Facebook, that number is 20,209. Twitter, we have 5,508. And Nextdoor, and um, these folks don't necessarily follow us, but Nextdoor has a following of 31,455 members. And Nixle, we're sitting at 1,036. Um, our total reached, there may be some overlap with some of the platforms, is roughly 32,028. Uh, without next door, if we include next door, which a lot of people are on, I'm on it and I see their commentary would be around 63,483 uh, uh, folks looking at this doesn't necessarily mean they're all from Hayward, but a vast majority are from Hayward because their neighborhoods are displayed. Um, the next thing is exploring the utilization of technology to improve transparency and efficiency and police services for the Hayward community. One of the things we're exploring now where we're, um, we want, we've, uh, We've looked at and want to implement dash cameras in our police vehicles. Um, they're like our police, uh, our, our body worn police cameras that our officers are outfitted with. This will give us other angles and other views to allow us to see things. Even if the camera is knocked off the officer or something happens to that camera, it's not activated for whatever reason, we will still have views of what happened um, in this kind of uh, speaks to uh, what uh, the city attorney, Michael Lawson, talked about and uh, making sure that, you know, when we can defend these because the officers did something right, we can. And that uh, we also need to identify when something incorrect or wrong was done as well. And this will enhance our ability to do that. Uh, earlier, there was a discussion about a brief discussion about the drone technology and a privacy piece and the technology involved in that. That's another uh, transparency layer and a force multiplier in a time when we have dwindling resources. Um, and this is direct from um, Director uh, Alex Amiri, you know, a city of Hayward, we have 283 miles of streets in the city of Hayward. And that's a lot of ground to cover. And we have nine patrol beats. And, uh, you know, and that's nine cars trying to cover 283 miles of street in the city. So, you know, I think that'll, um, that'll go a long way in, in the technology piece and helping us serve the city and the community a lot better. Uh, and the third item is revise and update the HPD strategic plan. It's, it's not lost on anyone that the national um, conversation um, has been more robust than it's ever been. I've been in law enforcement for um, over 31 years, and I, I can tell you things have changed dramatically, as we all know. Um, and right now we're looking for a consulting group to sit down with us and work on a new strategic plan to kind of mirror some of the things that we're having the conversations about that we'll, we, we, we'll be doing a deep dive into on Tuesday. And the fourth and final point is uh, to continue to expand recruitment efforts to address our staffing vacancies and increase recru recruitment and diversity. Um, you know, it's, it's no secret that the homicide of uh, George Floyd by Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis has, uh, has really, really dampened a lot of folks' desire to come into this profession. We also have an attrition or burn rate that's picking up as time rolls on. Um, and it's been challenging recruiting people into the profession. Um, and, and again, I have numbers about what we look like um, right now as far as the department goes. And that's for the end of the presentation. If I, anyone wants those, but in interest of time, I won't go through them right now. Um, next slide, please. And this is our organizational chart. Um, we are budgeted for 326 and a half folks. And that's what we have right now. Um, it's the same numbers as proposed. However, we, we are going to be looking at making structural changes internally, specifically for our publicly facing operations. Uh, we're going to consolidate units to increase organizational efficiency and, quite frankly, just make it uh, operate better for the public we serve. Um, I won't go into details about that right now because that's all going to be based on some of the, uh, some of the things that come out of Tuesday's discussion. And can I have the next chart, please? Um, our 2021 highlights and accomplishments. Uh, to council member Wahab's earlier statement, um, there were many. Um, uh, we wanted to narrow it down because of the time involved in this. Uh, so the first one was we were awarded our national accreditation by CALEA. Um, it was our four-year accreditation or reaccreditation. We were first accredited in 2011. And this process, uh, the four-year process we just underwent was a uh, labor-intensive process. It was done virtually for the first time uh, ever. And uh, it involved a lot of work from our public information officer, Michael Wright, who's no longer with us. He did a phenomenal job. And the, the long and the short of it is we were reaccredited. And uh, according to the accreditation service, we were one of the top five agencies in the nation. Um, and it was a stem to stern view of, of the Hayward Police Department. They looked at everything, um, all of our policies, our use of force, um, our, um, our deployments. 
Um, they spoke with members of our community. They spoke with our staff uh, with our permission. And um, they did a, a full analysis of the Hay Hayward Police Department and we were reaccredited. So we're good to go for another four years on that. And the next point is um, one, of the, one of the highlights, I think, for many of us that have been in Hayward and around Hayward for uh, many decades. And that was the solving of the 1988 Michaela Garrett case where the suspect was charged with, uh, with murder um, by the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. I did a joint press conference with the DA, Nancy O'Malley, and highlighted some of the phenomenal work done way back in 1988, all the way to present day by uh, Hayward Police Department's detectives, by members of our community who were witnesses. Um, everyone played a role in uh, finally um, getting us around third base to the, to the home plate on this case and uh, making sure that if, if nothing else, the family at the very least knows that the person that did this is going to be held accountable. Uh, and the, the third uh, point was we implemented changes to uh, our use of force policies, specifically uh, banning shooting and moving vehicles and the carotid restraint. Um, shortly after we did that, the state of California followed suit and did the same thing. And I, I think at some point um, we're going to see the nation uh, come out with some national standards. At least one can hope that uh, that mirror what we did here in Hayward and what the uh, state of California followed suit and did. And the last point. And uh, it's been echoed through uh, the many, um, the many uh, Hayward Police Department, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the many uh, executive team members that presented earlier that uh, during the challenge of COVID pandemic, uh, we had to implement procedures like everyone else did to ensure uh, operational continuity and provide services to the community of Hayward. And we really uh, leaned into that. And there's a there's a complaint nationwide about depolicing occurring in light of uh, 2020s events that did not happen in the city of Hayward. Um, we remained proactive. We stayed out there and engaged with the public. Uh, we even on a on a community level, we had virtual meetings and uh, we still did the virtual community academy. And uh, we're going to continue doing that. And we're going to look at doing some hybrid um, forms of that going forward. But uh, we stayed out here and uh, and uh, protected and served the city of Hayward throughout the pandemic. Um, and because of the way we implemented the procedures, we were mildly impacted by COVID-19 from a staffing perspective. Um, we were able to maintain our staffing levels and, uh, and basically keep this 24-7, 365 operation running. And with that, I will move to the next slide, which is uh, questions and discussion. All right. And again, I'm going to remind everybody of the time here. Um, but uh, and uh, certainly we're going to uh, and to keep in mind what the city manager said, because we are going to have a chance to discuss these issues on um, Tuesday night as well. So Council Member Zermeno. Uh, Chief, thank you very much. Thank your staff also for uh, the work that you all do. Uh, let's see. I'm interested in learning a little bit, a little bit about uh, canines, uh, motorcycles, uh, uh, policing, uh, bicycle and walking policing. As you know, we, I certainly get a lot of complaints about uh, 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 donuts. Uh, we'll hear about firecrackers pretty soon. So what uh, can you, do you have any report on that? Any progress report on what we're doing or what we will do, please? Well, hopefully we'll be able to bring in more staff and uh, recruits to some of our vacant positions. Everything you just mentioned in, involves one very important thing, and that is more staff to, uh, to get out and do those things. We need bodies to put on the bicycles and to walk those foot beats. Um, and just for, uh, and this may head off a few questions and save us a little bit of time. Um, the position vacancies now are, uh, are, are at such a level that, you know, they're reaching crisis. I mean, right now, total prof professional staff vacancies are 18 Police officer vacancies are 18. We have uh, 12 frozen sworn positions um, for a total sworn vacancy uh, number of 30. Um, we have off on workers' comp or modified duty, 14. We have one on administrative leave, and we have seven in the field training program and two trainees in the academy. Um, total injured and in training are 24. So right now, non-deployable for the Hayward Police Department, over 20% of our staff. 72 members are non-deployable right now out of that 326.5 number I gave you earlier. And so we have enough to staff patrol. We literally had to decommission our narcotics enforcement unit because of staffing issues and, and move them and filter them into other investigative areas. 
And, um, you know, the numbers are going up. We've been able to suppress them, but the numbers are going up. 2018, we had three murders in the city. 2019, we had five. Uh, 2020, we had 11, which eclipsed 2018, 19, and most of 2017 combined. So um, our shootings are, are on the same par and pace as that. Um, we, but we still seized, we seized over 200 guns last year, and we're seizing a lot this year as well. So uh, unfortunately, we love to staff the foot beats and the bicycles. But the reality is, as I said earlier, with 286 miles of, uh, of road, our main complaint is what you alluded to, traffic. We have four officers doing traffic for this entire city. And, uh, and, you know, the numbers just get worse as you move throughout the organization. Um, we've posted overtime to cover um, vacancies in, in our patrol. And quite frankly, with COVID uh, scheduling and some of, the, uh, some of the other things we've asked the officers to do, um, we're running in a situation where we're getting no takers for some of this uh, overtime at this point. Okay. Thank you. And please be safe. Thank you. Councilmember Wahab. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, like I've told all the other departments, I, I hope to see your achievements kind of, you know, documented in the large books once we adopt it. Um, uh, I think that's incredibly important. Um, I also want your members to know that uh, you definitely advocate for your members in your department. And uh, I just want everybody to understand um, that, that you do it, you know, one-on-one -on -one and you do it uh, definitely on council. Um, to the point made earlier, I, I genuinely do believe in a staffing analysis, primarily because as we are developing more homes, we do have more people uh, moving into the city. These are, you know, even if we develop a couple hundred homes per year, that means a couple thousand people uh, are moving in per year. So I, I think people need to really understand that the impacts on roads, the impacts on business, schools, things like that. Um, so I, I hope that we do, and, and I've said this from, from very early on, um, a staffing level analysis across the, the, the city. I know that we have budgetary concerns, but um, we also have to serve the, the, the community. Um, I do wanna highlight, and I am looking at fiscal year 2020 actual versus fiscal year 2022 proposed. Um, you know, it, it didn't go up that much in regards to regular salary. Um, and obviously we've had uh, some vacancy as well as some additions to our team, um, you know, previous, uh, you know, trainees that have become kind of full-time members of, of the uh, police department. And um, I also want to highlight that from 2020 to 2022, overtime actually went down or is planned to be down. So I do want the public to understand that. Um, oftentimes I get messages about, oh, you know, uh, PD and fire have significant overtime. Yes, they have overtime. Um, uh, it's kind of designed that way, but at the same time, um, it's not as much as, uh, as one complains about. Um, I do want to highlight that now that HUSD has voted to not have SROs and there are some conversations and, and some discussions regarding, uh, you know, the future of policing in Hayward, um, I do want to highlight that, you know, my, my focus is definitely in crime solving and kind of to your point, uh, you know, suppressing some of the numbers that we have seen. Uh, COVID has obviously created some impacts to people's jobs and, and livelihoods. So, you know, a spike in crime is across the entire Bay Area, if not California. Um, the patrol division slash investigations. Um, both of the budgets have gone up, uh, but very slim, roughly about a million or, you know, a couple hundred thousand um, in each. Um, I would like to see more metrics around um, cases that are solved. You know, we, we, we have the metrics of, you know, this is how many murder cases, rape cases, you know, uh, burglary cases, but we don't have any metrics on the outcome of those cases, right? So the press conference that you had with uh, our district attorney regarding the cold case, you know, of course, I think everyone's very supportive of that. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of other cases that we haven't heard. Um, myself included, as well as many other residents have stated that they almost are reluctant to even file a police report because they don't see the, the let's say, I don't want to say success, but the, the, the traction behind the scenes um, I know you guys are limited because of state laws. You know, the, I think you and I have talked about this in the past and it's, it's very um, bothersome that that is the case. Um, but I do hope that we have a little bit more metrics as to what is going on 
you know, how many cases have we been able to solve burglary or um, anything like that. I also understand that the city of Hayward is paying into um, the rape kits as well. Um, I'm very happy about that. And I know that that is, you know, in collaboration with yourselves, the, the district attorney and, um, you know, one of the state laws that, um, that kind of passed by. Um, so I, I really want to focus on the investigation and the successes of the investigation moving forward. Um, you know, you guys have a difficult job. I think this past year was more difficult than in the past. And, you know, um, to your point with the vacancies, we have always had a difficult time filling our vacancies. Um, I know that this city council has invested in social media recruitment, uh, an outside firm to recruit and much more. Um, can you tell us why do you feel that um, we have such deep vacancies compared to other departments? Um, is it because of the changing nature of PD or salary or what do you think? I think it's all of the above. Uh, you know, just um, the uh, the openings for um, for for officers are, are barrier wide, as you alluded to earlier. Um, we have folks leaving the state, going to other states, um, and the pandemic exacerbated the problem. People are real; they're they're, uh, they're analyzing what's good for their families now. And some folks, quite frankly, um, feel like you know I've got to move out of the Bay Area. It's, it's expensive to live here, so they're recruiting nationwide, everywhere. Everyone's hiring. And so, uh, and everyone's offering these, uh, these, um, these incentives to come work for them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tough to keep up, you know, you, you, um, you make, you put out a bonus of $5,000 and then it's two cities over there are offering 10 and there's one city locally. I won't mention them. I don't want anybody running over there that's offering 30. And so, um, the reality is, is it's, um, it, it's kind of like tech companies and hiring talent. You know, you're here for a year and the next year you're at another company because you got a better package. So I think it's all of the above. I, I think um, and quite frankly, the climate, it's accelerated our pace of attrition. So people are leaving faster and the vacancy uh, hole keeps getting bigger and bigger and to attract that talent. And it is, quite frankly, the negative sentiment towards law enforcement that's happened in the last uh, in, in the last 12 months. And uh, it's really all of those things have exacerbated our ability to recruit. And the other side of it is. We're not just taking anyone that walks in our doors. We don't want to inherit anyone else's problems. So we have a very robust vetting program. We have a lot of folks applying, but we also have a lot of folks who don't belong in this profession applying. So we are turning them away at the door. So we're not just going to take anybody in. And even in this tough environment, I'd rather sell short um, folks than to bring anybody in our agency and have them work in our streets, quite frankly. But uh, to, to your point, all of the things you hit on are all part of this problem that we have recruiting. Definitely. Um, I, I, again, appreciate it. I, I do want um, to uh, relay my, my appreciation to your department as well. I know that it's been a difficult year. Um, moving forward, I, I do hope that we keep an eye on the budget because the police department is our biggest um, uh, expense. Um, and that's just because of the nature of the job and we know that. Um, but if we can kind of just at least keep an eye to that uh, in regards to new tools, and I think you referenced it in um, you know, I think I've already shared that I have a deep concern about uh, policy around privacy, which we do not have. Uh, and I don't necessarily want guiding principles. I want, you know, literally standalone um, uh, privacy policy. And that's just not for the tools you guys have, but across the board with our IT department and other, other folks. So again, I, I really want to convey my appreciation for your department um, during these times and, uh, and, you know, looking forward to Tuesday's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we do have a draft policy just for the record for the drone. And it's not just uh, if it's actual policy that uh, we vetted that I look forward to bringing before the council at some point in the near future. Thank you. We look forward to seeing it. Um, so um, we'll move on to council member Salinas. Uh, good afternoon, chief. Um, I have 45 minutes worth of questions and um, Can somebody mute him, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, First of all, I, let me let me just give you um, some big congratulations. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm from Hayward, and for 30 or so years, um, this city has uh, mourned, and this city has um, wondered uh, what had happened to M Michaela Garrett. And um, you know, uh, I was in high school uh, when that happened. And um, uh, 
to see that successfully uh, case closed, uh, or I don't know if it's totally closed, but to see that uh, case come to some kind of closure with an arrest and a charge um, of murder, uh, I think uh, is incredible. And I think uh, your detectives um, uh, uh, deserve a, a great big um, applaud and, and a great big thank you. And, and I know Michaela's mother doesn't live in Hayward anymore, but um, you know, uh, I know for a long time that was a big, big case. And you guys, uh, you know, um, that's good detective work. So thank you. Um, secondly, um, wanted to thank you for continuing the Junior Giants program. Uh, you guys did it last year in the thick of the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, based on the email I saw uh, a few days ago, it looks like it's green lighted again for this summer. Uh, so I wanted to uh, thank you uh, for that too. Um, also wanted to also note, I don't know if you, uh, I have said it before, I think I've said it publicly before uh, here, uh, but you know, the Hayward Promise neighborhood did do a, a neighborhood survey. And um, uh, we asked the question around, do you trust the police? And um, we had an incredible high response rate of a positive. Uh, it was somewhere in the 90% of the neighborhood that we, um, of the respondents that we uh, surveyed um, had um, high levels of trust uh, of the police department. And this is in the South Hayward neighborhood and this is in the Hayward Promise neighborhood uh, footprint. Uh, so um, I think a lot of that uh, is because of the groundwork, uh, I think over the years that has been laid, whether it's through community policing, whether it's through uh, junior giants, uh, whether it's through uh, just officers being engaged uh, in the neighborhood with kids um, and, um, and just knowing, um, and also being engaged with a lot of the agencies that are doing work in the neighborhood. So um, that, um, that little uh, data point uh, didn't surprise me uh, because I know that there's been a lot of groundwork laid. So, uh, and also uh, I should say the, um, the, uh, um, the national night out, I think the national night out also um, uh, made big inroads uh, in um, community engagement and in sort of building those relationships. So just wanted to um, make that point to you. Um, the, 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 one, the, the one question I do have is, um, you know, considering everything that's going on nationally and considering, you know, the discussion that you guys have been working on in the uh, innovation uh, policy work, um, does CLIA provide any tools, policy tools? I mean, has CLIA been grappling with, with the stuff that's been going on nationally and I mean, and, and have they sort of put out sort of a, um, a package of policies that local policymakers can look at, grapple with, and evaluate? Well, we use Lexapol, which uh, is a, it's, a, it's a battery of lawyers, and they're constantly looking, to your point, at law changes, legal changes that occur. And so our policy, which is why I'm a big fan of it, um, I didn't have it where I came from. And so uh, we ended up in a, a, a long two or three year battle to change the use of force policy because we didn't have this in place. And so we had an over two decade old use of force policy that had far, far outlived its usefulness. Um, but with uh, with the with the uh, Lexapol, it's a battery of lawyers. Whenever there's a state law change like the ones we've had, and there's a lot of advocacy right now at the state level with the assembly bills and the Senate bills being passed. And so our policies adjust and change as the laws adjust and change because they're constantly being reviewed. Um, you know, and you, with that level of review, you're always current on everything. So to your point, we use Lexapol and they keep us updated. And some of the things we use locally for Hayward, like the, uh, the car policy that's specific for Hayward, we can go in and manipulate it and make it specifically for Hayward, but the, uh, the uh, framework around that is crafted by Lexapol. And is Lexapol um, only accessible to, uh, you know, police chiefs and law enforcement or is Lexapol, is it something that's uh, open for, you know, public consumption? 
Yes, you can uh, log on and see the policies. And, you know, it's, um, and it's a standardized system, which, again, I, I, I believe at some point nationally, as, uh, as a lot of advocates are asking for national standards, like if you went to Portland, Oregon and pulled up um, their use of force policy 300, it would be, it would be structurally the same as Hayward's. But our, we have some things that we've done specifically um, in Hayward for our community in our policies that would not be reflected, but it would the general look of it would be the same as uh, the other agencies. OK. And then um, my uh, last point is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, since I've been on the council, we've had reports uh, from the police chief um, regarding, you know, citywide crime, uh, crime stats and um, and so forth. Uh, we haven't had one of those reports uh, in a couple of years. Um, is one coming? <laughs> well, uh, we did the uh, the year end uh, recap, which included a year and a half. Uh, we didn't do one for uh, 2019. So we wrapped 2019 and 2020 in one. And I was accused of being extremely long on that particular report. We had a lot of charts and a lot of graphs and talked about things. And, uh, you know, I have it up in front of me now. We, we put the demographics of our victims and our suspects throughout Hayward to kind of explain our deployment and, and some of the numbers that we've seen in, in our city. And, um, you know, but, but I look forward to, to, uh, to reporting out you know, um, good stat is, you know, we did have 11 homicides last year. This year we've had two and we this year we have 100 percent solve rate. We solved both of those. And, um, you know, and, and we've been doing some phenomenal work here. We've uh, arrested a lot of the folks that are committing these robberies with folks going to the uh, chase, the Wells Fargo Bank. There's been a lot of successes here, a lot. And I'd love to report out on them on a more routine and regular basis. I appreciate that. And also my last thing is I just wanted to send my condolences for uh, Officer uh, Aaron Wilson. I know uh, uh, he was with the department for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, if there was if there was one officer that everybody knew uh, in downtown, um, it was him. Uh, just a, a, just a nice guy. And um, it was um, it was devastating uh, to see um um, to see him pass away at such a young age. And I know uh, um, uh, a lot of people around the community had a great deal of respect for him. And so uh, please tell your officers uh, my condolences for them. Uh, thank you and uh, stay safe out there, sir. Absolutely. And thank you for that. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, and we, I think we will be adjourning our meeting on Tuesday and uh, his memory and yes, I, he was well known to a lot of us. Um, okay, um, Council Member Andrews, keeping in mind the time, but go ahead. <laughs> um, thank you for your report. And um, I wanted to uh, thank you for letting me know that about the, the solvency rate. I was just gonna ask about um, that percentage. So you just shared it, so thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I was um, wondering if, um, with this budget, are we looking at property crime solvency and detection, uh, detective work? And I know Councilmember Rahab mentioned it earlier, but uh, is there a stronger focus on that, um, solving those types of crimes? Absolutely, and uh, you know, and one of the things we talked about in the, uh, and I think it's before you came on. Um, a ring that was really just, uh, they were all over the place. Our burglaries, our commercial burglaries last year went through the roof. And prior to COVID, we were, we, you know, we had a lot of snatch and grabs mainly at the mall. So um, absolutely. But we are really laser focused on prevention. Um, we're working closely with Southland Mall. And um, as we bring more businesses into Hayward, we really want to work with them with our crime prevention specialists and uh, some of our folks in the neighborhoods, because as people go back to work, I can imagine residential burglaries are going to increase as people leave their homes. So we're trying to end the car break-ins as people get back out there. So we're trying to do a lot of preventative measures. Um, and But when it does happen, we are laser focused on solving these particular crimes and uh, let, making sure we're accessible to folks to solve these crimes. Um, but again, it's a capacity issue. And um, depending on what, what we decide going forward with our budget, 
um, there may be some pain felt, unfortunately, in some of these divisions within the Hayward Police Department if we do lose any of this funding. Because uh, I think there's folks that believe half our budget, only half our budget goes to uh, to salary, and it's closer to 90%. It's over, uh, it's 89.46%, or I forget specifically what that point is, but the vast majority of our budget is for our boots on the ground, our folks actually doing the work. And um, the rest of it, it's everything else you see, the the cars, the the, uh, the vest, the uniform. And so there's not a whole lot to cut at this point. We are literally at the bone. And um, I think it's part of why we're still in this antiquated building and, you know, and some of the other antiquated buildings that are associated with HPD. But the reality is we are going to be laser focused on still providing a high level of, of service. And, but the, the grim reality is we're going to have to look at some point, depending on where all of this goes, um, quite frankly, what the community is willing to live without to, because it's going to be a balancing act at the end of the day. And to do what you're talking about, it is labor intensive because you're writing search warrants on an investigative unit. Most of um, the criminality in Hayward are from folks that do not live here. They're mm -hmm. staying in our hotels on mission. We've served numerous search warrants up there and assisted other agencies who's coming to our city. Um, so we have a lot of folks that commute into Hayward to commit crimes. So that's that in itself takes us out of Hayward to do these uh, to, to do these things where we have to investigate, follow folks around, serve search warrants. It is really labor intensive. So um, we're going to do what we can. But again, it's going to depend on what the budget looks like for us and how much of that we can do. OK, uh, that led me to um, my other question is if we were having a regional approach to solving crime. But it sounds like um, you touched on that earlier. And then I just have two more questions. Um, and then also uh, working with our our property owners to see how they could support because um, I know it's an attraction for this type of crime and, and it's uh, making it more um, intense on the patrol units. Um, but one of two other things I had uh, questions about was about urban design and reducing crime by urban design and seeing how you can work with our public works department in terms of looking at our infrastructure to uh, reduce some of the issues to reduce in order for us to reduce some of the patrols that are needed. So like lighting, um, looking at, you know, places where there's donuts, those ki types of things. Well, council member, that's a fantastic point you bring up. Um, uh, there's a lot of good work being done regionally. And if you take Fremont, for example, and a few other cities, um, city cameras are huge deterrents. Um, license plate readers, things of that nature. And um, not for information that you just fare through whenever you want to, but to your point, when you have the donors, we have side shows that originate in Los Angeles that specifically list Hayward as a destination spot to do this activity. Um, Fourth of July is around the corner. We're going <laughs> to be inundated with calls about the Fourth of July when we get out to the community. I was with the mayor and the city manager doing a tour of the city, hitting communities. The number one complaint traffic, the number two complaint, fireworks. And so um, city cameras, uh, good city cameras that allow us to access that footage when necessary. There are a lot of cities now that are placing license plate readers throughout their cities so that when crimes are committed, they can track them. And, you know, going back to the Michaela Garrett case and not to harp or belabor this, with all these miles and miles of streets and some of the traffic issues in Hayward and gridlock issues, if that crime happened today, um, and we have the nine beats, it would be difficult for nine cars to search that, that much space. Hayward is a large city, but to put a drone up with a direction of travel, we could cover so much more space from the air quickly and maybe locate that car. Because as we all know, unfortunately, throughout the years in these cases, once that car pulls into a garage or a place obscured from the air, we've probably lost that victim forever. So I agree with you 100%. There are some things that we can do as force multipliers that can aid us at a time where we're having trouble getting folks into our ranks. Okay. And then um, my, last, my last question, my last question, um, you mentioned um, guns um, proliferating our city and just wanted to know um, how you felt about the efficacy of gun buyback programs and if that was something that was thought about with PD. And that's all. Thank you. I love them. I participated in them when I was in uh, in my old assignment in San Francisco Police Department. A uh, guy with the high school with Rudy Corpus United Players had uh, had a gun buy back every year and literally ran out of money to buy the guns back. Every gun off the street is one that will not be used against a member of our community, in my humble opinion. So I'm definitely for them. So there is that those things aren't part of something that we're considering for our, this budget, possibly in the. 
No, definitely considering it. You're, you're the second person has brought it up and uh, is th definitely something we're looking at. Okay, thanks. All right, and Council Member Marquez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'm just a little bit, I'm not a little bit, but I just, I'm, I'm shocked. I, I wasn't aware of um, Aaron Wilson's passing and he actually crossed my mind not too long ago because he was just such a dynamic person. Um, anyone that met with him, he went above and beyond to connect with our community members, well loved and respected in downtown Hayward, not only because he did his job so well there, but he spent a lot of his off time in downtown Hayward. He was really, really rooted in the community. I know he's a fellow Hayward farmer, so I'm just um, very sad to hear about his passing, very young and a bright star in our um, community. So I extend my condolences to your department and his family as well. And just wanna thank you, Chief. I know that um, not only are you our chief, but you you live here as well. So you have a different and unique perspective. So I, I wanna acknowledge and appreciate you for that. I know it's been a challenging 13 months. It's been a challenging two years, but I'm confident that we'll continue to work together to do what's in the best interest of our community. That's everybody's goal here. Um, I also know that your department is, is it's diverse. And um, I always meet people in your department that are from Hayward. So can you give me a sense of the percentage um, of employees that either live or from Hayward? Is it 10%, 15%? Do you have a sense of what that number might be? I don't, but I have Captain Matthews on a call, and I don't know if he's uh, got privileges where he can jump in. And, and, and uh, if you have any number, sense of that number, Brian, if you're, if you're on here, Captain Matthews. He is. I don't have access to uh, to those specific numbers, but I, I would estimate that it's in it's in between the 10, 20 percent um, range. OK, thank you so much. And then in terms of recruitment. So what I understood from your comments earlier is that the fact that we have these vacancies, it, it's an issue nationwide. It's not just something that Hayward is challenged with. But um, I have seen some very impressive recruits hired within the last few years. So who is part of that team? Can you just help the public, explain to the public who has a say in that process? Brian, you want to <laughs> jump in? That's, his, that's Captain Matthew shop again. Yeah, I'm happy to. So we do have a, a recruitment team internal here. Uh, it's made up of both sworn and professional staff members. There's uh, around 30 or 40 folks in the organization who participate in attending recruitment events. And then also, um, you know, when they contact folks who have an interest in any of the positions that we have here, they kind of, uh, much like our mentor program does with new people coming in the organization, they kind of follow them along through the process and answer their questions and help them. Um, so we, we uh, have faced a lot of challenges in the past year because of the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of the recruitment event, events that we normally send people to were canceled. Um, those are starting to open back up. And so uh, we're looking forward to getting back after it. Um, you know, here, once things open back up, we'll be attending a lot of those things with a variety of folks. Okay. And is one consideration, I know you have to consider a lot of factors, but are we looking at connectedness to the community in terms of what are their ties to Hayward? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we have leaned on in the past is our Explorer program. Uh, and, and then one of the things that you'll hear about um, on Tuesday night is the possibility of, of a formal internship program. So we are uh, looking at ways to connect with people here in the community to get them excited about working for the city. We're going to be working with both uh, Cal State East Bay and Chabot College uh, and their respective programs there to see if we can generate some interest from folks who live in town. Okay, great. Thank you. And my last, last follow-up to that is um, also uh, there's a pastor in the Latinx community and uh, the NAACP who I've spoken with, and they've referred uh, candidates, uh, very diverse candidates our way. And uh, I've met with uh, one personally in the office um, and you know, expressed some concerns about the current environment. One of the things he said to me, he said, I, you know, I finally uh, took up the challenge to be the change that I want to see. So, uh, you know, I would throw this challenge out to anyone watching this right now, our members of our community, council members, you know, you all come across folks you'd love to see doing this the way you envision it being done, please send them our way. I mean, uh, it, you know, this thing is wide open and, you know, I, I constantly hear folks saying that I'd like to see this in an officer, but, um, but, you know, you're standing next to folks that are uh, at Cal state and other local colleges and universities start sending those folks our way. We'd love to have them. 
Okay, great. And then my last couple comments is congratulations on the Kalia recertification. I know that that work was challenging to get to that point. So congratulate the entire department for those efforts. And then also just let you know that I'm ready to go on another ride along. It's been some years. I'm fully vaccinated. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to revisit the department and your team. Thank you. Love to have you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I... I will reserve most of my questions, or which may be more directed to the Tuesday night discussion. But I do want to bring up um, so one thing about potential funding, and I'm glad the city attorney is still on here. I attended a seminar, or a, I don't know, a virtual meeting a while, a few months ago, with the city, with the California um, uh, attorney general, who actually is now our senator. Um, no, he's not our senator. Our California, he's actually our health and human services director now. And um, anyway, but it was about the opioid cases and the settlements that are coming forward. And I'm seeing news that they are starting to reach these settlements with these um, pharmaceutical companies that put these drugs out there. And there will be money available through these settlements for you know, communities who may have suffered as a result of that. And I just wonder if we're looking at that in any way and trying to position ourselves through the um, California Attorney General's office um, to perhaps, um, you know, recover some of that. <laughs> and I see the city attorney has come on the, or has. Mayor, yeah. Mayor Halliday, the state attorney general's office coordinates closely with counties and cities when there are settlements of this nature. I haven't heard anything recently about an opioid settlement, um, but I'll, um, I'll inquire and I'll get back to the city manager and the police chief with what I find. I, I'm pretty sure I've seen a couple in the, in the newspaper of pretty significant money. So I would, I would look into that because I would think that we have had that problem in our city. You're saying we can even, can't even afford to, um, put out our narcotics unit, unit right now because of the staffing shortages. So I don't know, I just would look at that. So it's my suggestion. But with that, um, I think that we are ready to move on to the next one. So thank you so much, Chief. And again, um, you know, please thank your department for all the hard work that you guys have, that you have all put in during this COVID period and especially being out there um, in situations that are a lot riskier than a lot of the rest of us faced. Yeah. And, it, it be, can I make a quick comment before we log off and let you finish the day out? Um, I want to thank um, Chief Contreras and the fire department. Um, you know, without him, this thing would have been a catastrophe. We would have had widespread exposure throughout our ranks, made sure we got tested to instill confidence in our folks so they could stay out there. And uh, when the vaccines were available, we made sure we were vaccinated. And Todd Roman, um, his folks, Director Roman, had his folks come over and uh, put some things in place to where we could, uh, if there was an exposure, we could minimize how many people were exposed. So I just want to say that, uh, you know, our, our um, the members, other members of the executive team and their teams um, that work for them did a phenomenal job supporting the Hayward Police Department during this pandemic. And I just want to throw out a kudos to all of them and, and thank them for the work they did to allow us to do our jobs. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And with that, we are going to now move on to our last department, which is the mayor and city council. Although it appears on the schedule that our city manager is going to talk about that department and not us, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy to just go through the, the nuts and bolts and the numbers and, uh, and then the mayor and council can add anything else that they would like to. So the first slide, um, you'll see a pretty significant drop um, in the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. And that's primarily as a result result of um, our new council member coming on and a shift in um, benefit levels uh, as a result of um, that change in council members uh, in the last election. So that that's where I, why primarily you'll see that that large drop. Um, we did also, and you'll go to the next slide, uh, did also um, uh, Put, to put forth a 5% reduction in the supplies and services budget for the mayor and council budget. And then next slide. Um, obviously, a, a tremendous amount of accomplishments and highlights for the city council over the past year, but just um, some, some, a few ones, uh, really the, the crucial community and organizational leadership and stability during the COVID pandemic. And I'll just speak personally, the support uh, that the council gave me and the executive team um, and the trust that you had in us 
um, really enabled us to to do what we did for this community um, over the last year. And so it, it wouldn't have been without your trust and your leadership um, that this organization could have done what it did. And so I just wanna just acknowledge and appreciate that. Um, uh, you know, obviously lots of legislative and policy direction, but I think importantly, just really in the last year, um, having the strategic roadmap get completed and then updated based on the changes for, for COVID. And I think that is, um, I think it's the first time um, since I've been with the city that we've had really a, a, a real strategic plan. Um, so excited about that accomplishment and appreciate the council's work on that. And then obviously um, crucial to this, this year and the budget process generally was the collaboration with our bargaining groups and, and our executive leadership team to have uh, and develop the fiscal stability plan that really I think has allowed us to weather the economic crisis um, better, better than a lot of other cities. And I, I just, uh, in talking to one of my, uh, another city manager in Alameda County, um, who indicated that they are balancing their budget next year with 25% one-time funds, which is a pretty scary prospect. Um, so, you know, when I think we have a lot to be grateful for and a lot to be thankful for in terms of um, our employees and the, the partnership, and then also the, the stimulus dollars that are going to be coming in to, to really help uh, shore up the city for the next couple of years. Uh, last slide. I think that's it. So a uh, very uh, relatively brief uh, presentation, but happy to answer questions. Well, we're, we're all happy to take the credit, but we couldn't have done it without you and your staff. So I think it's a mutual, mutual um, accomplish, accomplishment. So council member Wahab. Thank you. Um, I guess is when I say kudos to the city council and mayor, um, I genuinely appreciate all the work that everybody has been trying to do. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Mayor Halliday, yourself, and um, my colleague, Councilmember Lamnin, for sitting on the budget committee. And obviously, you know, we drafted some of the accomplishments. I'm hoping, again, to our city manager that every department puts uh, a list of their 2021 uh, accomplishments um, uh, in the budget document and, uh, you know, the standalone piece for COVID. Um, I'm also happy to say that if, if need be, um, happy to make, you know, concessions where, where is needed. Um, you know, I don't think we've discussed that as in depth as we, we can. Um, and then, uh, looking forward to next year and, and some of these plans that are coming up and, uh, some of the bigger projects and hopefully getting back to normal. So again, uh, the only reason why the city of Hayward has really literally outdone itself is primarily because the staff that's involved, uh, for the city, um, the thousand plus or so uh, uh, staff members, uh, part-time, full-time, uh, the interns, the volunteers, even the city residents um, genuinely appreciate the collaborative effort around it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't say that we in our minds could have even done better than what we, you know, projected uh, last year. You know, this was a shock. This was something that we couldn't really fathom and, and think about it as to how we can, um, you know, go around it. So I, I really just want to say kudos to every single person involved, everybody that donated their time, everybody that, you know, gave up concessions and uh, the leadership of this council and the staff. So thank you. All right. Thank you. And I don't see any other hands up. So Madam, and we now have kind of recovered um, somewhat here and we do ha still have public comments, um, but, um, but I'm going to turn it back to the city manager for some closing remarks and next steps. Sure, thank you. And I'm so glad that we got through everything uh, today. That's great. Um, so uh, our next budget work session is next Tuesday, but based on the fact that we've completed all the departmental presentations, we won't have to do any of those. So that'll actually, I think, give more time for the policy innovation workshop discussion um, and some more further follow-up discussion on the police department budget. So I think that'll be, that's, that's great that we'll have some of that extra time on Tuesday on Tuesday evening. Um, you'll also hear the work session on the capital improvement program on Tuesday evening. Um, and then hopefully if all goes well, we will incorporate all of those changes and incorporate any changes to the police department budget and other departmental budgets from Tuesday's discussion um, and adopt, hold the public hearing and adopt the city budget on June 1st. So those are the next steps. And as the mayor said, we still have public comments left to go today, but that's, that's it from the staff side. 
All right, good job, everybody. Really, and a lot of a lot of good suggestions and and questions and answers, and and so really appreciate it. It's a, it's it is a very good team. I'm really proud to be a part of it myself. And and um, so with that, we're going to go now to and Madam City Clerk. Yes, are you ready to? Is your office ready? I see the clock is up. And I don't, we don't have a lot of attendees, but we do have a couple of hands. So let's go ahead. It looks like the first hand is Deanna Bogue. Okay, thank you. You're doing very well, as you all know, or you should know that I am strictly for my police department. And I'm glad did I unmute me? We can hear you. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what I'm I want to congratulate him on Michaela. It was years and years and years of very hard work going over and over and over things. And Kalia, our police department is one of the very few police departments that goes through Kalia with 99 to 100% compliance. And that is very hard to do. I am pro-police, I'm pro-city council, and I want you to remember to be pro-police. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm not sure there's no name, but this is the next public comment, um, the next raised hand. Please go ahead and you could uh, press star six to unmute. Yes. Um, earlier when the meeting started, the city manager gave some times that they would re be repeating this um, meeting on uh, channel 15. I was driving at the time, so I, it was impossible to write down the days. Um, if it's possible and she has that information handy, so could we repeat that? Yes, certainly. On Monday, is starting at 5 p.m. And on Tuesday, starting at 11 a.m. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. And with that, I don't see any other hands raised. So I will close public comments. And um, as we have discussed, we will be next meeting this coming Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, again, virtually on all of those ways we appear virtually, including Zoom. And um, with that, no other further, wait a minute, I'm hmm, I'm seeing a hand up. Council Member Wahab, is that, yeah, yeah, you yeah. wanna say something? Sure. Um, I specifically just wanted to thank uh, Director Clausen, uh, not only for this year, but last year, uh, I feel like he did two budgets, uh, him and his team, uh, primarily the one that is very similar to this one, but then had to uh, basically dump that and uh, do the COVID budget. So I, I really just want to thank you and your team. I, I didn't speak on it uh, when you're presenting because I think that it's, it's, you know, you don't just handle your team, you handle basically everybody else's budget as well. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of, you know, questions, annoying questions I know from myself and um, I'm sure the public and uh, the, the rest of council and all the department heads and so forth. So I, I really just want to give you kudos and your entire department because it, it's citywide and takes a lot of effort and a lot of looking at numbers on Excel sheet projected and, you know, discussing that. So uh, kudos to your patients as well. So thank you. Thank you. And that's what we're here for. All right. Well, congratulations, everybody. I do think this is the best, um, you know, the best job we've ever done as far as keeping to time and getting through in the amount of time we said. And therefore, I wish everyone a great Saturday evening, good dinner, whatever. And we'll see you all on Tuesday. Are you you're okay? Council, Council Member Marquez had her hand up. but Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Council Member, no? Okay. All right. All right. So we're going to now adjourn. I know we just love being together, but now we're going to go back to our families. So thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks everybody.